credibility. As for the goals, senior Middle East correspondent and analyst Yousef. Dash page 103. Ibrahim was no doubt oversimplifying when he identified them as bolstering. The president's popularity for short-term political gain and turning a friendly Iraq into a private American oil pumping station. 31. But there is good reason to believe that his observations at least point in the right direction. Maintaining a hold on political power and enhancing U.S. control of the world's primary energy. Sources are major steps toward the twin goals that have been declared with considerable clarity to institutionalize a radical restructuring of domestic society that will roll back the progressive reforms of a century and to establish an imperial grand strategy of permanent world domination. Compared with such ends, the risks may well seem insignificant. The wild men in the wings establishment critics and the White House tended to focus on the same issues as the Security Council debates and the inspections, the Iraqi threat, WMD, and their subcategory of terror that enters the canon. None of the debates gave more than a passing nod to democratization or liberation or any other issues that lie beyond the potential threat to the US and its allies. There was little discussion, for example, of the possible effects of war on the population of Iraq, except among the white men in the wings, to borrow the term used by McGeorge Bundy to refer to those who felt that more was involved in the Vietnam War than military success and its cost to the invaders, as Washington marched resolutely to war against Iraq. The wild men and women were again looking beyond their narrow question of the costs to themselves. With the Iraqi people at the edge of survival after a decade of destructive sanctions, international aid and medical agencies warned that a war might lead to a serious humanitarian catastrophe. Switzerland hosted a meeting of 30 countries to prepare for what might lie ahead. The U.S. alone refused to attend. Participants, including the other four permanent Security Council members, warned of devastating humanitarian consequences of a war. Former Assistant Secretary of Defense Kenneth Bacon, head of the Washington-based Refugees International, predicted that a war will generate huge flows of refugees and a public health crisis. Meanwhile, U.S. plans for humanitarian relief in the post-war Iraq were criticized by international aid agencies as short on detail, woefully lacking in money, and overly controlled by the military. U.N. officials complained there is a studied lack of interest in Washington in a warning call. We are trying to deliver to the people planning for war about what it's consequences might be. 32. Dash page 104. Horrifying and brutal as Saddam Hussein's regime was, he nevertheless did direct oil profits to internal development. A tyrant at the head of a regime that has turned violence into an instrument of state with a hideous human rights record. He nevertheless had hoisted half the country's population into their middle class, and Arabs the world over came to study at Iraqi universities. 33. The 1991 war, involving the purposeful destruction of water, power, and sewage systems, took a terrible toll, and the sanctions regime imposed by the US and UK drove the country to the level of bare survival. 34 as one illustration, UNICEF's 2003 report on the state of the world's children states that Iraq's regression over the past decade is by far the most severe of the 193 countries surveyed, with their child death rate, the best single indicator of child welfare, increasing from 52. 
133 per 1,000 live births, placing Iraq below every country outside Africa apart. From Cambodia and Afghanistan, two hawkish military analysts observe that economic sanctions may well have been a necessary, sick, cause of the deaths of more people in Iraq than have been slain by all so-called weapons of mass destruction throughout history, in the hundreds of thousands according to conservative estimates.35. No Westerners know Iraq better than Dennis Halliday and Hans von Sponek. The respected UN diplomats who were the chief UN humanitarian coordinators with an international staff of hundreds of investigators traveling daily through the country, both resigned in protest at what Halliday described as the genocidal character of the US-UK sanctions regime, both reject claims that food and medicine were being withheld by the authorities. Their successor, Tan Mayat, backed their view, describing the Iraqi system as the best distributioning system that he had ever seen in his life, as a World Food Programme official. The senior UN World Food Programme official reported that the WFP had conducted more than a million inspections of the system and uncovered no significant evidence of fraud or favoritism. He added that there was no way we could create something else that would work half as well as the Iraqi system, which is there most efficient in the world, and that the risk of a large-scale humanitarian crisis would increase if anything happened to disrupt it. 36. As Halliday, von Sponek, and others had pointed out for years, the sanctions devastated the population while strengthening Saddam Hussein and his clique, also increasing the dependency of the Iraqi people on the tyrant for their survival. Von Sponek, who resigned in 2000, reported that the US and UK systematically tried to prevent him and Halliday from briefing the Security Council because they didn't want to hear what we had to say about their dash page 105. Savagery of the sanctions. 37. The US media apparently agree, though the expert knowledge of the UN coordinators is without parallel. Americans have had to turn elsewhere to hear what they had to say, even at a moment of laser-like fixation on Iraq. Discussion of the effects of the sanctions has been minimal and apologetic, the usual procedure with regard to the crimes of one's own state. Academic researcher Joy Gordon found that even the information that does reach the Security Council is kept from public scrutiny, though she learned enough, as have others, to reveal a shameful record of deliberate cruelty and efforts pursued aggressively throughout the last decade to purposefully minimize the humanitarian goods that enter the country. In the face of enormous human suffering, including massive increases in child mortality and widespread epidemics. The U.S. blocked water tankers from reaching Iraq on grounds so spurious that they were rejected by the U.N. arms experts, this during a time when the major cause of child deaths was lack of access to clean drinking water, and when the country was in the midst of a drought. Washington insisted that vaccines for infant diseases be withheld until it was compelled to back down in the face of vigorous protest by UNICEF and the World Health Organization, supported by European biological weapons experts, who charged that the dual-use claims of the US were flatly impossible. 38. The International Red Cross, drawing on its own intimate familiarity with their country, concluded in 1999 that after a decade of sanctions, the Iraqi economy lies in debtors and the oil for food program, introduced by UN Resolution 986 in 1995, has not halted the collapse of the health system and the deterioration 
of water supplies, which together pose one of the gravest threats to the health and well-being of the civilian population. Aid agencies can only hope to mitigate some of the worst effects of the sanctions and cannot nearly cover their overwhelming needs of 22 million people. The ICRC reported. Dot 39. Defenders of the sanctions regime argued that the appalling situation was Saddam's fault because of his refusal to comply fully with UN resolutions and his construction of palaces and monuments to himself, and so on, funded by money diverted from smuggling and other illegal operations, according to the testimony of UN humanitarian coordinators and the World Food Programme. The argument, then, was that we had to punish Saddam for his crimes by crushing his victims and strengthening their torturer. By similar logic, if a criminal hijacks a school bus, we should blow it up and murder the passengers, but rescue and reward the hijacker, justifying the actions on grounds that it was his fault. Dot forty studied lack of interest in the likely consequences of war for the population. Dash page 106. Of the country to be invaded is conventional. The same was true when, five days after 9-11, Washington demanded that Pakistan eliminate drug convoys that provide much of the food and other supplies to Afghanistan's civilian population and caused the withdrawal of aid workers along with severe reduction in food supplies, thereby leaving millions of Afghans at grave risk of starvation. 41. Risk of what should properly have been termed silent genocide. Estimates of the numbers at grave risk of starvation rose from 5 million before 9-11 to 7.5 million a month later. The threat and then reality of bombing elicited sharp protests from aid organizations and warnings of what might ensue, which received only scattered and very partial attention, and little reaction. Perhaps it's worth repeating the obvious. One always hopes that worst case scenarios will not materialize, and every effort should always be dedicated to that end. But exactly as in the case of Khrushchev's dispatch of missiles to Cuba, which could have led to nuclear war but didn't, it is the range of likely possibilities that determines the evaluation of policy choices that are made, at least for those capable of entertaining elementary moral standards. Trivially, that judgment remains true whatever the outcome a truism we understand well enough when applied to official enemies but find much harder to apply to ourselves, democracy and human rights. As noted, establishment critics restricted their comments regarding the attack on Iraq to the administration arguments they took to be seriously intended. Disarmament, deterrence, and links to terrorism. They scarcely made reference to liberation, democratization of the Middle East, and other matters that would render irrelevant the inspections and indeed everything that took place at their security council or within governmental domains. The reason, perhaps, is that they recognized that lofty rhetoric is the obligatory accompaniment of virtually any resort to force and therefore carries no information. The rhetoric is doubly Hard to take seriously in the light of the display of contempt for democracy that accompanied it, not to speak of the past record and current practices. Critics are also aware that nothing has been heard from the present incumbents with their alleged concern for Iraqi democracy to indicate that they have any regrets for their previous support for Saddam Hussein or others like him still continuing nor have they shown any signs of contrition for having helped him develop WMD when he really was a serious danger. Nor has their dash page 107 
current leadership explained when or why they abandoned their 1991 view that the best of all worlds would be an iron-fisted Iraqi junta without Saddam. Hussein that would rule as Saddam did but not make the error of judgment in August 1990 that ruined Saddam's record. 42. At the time, the incumbents British allies were in the opposition and therefore more free than the Thatcherites to speak out against Saddam's British-backed crimes. Their names are noteworthy by their absence from the parliamentary record of protests against these crimes, including Tony Blair, Jack Straw, Jeff Poon, and other leading figures of New Labour. In December 2002, Jack Straw, then Foreign Minister, released a dossier of Saddam's crimes. It was drawn almost entirely from the period of firm US-UK support a fact overlooked with the usual display of moral integrity. The timing and quality of the dossier raised many questions, but those aside, Straw failed to provide an explanation for his very recent conversion to skepticism about Saddam Hussein's good character and behavior. When Straw was Home Secretary in 2001, an Iraqi who fled to England after detention and torture requested asylum. Straw denied his request. The Home Office explained that Straw is aware that Iraq, and in particular their Iraqi security forces, would only convict and sentence a person in the courts with the provision of proper jurisdiction, so that you could expect to receive a fair trial under an independent and properly constituted judiciary. Straws. Conversion must, then, have been rather similar to President Clinton's discovery. Sometime between September 8 and 11, 1999, that Indonesia had done some unpleasant things in East Timor in the past 25 years when it enjoyed decisive support from the US and Britain. 43. Attitudes toward democracy were revealed with unusual clarity during their mobilization for war in the fall of 2002, as it became necessary to deal somehow with the overwhelming popular opposition within the coalition of the willing. The US public was at least partially controlled by the propaganda campaign. Unleashed in September. In Britain. The population was split roughly 50-50 on the war, but the government maintained the stance of junior partner it had accepted reluctantly after World War II and had kept even in the face of the contemptuous dismissal of British concerns by US leaders at moments when their country's very survival was at stake. Outside the two full members of the coalition, Problems were more serious. In the two major European countries, Germany and France, the official government stands corresponded to the views of the large majority of their populations, which unequivocally opposed the war. That led to bitter condemnation by Dash page 108. Washington and many commentators. Donald Rumsfeld dismissed the offending nations as just the old Europe, of no concern because of their reluctance to tow Washington's line. The new Europe is symbolized by Italy, whose prime minister, Silvio Berlusconi, was visiting the White House. It was, evidently, unproblematic that public opinion in Italy was overwhelmingly opposed to the war. The governments of old and new Europe were distinguished by a simple Criterion, a government joined old Europe in its iniquity if and only if it took the same position as the vast majority of its population and refused to follow orders from Washington. Recall that the self-appointed rulers of the world, Bush, Powell, and the rest, had declared forthrightly that they intended to carry out their war, whether or not the UN or anyone else catches up and becomes relevant. Old Europe, mired in irrelevance, 
did not catch up. Neither did new. Europe, at least if people are part of their countries. Poll results available from Gallup International, as well as local sources for most of Europe, West and East, showed that support for a war carried out unilaterally by America and its allies did not rise above 11% in any country. Support for a war if mandated by the UN ranged from 13%, Spain, to 51%, Netherlands. Particularly interesting are the eight countries whose leaders declared themselves to be the new Europe, to much acclaim for their courage and integrity. Their declaration took the form of a statement calling on the Security Council to ensure full compliance with its resolutions, without specifying their means. Their announcement threatened to isolate the Germans and French, the press reported triumphantly through the positions of new and old Europe were, in fact scarcely different, to ensure that Germany and France would be isolated. They were not invited to sign the bold pronouncement of new Europe, apparently for fear that they would do so. It was later quietly indicated. 44. The standard interpretation is that the exciting and promising new Europe stood behind Washington, thus demonstrating that many Europeans supported the United States' view, even if France and Germany did not. 45 were these. Many Europeans, checking polls, we find that in new Europe, opposition to the United States' view was for the most part even higher than in France and Germany, particularly in Italy and Spain, which were singled out for praise for their leadership of new Europe. Happily for Washington, former communist countries too joined new Europe. Within them, support for the United States' view, as defined by Powell. Dash page 109. Namely, war by the coalition of the willing without UN authorization, ranged from 4%, Macedonia, to 11%, Romania. Support for a war even with a UN mandate was also very low. Latvia's former foreign minister explained that we have to salute and shout, yes, sir, we have to please America no matter what the cost. 46. In brief, in journals that regard democracy as a significant value, headlines would have read that old Europe in fact included the vast majority of Europeans, East and West, while New Europe consisted of a few leaders who chose to line up, ambiguously, with Washington, disregarding their overwhelming opinion of their own populations. But actual reporting was mostly scattered and oblique, depicting opposition to the war as a marketing problem for Washington. Toward the liberal end of the spectrum, Richard Holbrook stressed the very important point that, if you add up the population of the eight countries of the original New Europe, it was larger than the population of those countries not signing the letter. True enough, though something is omitted, the populations were overwhelmingly opposed to the war mostly even more so than in those countries dismissed as old Europe. 47 at the other extreme of the spectrum, the editors of the Wall Street Journal applauded the statement of the eight original signers for exposing as fraudulent the conventional wisdom that France and Germany speak for all of Europe, and that all of Europe is now anti-American. The eight honorable new European leaders showed that the views of the continent's pro-American majority weren't being heard, apart from the editorial pages of the journal, now vindicated. The editors blasted the media to their left a rather substantial segment, which peddled as truth a ridiculous idea that France and Germany spoke for Europe when they were clearly a pitiful minority, and peddled these lies because they served the political purposes of 
those, both in Europe and America, who oppose President Bush on Iraq. This conclusion does hold if we exclude Europeans from Europe, rejecting the radical left doctrine that people have some kind of role in democratic societies. 48. Back among the liberals, Thomas Friedman suggested that France should be driven off the Security Council and replaced by India, which is just so much more serious than France these days. France, as they say in kindergarten, does not play well with others, and therefore doesn't line up against Saddam, but is caught up with its need to differentiate itself from America in an effort to be unique. To translate, the French government acted in accord with popular opinion, which was opposed to Washington's war plans. Therefore France was. Dash page 110. In kindergarten, through the population of New Europe must still have been in nursery school, judging by polls. India, on the other hand, is serious, now that it is governed by a proto-fascist party that is handing the country's resources to foreign multinationals while preaching an ultranationalist line for domestic purposes, and had just been implicated in a horrendous massacre of Muslims in Gujarat. And as Friedman has reported enthusiastically elsewhere, India has a wonderful software industry and sectors of great wealth. Uninterestingly, also, hundreds of millions of people living under some of the worst conditions in the world, where the plight of women is not very different from life under the Taliban. All of this is of no concern as long as India is serious, just as life under the Taliban was of no concern as long as they were considered cooperative. 49. Others preferred the kick and boot stand. Berlusconi, Aznar, and the other Chichilian figures who joined Washington demonstrated unparalleled political courage by keeping to their understanding of right and wrong instead of sheepishly succumbing to the paranoid, conspiratorial anti-Americanism of the vast majority of Europeans, who are driven by avarice and therefore unable to comprehend the strain of idealism that makes America tick. True, those leaders made no discernible effort to enlighten the misguided populations whose views they disregarded while courageously lining up behind the most powerful military force in history. But perhaps they are not really duplicates of Churchill and FDR standing up to Hitler, rather of President Bush, whose moral rectitude derives from his evangelical zeal, as proven by the fact that his PR agents tell us. 50. So, there are many other illustrations. When Gerard Schroeder dared to take the position of the overwhelming majority of German voters in the 2002 election, he was bitterly condemned for his shocking failure of leadership. One illustration of a serious problem, the government lives in fear of its voters that Germany must overcome if it wants to be accepted in the civilized world. 51. The case of Turkey is particularly revealing, like others throughout the region. Turks despised Saddam Hussein but did not fear him. They also strongly opposed the war, about 90% in January 2003, when efforts were peaking to ensure that political leaders, if not their populations, would join Washington's enterprise. The government acted in accord with the will of the people. That shows that the elected government lacks democratic credentials, we learned on the day the polls were released, in a commentary by former ambassador to Turkey Morton Abramowitz, now a distinguished senior statesman and commentator. Ten years ago, he explained, most of Turkey, like today, was dash page 111 against any involvement in a war with Iraq. But there was one notable exception, President Turgut 
a true Democrat who overrode his countrymen's pronounced preference to stay out of the Gulf War, sadly. However, the current leadership is now following the people when it comes to participating in another Iraq war, rather than succumbing to intense pressures. From Washington, regrettably, Abramowitz sighed, for the US there is no true Democrat around, as there was 10 years ago.52. Demonstrating still more clearly the lack of democratic credentials of the governing party, its unofficial leader, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, not only criticized Washington's rush to war but took a step into truly forbidden territory. Criticizing countries, the US included, that built up their own weapons of mass destruction while trying to force others to get rid of theirs. 53. As US pressures mounted, Turkey's democracy began to improve. While popular opinion apparently turned even more strongly against the war, the government finally yielded to severe US economic and other coercion, and agreed to comply with Washington's demands over overwhelming popular opposition. A Western diplomat probably from the US Embassy, told their press that he was encouraged by the decision, and found it a very positive thing. Turkey correspondent Tambor Zaman added that a war against Iraq remains deeply unpopular among the Turkish population. That is why Thursday's parliamentary session was closed to the public and balloting was secret. Headlines were stinging in the criticism of Turkey's ruling Justice and Development Party on Friday. The front page of their respected daily radical said the parliament ran away from the people. With near unanimity, Turks opposed Washington's orders, but it was understood that the leadership must obey, and Turkey joined New Europe.54 or so it appeared. In the end, the Turks proceeded to teach a lesson in democracy to the West. Parliament finally refused to allow US troops to be deployed fully in Turkey to formulate the outcome within the conventional framework. The ground war has been hampered because Turkey did not accept its role as host of the Northern Front forces, again for political reasons. Its government was too weak in the face of anti-war feeling.55. The presuppositions are clear. Strong governments disregard their populations and accept the role assigned to them by the global ruler, weak. Governments succumb to the will of 95% of their population. The crucial point was expressed clearly by Pentagon planner Paul Wolfowitz. He too berated the Turkish government for its misbehavior, that went on to dash page 112. Condemned the military, who did not play their strong leadership role that we would have expected but betrayed weakness in permitting the government to honor near unanimous public opinion. Turkey, he argued, had therefore to step up and say, we made a mistake. Let's figure out how we can be as helpful as possible to the Americans. Wolfowitz's stand is particularly instructive because he is presented as the leading visionary in the crusade to democratize the Middle East. S6. The pronouncements about the old and new Europe, and the hysteria that often accompanied them, provide some informative lessons about prevailing attitudes toward democracy among political and intellectual elites. Dislike of democracy is nothing new. For obvious reasons, it is a traditional stance of those who have a share in power and privilege. But it is rarely so starkly illuminated. That may help explain why establishment critics scarcely refer to their democratization rhetoric that accompanies the political leadership's dramatic display of contempt for democracy, evidently widely shared, to judge by commentary. 
knowledgeable commentators have pointed to the uncomfortable dualism in Bush's foreign policy, with Bush the neo-Reaganite making ringing calls for a vigorous new democracy campaign in the Middle East, while policy imperatives tempt Washington to put aside its democratic scruples and seek closer ties with autocracies as in the past, with remarkable consistency. Reviewing this dualism and the continuing support for brutal and repressive regimes, Thomas Carothers expressed his hope that Bush would shift to the true spirit of President Ronald Reagan's foreign policy with its attempts to spread democracy. 57. These hopes are particularly interesting because of their source. Carothers has done some of the most careful work elucidating the true spirit of Reaganite. Dedication to democracy. He combines the standpoint of the scholar with that of an insider. Having been a participant in the Reagan State Department's Democracy Enhancement Projects in Latin America, he regards these programs as sincere, but a failure, where Washington's influence was least in the southern cone of Latin America. There was progress toward democracy, which the Reagan administration sought to impede but finally accepted, where Washington's Influence was greatest, success was least. The reason, Carothers explains, is that the Reaganite yearning for democracy was restricted to limited, top down forms of democratic change that did not risk upsetting the traditional structures of power with which the United States has long been allied. Washington saw to dash page 113. Maintain the basic order of quite undemocratic societies and to avoid populist based change. Carothers recognizes that there is a liberal critique of the Reaganite approach, but he rejects it because of its perennial weak spot. It offers no alternative. The option of allowing the population a meaningful voice in running their own affairs is not an alternative not even to be dismissed. Carothers also does not discuss the dedicated efforts during those years to undermine the threat of more meaningful democracy where it arose. 58. The targeted populations are well aware of the nature of the democracy that is being brought to them. It has been regularly observed that the extension of Formal democracy in Latin America has been accompanied by increasing disillusionment about democracy. One reason, pointed out some years ago by Argentine political scientist Attilio Boron, is that the new wave of democratization in Latin America has coincided with neoliberal economic reforms, which undermine effective democracy. 59 The post war Bretton Woods system was based on capital controls and relatively fixed currencies, not only in the expectation of economic benefit, as proved to be the case, but also to allow governments space to carry out highly popular social democratic policies. It was understood that the kind of financial liberalization that opened the neoliberal era in the 1970s reduces the options for democratic choice, transferring decisions to the hands of a virtual senate of investors and lenders. 60 governments now face a dual constituency conundrum, which pits the interests of voters against foreign currency traders and hedge fund managers who conduct a moment to moment referendum on the economic and financial policies of developing and developed nations alike, and the competition is highly unequal. John Maynard Keynes warned 70 years ago that nothing less than the democratic experiment in self-government was endangered by the threat of global financial market forces. The Secretary General of the Organization of American States a strong advocate of neoliberal globalization, opened their 
annual session by warning that free movement of capital, the most undesirable feature of globalization in fact, its cow feature, is the greatest obstacle to democratic governance, just as Keynes had warned. 61 The fears go back to Adam Smith. His sole use of the phrase invisible hand in wealth of nations is in a discussion of the harmful consequences of foreign investment, which England need not fear, he believed, because an invisible hand will induce investors to keep their capital at home. The same is true of other parts of the neoliberal package, privatization, for example, reduces the arena of potential democratic choice, dramatically in the dash page 114 case of liberalization of services, which has evoked enormous popular opposition. Even in narrow economic terms, the privatization programs were imposed with little if any solid empirical evidence or theoretical grounding. 62. Disillusionment with formal democracy has been evident in the U.S. as well. Increasing through the neoliberal period, there was much clamor about their stolen election of November 2000, and surprise that the public did not seem to care very much. Likely reasons are suggested by public opinion studies, which revealed that on the eve of the election, three quarters of the population regarded it as a game played by large contributors, party leaders, and the PR industry, which crafted candidates to say almost anything to get themselves elected. On almost all issues, citizens could not identify the stands of the candidates, as intended. Issues on which the public differs from elite opinion are generally off the agenda. Voters were directed to personal qualities, not issues. Among voters, heavenly skewed toward the wealthy, those who recognize their class interests to be at stake tend to vote to protect those interests, for the more reactionary of the two business parties. But the general public splits its vote in other ways, sometimes, as in 2000, leading to a statistical tie. Among working people, non-economic issues such as gun ownership and religiosity were leading factors, so that people often voted against their own primary interests, apparently assuming that they had little choice. In 2000, feelings of powerlessness reached the highest level recorded, over 50%.63. What remains of democracy is largely the right to choose among commodities. Business leaders have long explained the need to impose on the population a philosophy of futility and lack of purpose in life to concentrate human attention on the more superficial things that comprise much of fashionable consumption. 64 Deluged by such propaganda from infancy, people may then accept their meaningless and subordinate lives and forget ridiculous ideas about managing their own affairs. They may abandon their fate to corporate managers and the PR industry and, in the political realm, to the self-described intelligent minorities who serve and administer power. From this perspective, conventional in elite opinion, the November 2000 Elections did not reveal a flaw of U.S. democracy, but rather its triumph. And, generalizing, it is fair to hail the triumph of democracy throughout their hemisphere and elsewhere, even though the populations do not see it that way. Liberation from tyranny, constructive solutions. The implausibility of the belief that Washington is suddenly concerned with Dash page 115. Democracy and human rights in Iraq, or elsewhere, should not prevent the wild men in the wings from persisting in their commitment to these ends and, to the extent possible, exerting influence in that direction. In the case of Iraq, there was always good reason to take seriously their 
conclusions of the most knowledgeable observers that a constructive solution to regime change in Iraq would be to lift the economic sanctions that have impoverished society, decimated the Iraqi middle class and eliminated any possibility for the emergence of alternative leadership, while 12 years of sanctions have only strengthened the current regime, Hans von Sponek. Furthermore, the sanctions compelled the population to depend for survival on the reigning tyranny, reducing even more the likelihood of a constructive solution. We have sustained the regime and denied the opportunities for change. Dennis Halliday added, I believe if the Iraqis had their economy, had their lives back, and had their way of life restored, they would take care of their form of governance that they want, that they believe is suitable to their country. 65. Were these illusions? The historical record hardly suggests so. Again, consider the fate of the miserable tyrants supported by the current incumbents until their very end of their bloody rule, all overthrown by internal revolt. The case of Section S. Q. Only one of many is particularly instructive because of the nature of the internal tyrannies. As priorities shifted in 2002, it was claimed that those who shared responsibility for 20 years of torture of Iraqis were entitled to resort to violence to bring about democracy. Even their consistent record of support for savagery and tyranny and their hostility to democracy demonstrated with unusual passion at that very moment provided no reason to question their proclaimed intentions but suspending disbelief violence can be considered only if constructive solutions have clearly failed since such solutions were not even permitted in the case of Iraq it can hardly be maintained that the stage of last resort had been reached. That conclusion holds whatever one's subjective judgments may be about the likelihood of success, all basically irrelevant. To paraphrase Lisa Marlowe, if this is to be the model for the hegemonic superpower, heaven help us all. Since the Reagan Bush I years, in fact before, Washington had supported Saddam Hussein in varying ways. After he stepped out of line in August 1990, policies and pretexts varied, but one element remained constant, the people of Iraq must not control their country. To repeat, the tyrant was permitted to dash page 116. Suppress the 1991 uprising because we were informed, Washington sought a military junta that would rule the country with an iron fist, and if no alternative is available, Saddam would have to do. The rebels failed because very few people outside Iraq wanted them to win meaning Washington and its local allies, who held the strikingly unanimous view that whatever the sense of the Iraqi leader he offered the West and the region a better hope for his country's stability than did those who have suffered his repression. It was impressive to see how uniformly all of this was suppressed in the shocked commentary and reporting on the exposure of the mass graves of the victims of Saddam's U.S. authorized paroxysm of terror, offered as justification from the recent war on moral grounds now that we have seen the mass graves and the true extent of Saddam's genocidal evil, all known at once in 1991 but ignored because of their imperative of stability. 66. The uprising would have left the country in the hands of Iraqis who might have been independent of Washington. The sanctions of the following years undercut the possibility of the kind of popular revolt that had overthrown other monsters who were also strongly supported by the current incumbents. The U.S. sought to instigate coups by groups it controlled, but a popular rebellion would 
not have left the U.S. in charge. At the Azores summit in March 2003, Bush reiterated that stand, declaring that the U.S. would invade even if Saddam and his cohorts were to leave the country. The question of who should rule Iraq remains a prime issue of contention. Leading figures of the U.S.-backed opposition demanded at once that the U.N. play a vital role in post-war Iraq and rejected U.S. control of reconstruction or of the post-Saddam government. They strongly opposed U.S. hegemony over Iraq. Even Washington's chosen figures vigorously protested the plans to sideline them in favor of a U.S. occupation. There were also indications that the Shiite majority might support an Islamic republic if given a voice, hardly to the taste of Washington and its plans for the region. There seems little reason to doubt that U.S. policymakers will attempt to follow the consistent practice elsewhere. Formal democracy is fine, but only if it obeys orders, like New Europe or the limited top-down democracies in Latin America run by the traditional structures of power with which the United States has long been allied, Caro Thurs, Brent Scowcroft, National Security Advisor for Bush I, spoke for the moderates when he observed that if there is an election in Iraq and the radicals win, we're surely not going to let them take over. 67. Thus if the Shiite majority has a significant voice in post-Saddam Iraq and joins. Dash page 117. Others in the region in trying to improve relations with Iran, they will be radicals and treated accordingly. One can only expect the same if secular Democrats win who prove to be radicals, unless we decide that history is bunk. The basic lines of U.S. thinking were illustrated in the organization chart of the Civil Administration of Post-War Iraq. There are 16 boxes, each containing a name in boldface and a designation of the person's responsibility, from Presidential Envoy Paul Bremer at the top, answering to the Pentagon, down through the chart. Seven are generals. Most of the rest government officials, none. Iraqis. At the very bottom, there is a 17th box, about one third the size of the others, with no names, no boldface, and no functions. It reads Iraqi Ministry. Advisors. 68. Some puzzled notice has been taken of the change in U.S. policy with regard to post war control in Iraq. Elsewhere, Washington has been happy to transfer responsibility and costs to others, but in Iraq, it has insisted on running the show itself. There is no inconsistency. Iraq is not East Timor, Kosovo and Afghanistan, condolese, sir. Rice rightly stressed. Dot 69 she did not spell out the distinction. Perhaps it is too transparent. Iraq is a major prize, the others are considered basket cases. Therefore, Washington must be in charge, not the UN, not the Iraqi people. Putting aside the crucial question of who will be in charge, those concerned with the tragedy of Iraq had three basic goals. 1. Overthrowing the tyranny. 2. Ending the sanctions that were targeting the people, not the rulers. And 3 preserving some semblance of world order. There can be no disagreement among decent people on the first two goals. Achieving them is an occasion for rejoicing, particularly for those who protested U.S. support for Saddam before his invasion of Kuwait and again immediately afterward, and opposed the sanctions regime that followed. They can therefore applaud the outcome without hypocrisy. The second goal could surely have been achieved, and possibly there. First as well, without undermining the third. The Bush administration openly declared its intention to dismantle what remained of the system of world order. 
and to control the world by force, with Iraq serving as the petri dish, as the new. York Times called it, for establishing the new norms. It was that declared. Intention that elicited fear and often hatred throughout the world, and despair. Among those who are not content to live in infamy empty and are concerned about the likely consequences of choosing to do so. That is, of course, a choice, one that is very largely in the hands of the American people. Dash page 118. Chapter 6. Dilemmas of Dominance. Enthusiasm about the new Europe of the former Soviet Empire is not solely based on the fact that its leadership is willing to salute and shout, Yes, sir. More fundamental reasons were articulated as the European Union considered extension of membership to these countries. The US strongly supported this move. The countries of the East are Europe's real modernizers, political. Commentator David Ignatius explained, they can blow apart the bureaucratism and welfare state culture that still hobble much of Europe and let free markets 1. Function the way they should as in the US, where the economy relies heavily on the state sector, and the current incumbents broke post-war records in protectionism during their first tenure in office. Since the freedom-loving, technology-adapting people of the East are payday, small fraction of what workers in the West turn, Ignatius continues, they can drive all of Europe toward the realities of modern capitalism, the American model, apparently ideal by definition. The model has per capita growth rates approximately equal to Europe's and unemployment at about the same level. Along with the highest rates of inequality and poverty, the highest workloads, and some of the weakest benefits and support systems in the advanced industrial world. The median male wage in 2000 was still below the 1979 level after the late 90s boomlet, though productivity was 45% higher, one sign of their sharp shift toward benefits for capital that is being accelerated more radically under Bush too. The potential contributions of Eastern Europe to undermining quality of life for the majority in the West was recognized immediately after the fall of their Berlin Wall. The business press was exultant about the green shoots in communism's ruins, where rising unemployment and pauperization of large Sections of the industrial working class meant that people were willing to work longer hours than their pampered colleagues in the West, at 40% of their wages and with few benefits. Further green shoots include enough repression. Dash page 119. To keep working people in line and attractive state subsidies for Western investors. These market reforms would enable Europe to hammer away at high wages and corporate taxes, short working hours, labor immobility, and luxurious social programs. Europe would be able to follow the American pattern, where the decline of real wages in the Reagan years to the lowest level among their advanced industrial societies, apart from Britain, was a welcome development of transcendent importance, with communism's ruins playing something like the role of Mexico, the advantages can now be brought to Western Europe as two, well, driving it toward the US-British model. Communism's ruins have many advantages over the regions that have been under unbroken Western domination for centuries. Those on the eastern side of the 500-year-old fault line dividing East and West, not quite that of the Cold War, but similar, enjoyed much higher standards of health and education after the East exited from its status as the West's original Third World, and they even have the right skin color, with the return of something like traditional 
relationships. The East can now provide other benefits, including a huge flood of easily exploited labor. The Ukraine is now reported to be replacing Southern Europe as the source of cheap labor in the West, depriving the collapsing Ukrainian economy of its most productive workers, like their counterparts from Central America. Ukrainian emigrants send back enormous remittances, thus helping to keep what remains of the society alive. Working and living conditions are so awful that death rates are high, and perhaps 100,000 Ukrainian women are 3. Held in sexual slavery. Not an unfamiliar story. It is clear enough why the de facto world government described in the Business press should welcome Eastern Europe's market reforms, but for U.S. elites they have a further significance, like independent social and economic development in the third world. Western Europe's social market system could be a virus that might infect others, hence a form of successful defiance that must be dispatched to oblivion. The European welfare state systems could have a dangerous impact on American public opinion, as revealed by the continued popularity in the U.S. of a universal tax-based health care system, despite constant denigration in the media and the exclusion of the option from the electoral agenda on grounds that it is politically impossible no matter what the public may think about it. The realities of modern capitalism illustrated in the regions long subject to Western control have been brought to much of Eastern Europe as its economies have been Latin Americanized. The reasons are debated, but the essential facts. Dash page 120 of the social and economic collapse are not the demographic consequences. While uncertain in scale, provide one index. The UN Development Programme estimates 10 million excess male deaths during the 1990s, approximately the toll of Stalin's purge 60 years earlier. If these figures are near accurate, Russia appears to be the first country to experience such a sharp decrease in births versus deaths for reasons other than war, famine or disease. David Powell writes. The demographic crisis is in part attributed to the crumbling of Russia's health care system and market reforms. The general collapse has been so severe that even the monstrous Stalin is remembered with some appreciation. More than half of Russians believe Stalin's role in Russian history was positive. 4. While only a third disagreed, polls indicated in early 2003. The plans of the U.S. overseers of Iraq seem rather similar to those that were applied in Russia, and that have led to dismal outcomes elsewhere with fair consistency. On European unification, Washington's attitudes have always been complex. Like its predecessors, the Kennedy administration pressed for European unity, but with some concern that Europe might go its own way. The respected senior diplomat David Bruce was a leading advocate for European unification in the Kennedy years, but, typically, saw dangers if Europe struck off on its own. 5. Seeking to play a role independent of the United States. The guiding principles were well expressed by Henry Kissinger in his year of Europe address in 1973. The world system he advised, should be based on their recognition that the United States has global interests and responsibilities while its allies have only regional interests. The U.S. must be concerned more with their overall framework of order than with the management of every regional. 6. Enterprise. Europe must not pursue its own independent course, based on its Franco-German industrial and financial heartland, another reason for concern about old Europe, 
quite apart from the reluctance of its governments to follow Washington's commands with regard to the Iraq war. The principles remain in force despite changing circumstances, quite apart from their potential contributions to undermining the social market systems of Western Europe. Eastern European countries are expected to be a Trojan horse for U.S. interests, undermining any drift toward an independent role in the world. By 1973, U.S. global dominance had declined from its post-World War II peak. One measure is U.S. control of the world's wealth, which is estimated to have shrunk from roughly 50% to half of that as the world economy moved to tripolar order, with three major power centers, North America, Europe, and Japan-based Asia. These structures have since been modified further, particularly dash page 121. With the rise of the East Asian tigers and the entry of China into the global system as a major player. The basic concerns about the prospect of an independent Europe extend to Asia as well, in new ways. Long before World War II, the US was by far the greatest economic power in the world, but not a leading actor in global management. The war changed that. Rival powers were either devastated or severely weakened, while the US gained enormously. Industrial production almost quadrupled under the semi-command economy. By 1945 the US had not only overwhelming economic dominance but also a position of incomparable security. It controlled the hemisphere, the surrounding oceans, and most of the territory bordering them. US planners moved quickly to organize the global system following plans that had already been developed to satisfy the requirements of the United States in a world in which it proposed to hold unquestioned power while limiting the sovereignty of seven those who might pose a challenge. The new global order was to be subordinated to the needs of the U.S. economy and subject to U.S. political control as much as possible. Imperial controls, especially the British, were to be dismantled while Washington extended its own regional systems in Latin America and the Pacific on the principle, explained by Abe Fortas, that what was good for us was good for the world. This altruistic concern was not appreciated by the British Foreign Office. Officials recognized that Washington guided by the economic imperialism of American business interests, is attempting to elbow us out, but could do little about it. The Minister of State at the Foreign Office commented to his cabinet colleagues that Americans believe that the United States stands for something in the world, something of which the world is need, something which the world is going to like something in the final analysis, which the world is going to take, whether it 8. Likes it or not. He was articulating the real-world version of Wilsonian idealism. The version that conforms to the historical record. U.S. planning at the time was sophisticated and thorough. The highest priority was to reconstruct the industrial world along lines that would satisfy their requirements of the business interests that dominate policy formation, in particular, to absorb U.S. manufacturing surpluses, overcome the dollar gap, and offer opportunities for investment. The outcomes were appreciated by the domestic beneficiaries. Reagan's Commerce Department observed that their Marshall Plan set the stage for large amounts of private U.S. direct investment in Europe, laying the groundwork for multinational corporations, MNCs, business. Week described MNCs in 1975 as the economic expression of the political. Dash page 122. 
framework established by post-war policymakers in which American business prospered and expanded on overseas orders, fueled initially by the dollars of the Marshall Plan and protected from negative developments by the umbrella. 9. Of American power. Other parts of the world were assigned their functions by State Department. Planners. Thus Southeast Asia was to provide resources and raw materials to the former imperial masters, crucially Britain but also Japan, which was to be granted some sort of empire toward the south, in the phrase of George Kennan, head of the State Department's policy planning staff. Ten some areas were of little interest to the planners, notably Africa, which Kennan advised should be handed over the two Europeans to exploit for their reconstruction. A different post-war Europe-Africa relationship comes to mind in the light of history but does not seem to have been considered. The Middle East, in contrast, was to be taken over by the United States. In 1945, State Department officials described Saudi Arabian energy resources as a stupendous source of strategic power, and one of the greatest material prizes in world history, the Gulf region generally was considered probably the richest economic prize in the field of foreign investment. Eisenhower later described it as the most strategically important area of the world. Britain agreed. Its Planners described the resources of the region in 1947 as a vital prize for any power interested in world influence or domination. 11. France was expelled from the Middle East by legalistic maneuvers, and Britain declined over the time to junior partner. Kennan, who was far-sighted, recognized that by controlling Japan's supplies of energy, primarily in the Middle East at the time, the U.S. would achieve some veto power over Japan's potential military and industrial policy, though Japanese prospects were generally disparaged at the time. The issue has been their source of continued conflict since, with regard to Europe as well, as both Europe and Japan have sought a degree of energy independence. Meanwhile Asia was changing. A prestigious task force, reporting in 2003, described Northeast Asia as the epicenter of international commerce and technological innovation, the fastest growing economic region in the world. For much of the past two decades, by now accounting for nearly 30% of global GDP, far ahead of the United States and also holding about half of global foreign exchange reserves. These economies also account for nearly half of global inbound foreign direct investment and are becoming an increasing source of outbound FDI flowing within East Asia and to Europe and North America. Dash page 123 which now trade more with Northeast Asia than with each other. 12. The region is, furthermore, an integrated one. Eastern Russia is rich in natural resources, for which the industrial centers of Northeast Asia are the natural market. Integration would be enhanced by economic unification of the two. The Koreas with gas pipelines passing through North Korea and an extension of their Trans-Siberian Railroad on the same course. North Korea was the most dangerous and ugly member of the Axis of Evil, but lowest on the target list. Like Iran, but unlike Iraq, it failed the first of their criteria for a legitimate target. It was not defenseless. Presumably, the Pentagon is working on ways to knock out the North Korean deterrent, must artillery aimed at Seoul and U.S. forces, which are being withdrawn out of artillery range, arousing concerns in Korea about U.S. intentions. Considered in isolation, North Korea also fails the second criterion for a target, 
It is one of the poorest and most miserable countries in the world, but as part of the Northeast Asia complex, it gains importance for the reasons indicated by the task force. Hence it is not an unlikely target of attack if the technical problem of countering its deterrent can be overcome. The task force recommends that Washington seek a diplomatic solution to the current crisis. It should continue the process, begun haltingly and unevenly. Under Clinton, aimed at normalizing United States economic and political relations with North Korea, guaranteeing the security of a non-nuclear North Korea, promoting the reconciliation of North and South Korea, and drawing North Korea into economic engagement with its neighbors. Such interactions could accelerate economic reforms already underway in North Korea, leading in time to a diffusion of economic power that would loosen totalitarian political controls and moderate human rights abuses. These policies would conform to the regional consensus, including the North Korean dictatorship, it appears. The alternative confrontation in the manner of Bush from Svelte Cheney Grand strategy is the road to perdition, the task force argues. The recommended alternative poses certain problems, however, as the task Force describes, Northeast Asia is a rapidly developing and integrated region, which might go off on an independent course, just as continental Europe might. That raises the problem Kissinger outlined. In 1998 the National Bureau of Asian Research warned that pipelines that promote greater regional integration in Northeast Asia might exclude U.S. involvement except in a marginal way and could accelerate two process of evolution into regional blocks. 13. These pipelines could enhance regional stability and provide a cheap alternative to oil imported. Dash page 124. From the Middle East, Selig Harrison adds, but the United States seems uneasily wary of pipeline networks in Northeast Asia. The U.S. is aware that their countries of the region want to reduce what they find to be an increasingly uncomfortable reliance on the U.S., or from another point of view, the veto power the U.S. exercises by virtue of its control of Middle East oil and the sea. Lanes for tanker traffic the threat of potential independence may prove an impediment to diplomatic settlement. For partially related reasons, China is regarded as a prime potential enemy by Washington hawks, and much military planning is geared to that contingency. Recent efforts to strengthen India-US strategic relations are partly motivated by the same concerns, along with Washington's concerns about its control over the world's largest energy reserves in the Middle East. Washington's approach to North Korea resembles its stance on Iran and pre-invasion Iraq. In all three cases, neighboring countries had been pursuing efforts to overcome hostility and move toward integration, also attempting to lend support to reformist tendencies, or at least help lay the basis for them, and those efforts continue. With regard to Iran and North Korea, the U.S. somewhat hesitantly followed a similar approach toward North Korea during the Clinton years, with partial success, but apart from that, Washington has preferred confrontation. While the reasons for that preference are not identical in the three cases, there are common threads, which become clearer in the context of the grand strategy. In the early post-war years, U.S. planners sought to fashion East and Southeast Asia into a Japan-centered system within the overall framework of order maintained by the U.S. The basic framework was outlined in the San Francisco. Peace Treaty, SFPT, 
of 1951, which formally ended the war in Asia. 14. Apart from the three French colonies in Indochina, the only Asian countries that accepted the SFPT were Pakistan and Ceylon, both recently freed from British rule and remote from the Asian War. India refused to attend the San Francisco Conference because of the terms of the treaty, among them the U.S. insistence on retaining Okinawa as a military base, as it still does, over strong protests from Okinawans, whose voices barely register in the U.S. Truman was outraged by India's disobedience. His reaction, no less elegant than the current reaction to the disobedience of old Europe and Turkey, was that India must have consulted Uncle Zhou and Mao Zedong of China. The white man got a name, not just a vulgar epithet. Partly that may be ordinary racism, or perhaps it is because Truman genuinely liked and admired old Zhou, who dash page 125 reminded him of the Missouri boss who had launched his political career. In the late 1940s, Truman found old Joe to be a decent fellow, though a prisoner of the Politburo who can't do what he wants to. Mao Zedong, however, was a yellow devil. These distinctions extended wartime propaganda. Nazis were evil but merited a certain respect. In the stereotype, at least, they were blonde, blue-eyed, orderly. Far more appealing than the frogs, whom Truman particularly disliked, not to speak of the wops. And they were a wholly different species from the Japs, who were vermin to be crushed, at least once they became enemies. Before that, the U.S. was ambivalent about Japanese depredations in Asia as long as U.S. business interests were protected. The primary victims of Japanese fascism and its predecessors, China and their Japanese colonies of Korea and Formosa, Taiwan did not attend the San Francisco Peace Conference and were accorded no serious concern. Koreans and Chinese received no reparations from Japan, nor did the Philippines, which also did not attend the conference. Secretary of State Dulles condemned Filipinos for the emotional prejudices that kept them from grasping why they would have no relief for the torture they had endured. Initially, Japan was to pay reparations, but only to the U.S. and other colonial powers, despite the fact that the war was a Japanese War of Aggression in Asia through the 1930s and only became a U.S.-led Western War with Japan after Pearl Harbor. Japan was also to reimburse the U.S. for the costs of the occupation. For its Asian victims, Japan was to pay compensation in the form of export of Japanese manufacturing products using Southeast Asian resources a central part of the arrangements that, in effect, reconstructed something like the new order in Asia that Japan had attempted to construct by conquest, but was now gaining under U.S. domination, so that it was unproblematic. Some Asian victims of Japanese fascism, forced laborers and prisoners of war, brought suit against Japanese corporations with subsidiaries in the U.S the legal successors of those responsible for the crimes. On the eve of the 50th anniversary of the SFPT, their suit was dismissed by a California judge, on grounds that their claims were barred by the terms of the SFPT, relying on an amicus brief filed by the State Department in support of the accused Japanese corporations. The court ruled that the SFPT had served to sustain U.S. security interests in Asia and to support peace and stability in the region. Asia historian John Price described this judgment as one of the more abysmal moments of denial, pointing out that at least 10 million people had been killed in wars in 
dash page 126. The region while Asia was enjoying peace and stability. In May 2003, John Nashcroft's Justice Department updated the stand of Clinton's State Department, submitting an amicus brief in support of the energy giant knuckle that would roll back 20 years of judicial rulings for victims of human rights abuse, Human Rights Watch warned, the Justice Department. Brief goes far beyond defense of the energy corporation against charges of brutal treatment of Burmese workers, slave laborers in effect. It calls for a radical reinterpretation of the Alien Tort Claims Act, ATCA, which permits victims of serious violations of international law abroad to seek civil damages in U.S. courts against their alleged abusers who are found in the United States. The Bush administration is the first to call for reversing court decisions upholding their ATCA. It is a craven attempt to protect human rights abusers at the expense of victims. HRW Executive Director Kenneth Roth observes 15, particularly when the abusers are energy corporations, a cynic might add. The Tripola order that was taking shape from the early 1970s has since become more firm, and with it, the concern of U.S. planners that not only Europe but also Asia might seek a more independent course from a longer historical perspective, that would not be too surprising. In the 18th century, China and India were major commercial and industrial centers. East Asia was far ahead of Europe in public health and probably sophistication of market systems. Life expectancy in Japan may have been higher than in Europe. England was trying to catch up in textiles and other manufactures borrowing from India in ways that are now called piracy and are banned in the international trade agreements imposed by the rich states under a cynical pretense of free trade. The U.S. relied heavily on the same mechanisms as have other states that have developed as late as the mid-19th century. British observers claimed that Indian iron was as good as or better than British iron, and much cheaper. Colonization and forced liberalization converted India to a British dependency. It only resumed its growth and ended murderous famines after independence. China was not subjugated until the Second British Opium War 150 years ago, and also only resumed development after independence. Japan was the only part of Asia to resist colonization successfully, and the only one to develop, along with its colonies. It is not, then, a great surprise that Asia is returning to a position of considerable wealth and power after regaining sovereignty. These long-term historical processes, however, extend the problems of Sustaining the overall framework of order in which others must respect their proper place. The problems are not restricted to successful defiance in the third. Dash page 127. World, a major theme of the Cold War years, but reach the industrial heartlands. Themselves. Violence is a powerful instrument of control, as history demonstrates. But the dilemmas of dominance are not slight. Dash page 128. Chapter 7. Cauldron of Animosities. Let us return to Michael Crepin's belief that the final days of 2002 might be their most dangerous time since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. His primary concern was the unstable nuclear proliferation belt stretching from Pyongyang to 1. Baghdad, including Iran, Iraq, North Korea, and the Indian subcontinent. Similar concerns, widely held, were heightened by Bush administration. 
initiatives of 2000 and 2003 that were seriously increasing international tensions and threats. There is a far more fearsome nuclear power nearby, rarely featured in public discussion in the U.S. because it is an appendage of U.S. power. That convention is not observed within the unstable belt itself, or even within the U.S. strategic command, STRATCOM, which is responsible for the nuclear arsenal. General Lee Butler, Commander-in-Chief of STRATCOM in 1992-94, observed that it is dangerous in the extreme that in the cauldron of animosities that we call there. Middle East, one nation has armed itself, ostensibly, with stockpiles of nuclear weapons, perhaps numbering in the hundreds, and that inspires other nations to do so. Israel's WMDR of concern to the world's second leading nuclear power. 2. As well. Similar concerns were expressed, more obliquely, in Security Council. Resolution 687, which was selectively invoked by the Bush and Blair administrations in their efforts to provide a quasi-legal basis for their invasion of Iraq. Neither that nor any other resolution grants such authorization, but 687 did call for elimination of Iraqi WMD and delivery systems, as a step toward their goal of establishing in the Middle East a zone free from weapons of mass destruction and all missiles for their delivery. Article 14. U.S. intelligence and other sources assume that Israel has several hundred nuclear weapons and has been developing chemical and biological weapons. Article 14 is commonly ignored in U.S. commentary, but not elsewhere. Iraq, for example, called on the Security Council to apply Article 14. Its motives do not. Dash page 129. Obviate the importance of the issue. General Butler's concerns are not trivial. Undoubtedly. Israeli military power will continue to inspire other nations to develop WMD, including quite possibly even Iraq, if it is granted a modicum of independence. The issue addressed by Article 14 had arisen before, on the eve of the First Gulf War. After invading Kuwait in August 1990, Iraq made a number of proposals for withdrawal within the context of a broader regional settlement. These were leaked to the press by U.S. government officials who found them serious and negotiable. How serious they were we cannot judge, the U.S. immediately dismissed them, according to the only journalist in the country who reported the matter carefully, Knut Royce of Newsday. It is of some interest that in the final Polls before the bombing, two thirds of the American public favored a conference. 3. On the Israel Arab conflict, if it would lead to Iraqi withdrawal, doubtless those figures would have been higher if the public had known that Iraq had just made a similar proposal, dismissed by Washington. A devastating war and even more destructive aftermath might have been prevented. Hundreds of thousands of lives saved, and perhaps a basis laid for the overthrow of Saddam's tyranny. It is possible that steps might have been taken toward elimination of WMD and delivery systems in the region and beyond, perhaps even extending to the great powers for 30 years in violation of their commitment under the nuclear non-proliferation treaty to take good faith steps toward eliminating nuclear weapons, matters of no slight significance. Well beyond WMD, Israel's military capacities are regarded in the region as dangerous in the extreme. Though a very small country, Israel has chosen to become, in effect, an offshore U.S. military and technology base and as such has 
been able to develop highly advanced military forces. The core of the economy is a military-linked high-tech industrial system with close ties to the U.S. economy. Not surprisingly, Israel is coming to resemble its patron in other ways as well. A. Parliamentary Knesset investigation found that Israel is now rated second in the Western world, after the United States, in terms of social gaps in income, property, capital, education and spending, as well as in the extent of poverty. It's formerly quite successful social welfare system has eroded, and social cultural. 4. Values have changed significantly as well. Like its patron, Israel has military forces that are off the spectrum of societies. Comparable in other dimensions. The head of research and development for the Israel Defense Forces, IDF described its errant armored forces as larger and technologically more advanced than those of any NATO power apart from their dash page 130. 5. U.S. Its conventional military forces are used to attack its neighbors and to control and subjugate the population in the territories it occupies, in ways not easily overlooked in the region or by people elsewhere who are concerned with human rights. Israel also has a close military alliance with the other major regional military power, Turkey. The U.S.-Turkey-Israel alliance is sometimes called the axis of six evil in the Middle East. The term is understandable. There is always plenty of evil to go around and this axis at least has the merit of existing, unlike the one concocted by George Bush's speechwriters, which consists of two states that had been at war for twenty years and a third that was presumably throning because it is non-Muslim and universally reviled. U.S. academic specialist Robert Olson reports that 12% of Israel's Offensive aircraft are to be permanently stationed in Turkey and have been flying reconnaissance flights along Iran's border, signaling to Iran that it would soon be challenged elsewhere by Turkey and its Israeli and American allies. He suggests that these operations are part of a long-term effort to undermine and perhaps partition Iran, separating its northern Azeri regions. Rather, as Russia attempted to do in 1946, one of the early Cold War crises, thus turning the country into an anemic geopolitical entity, barred from access to the Caspian Sea and Central Asia generally Olson also discusses one of the usual background concerns to expedite development of oil pipelines from the Caspian. 7 region to Turkey and the Mediterranean, cutting out Iran. The U.S.-Turkey alliance might undergo some changes if the U.S. is able to shift military bases from eastern Turkey to Iraq, right in the heart of the world's richest energy reserves. U.S. anger over Turkey's democratic deviation in 2002-3 could weaken U.S.-Turkey military and intergovernmental relations but that seems doubtful. The existing tripartite alliance extends to parts of Central Asia and recently to India as well, since its government came under the control of the Hindu right in 1998, India has shifted its international stance considerably, moving toward a closer military relationship with both the US and its Israeli client. Indian political analyst Prafal Bidwai writes that the ruling Hindu nationalist fascination with Zionism is rooted in Islamophobia and anti-Arabism and hype-nationalism. Its ideology is Sharon's machismo and ferocious jingoism. It sees Hindus and Jews plus Christians as forming a strategic alliance against Islam and Confucianism addressing the American Jewish Committee in Washington. India's National Security Advisor, 
Rajesh Misra called for development of a U.S. Dash page 131. Israel-India triad that will have the political and moral authority to take bold decisions in combating terror. According to Bidwai, the growing Indo. Israel political military contacts are supplemented by coordination of their 8. Influential Hindu nationalist and Israeli lobbies in the U.S. India and Israel are both significant military powers, with nuclear weapons and delivery systems, and the emerging alliance system is another factor, contributing to WMD proliferation, terror, and disorder in the unstable belt and beyond. U.S.-Israel relations, origins and maturation it does not take much insight into world affairs to predict that the cauldron of animosities in the Middle East will continue to boil. Internal conflicts have been exacerbated as the industrial world shifted toward an oil-based economy from World War I, and the incomparable petroleum resources of the Middle East were discovered. After World War II, a high priority of U.S. policy was to ensure its control over a region of such great material wealth and strategic significance. In its day in the sun, Britain had controlled the region by delegating authority to clients, with British force in the background. In the terminology of the foreign office, local management was to be left to an Arab fusade of weak compliant rulers while Britain's absorption of these virtual colonies would be veiled by constitutional fictions, a device considered more cost-effective than direct rule. With variations, the device is familiar elsewhere. The population did not passively submit. Fortunately for imperial planners, air power was becoming available to control civilian populations, though some, like Winston Churchill, were enamoured of the possibilities of using poison gas to subdue recalcitrant Arabs, mainly Kurds and Afghans. In the interwar years, there were attempts to ban or limit war, but Britain made sure these would not interfere with imperial rule, setting a precedent for its successor in world control. Specifically, Britain undermined attempts to restrict the use of air power against civilians. The reasons were expressed succinctly by the distinguished statesman Lloyd George, who praised the British government for reserving the right to 9. Bomb niggers. Fundamental moral principles tend to have a long life. This one is no exception. The US took over the British framework but added another layer of control. Peripheral states, preferably non-Arab, that could serve as local cops on the beat, in the terminology of the Nixon administration. Police headquarters would dash page 132, of course remain in Washington, with a branch office in London. Turkey was a leading member of the club from the outset, joined by Iran in 1953, when a U.S. U.K. military coup restored the Shah overthrowing a conservative parliamentary government that was seeking to control its own resources. The U.S. has been concerned more with control than access. After World War II, North America was the world's major oil producer, though this position was not expected to last long. Later, a major exporter to the U.S. was Venezuela. Current projections of U.S intelligence are that the U.S. will continue to rely primarily on Atlantic Basin resources, those in the Western Hemisphere and West Africa, which are more stable and reliable than those of the Middle East. Ten bidders throughout the post-war period, that does not remove the perceived need to retain control. Control over the great material prize of the Gulf ensures that U.S.-U.K. energy corporations will be the main beneficiaries of enormous profits, the wealth 
recycles to the U.S. and British economies in many other ways as well, including military hardware, hence high-tech industry generally, construction projects, and treasury securities, the recognized stupendous strategic power of their region translates into a lever of world domination. All of this was understood clearly by those who planned the post-war world and retains its force. U.S. intelligence expects Gulf energy resources to become even more significant in the years ahead. COM 11 hence also the drive to maintain control whether the U.S. itself relies heavily on these resources or not. The global system of military bases from the Pacific to the Azores was designed in considerable measure for operations in the Gulf region. U.S. Counterinsurgency and subversion in Greece and Italy in the 1940s were in part motivated by concern over the free flow of Middle East oil to the West. By now, the basing system extends to the former Soviet satellites Bulgaria and Romania. Since the Carter years, the major U.S. intervention forces have been named at their Gulf. Until recently, the only fully reliable military base nearby was the British held island of Diego Garcia, from which the inhabitants were expelled. The U.S. still refuses them the right of return, overruling decisions of the British court semicolon 12. The issue is unknown in the U.S. Much like the case of Okinawa, the Afghan war left the U.S. with military bases in Afghanistan and Central Asia, helping to position U.S. corporations more favorably in the current phase of the great game to control Central Asian resources, and also to extend the encirclement of the far more important Persian Gulf. It had long been anticipated that one of Washington's goals in Iraq was to obtain military bases right in the heart of the Dash page 133. Oil producing regions, as reported at the war's end. 13. Other likely goals also moved into the public domain at the war's end. The two things that were never openly discussed, that never became part of their national conversation, were oil and money. Bob Herbert commented, those crucial topics were left to the major behind-the-scenes operators, many of whom are now cashing in. 14. U.S. relations with Israel largely developed within this general context. 15. In 1948, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were impressed with Israel's military prowess, describing Israel as second only to Turkey in military power in the region. They suggested that Israel might offer the U.S. means to gain strategic advantage in the Middle East to offset Britain's declining role. Ten years later, these considerations gained some concrete significance. The year 1958 was highly significant in world affairs. The Eisenhower administration identified three major crises, Indonesia, North Africa, and the Middle East. All involved oil producers and Islamic political forces, which were then secular. Eisenhower and Secretary of State Dulles stressed that there was no Russian involvement in any of these crises. The problem was the familiar devil, radical nationalism. In North Africa, the concern was the Algerian struggle for independence, which the U.S. wanted quickly settled. In Indonesia, the culprit was Sukarno, who was one of the leaders of the despised non-aligned movement, and was also allowing too much democracy. A popular-based party of poor peasants was gaining influence. In the Middle East, the villain was Nasser. Described as a new Hitler by panicked U.S. and British leaders, he too was a pillar of the non-aligned movement, and his influence, it was feared, might tempt others to pursue an independent course. Those fears appeared to be realized in 
1958 when a coup in Iraq, assumed to be Nasserite in origin, overthrew the British-backed government. Consequences reverberate to the present. The Iraqi coup led to intense US-UK discussions. Policymakers were concerned that Kuwait might seek independence and that even Saudi Arabia might succumb to the disease. The British economy was heavily reliant on profits from Kuwaiti oil production and investment. Britain decided to grant Kuwait nominal independence, though we must also accept the need, if things go wrong, ruthlessly to intervene. Whoever it is has caused the trouble, foreign. Secretary Selwyn Lloyd explained. The US adopted the same stand on forceful intervention with regard to the bigger prizes, Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf Emirates. Eisenhower sent military forces to Lebanon to block a perceived. Dash page 134. Nationalist threat therein to ensure control over pipelines. He reiterated his concern over the most strategically important area of the world and emphasized that loss of control would be far worse than the loss of China, regarded as the worst post-war catastrophe because of the strategic position and resources of the Middle East. 16. Another country of critical importance that might, it was feared, fall under. Nasserite influence was Jordan, then the regional base for British military power. Israel assisted in assuring British control. Washington planners recognized that Israel was the only regional power that had taken risks for the sake of relieving the situation in the area. A memorandum for the National Security Council advised that if we choose to combat radical Arab nationalism and to hold Persian Gulf foil by force if necessary. A logical corollary would be to support Israel as the only strong pro-West power left in the Near East, 17 along with their peripheral powers, Turkey and Iran. At the same time, in 1958, Israel-Turkey relations were established with a visit to Turkey by Prime Minister David Ben Gurion. By 2000, Ephraim and by rights, Israel's relations to Turkey were second only to the closeness of Israel-US ties. 18. In 1967 the US-Israeli alliance was firmly in place. Israel destroyed Nasser, thus protecting the Fusad in the Arabian Peninsula and also striking a powerful blow against the non-aligned movement. That was considered a major contribution to US power. There was also a significant effect within the U.S. ideological domain, an important topic that I will have to put aside. 19. Recall the three major crises of 1958. The threat of independent Arab nationalism in the Middle East was overcome by the 1967 war. The North African crisis ended with Algerian independence. 20 The crisis in Indonesia was resolved by a huge massacre, mainly of landless peasants, which the CIA described as one of the great mass murders of the 20th century, comparable to those of Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. This staggering mass slaughter, as the New York Times called it, was greeted with unrestrained euphoria in the West. It eliminated the mass-based political party of the poor and opened the doors wide to Western investors, as in the Middle East. Another pillar of the non-aligned movement was demolished. Somewhat be similar processes were underway in Latin America and, to a more limited extent, in India, the last major stronghold of non-alignment. Throughout, the U.S. role was significant, sometimes crucially so. The U.S. is a global power, like England before it. It is often misleading to focus on one region of the world, forgetting that global planning is in Washington, keeping nevertheless to the Middle East.
In 1970, Israel performed another. Dash page 135. Service by deterring possible Syrian intervention to protect Palestinians who were being massacred in Jordan. USA to Israel quadrupled. U.S. intelligence. Along with such influential figures concerned with the Middle East as Senator Henry Jackson described the tacit alliance of Israel around Saudi Arabia as a solid basis for U.S. power in the region, with Turkey taken for granted. In 1979 the Shah fell and the Israel-Turkey alliance became even more important as a regional base. The alliance welcomed a new member, replacing the Shah, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, which the Reagan administration removed. From the official list of terrorist states in 1982, so that the U.S. could freely provide the tyrant with aid. Israel's choices over the past 30 years have reduced its options considerably. On its present course, it has virtually no alternative to serving as a U.S. base in the region and complying with U.S. demands. The options were starkly. Illuminated in 1971, when President Anwar Sadat of Egypt offered Israel a full peace treaty in return for Israeli withdrawal from Egyptian territory, Sadat offered nothing to the Palestinians and omitted reference to the other occupied territories. In his memoirs, Yitzhak Rabin, then ambassador to the U.S., refers to the famous offer as a milestone on the path to peace, though it contained bad news as well, the condition that Israel withdraw from Egyptian territory, in accord with official U.S. policy and the basic diplomatic document, Security Council Resolution 242 of November 1967. Israel had a fateful choice, it could accept peace and integration into the region or insist on confrontation, hence inevitable dependency on the U.S. It chose the latter course, not on grounds of security but because of a commitment to expansion. That is clear in Israeli sources. General Haim Balev, a leading figure in the governing Labour Party, expressed the common understanding when he wrote in a Labour Party journal that we can have peace but I think if we continue to hold out we can obtain more. The more that was of primary interest at their time was the northeastern Sinai, from which the inhabitants were brutally expelled into the desert to make way for the establishment of the old Jewish city of Yamit. In 1972, General Eliza Wiseman, later president, added that a political Settlement without expansion would mean that Israel could not exist according to the scale, spirit, and quality she now embodies. The crucial question was how Washington would react. After internal debate, the government abandoned its official policy in favor of Kissinger's principle of stalemate, no diplomacy, only force. It should be recalled that this was a period of extreme triumphalism, later greatly regretted in Israel. The U.S. and Israel took Dash page 136. It for granted after 1967 that Arabs could pose no military threat. The Egyptian peace offer is not famous in the U.S., rather, unknown, a common fate of events that do not conform to doctrinal requirements. Sadat still hoped to gain U.S. acquiescence by expelling his Russian advisers and other moves. He also warned that Yamit means war. He was not taken seriously. In 1973 he did launch a war, which was a near disaster for Israel and also led to a nuclear alert in the U.S. At that point, Kissinger realized that Egypt could not simply be dismissed, and launched his shuttle diplomacy, which led finally to the Camp David settlement of 1978-79. At Camp David the U.S. and 
Israel accepted Sadat's 1971 offer, but on terms much less favorable from their point of view. By then the fate of the Palestinians had become an issue, and Sadat joined most of the rest of the world in insisting on their rights. These events are hailed as a U.S. diplomatic triumph. Jimmy Carter won their Nobel Peace Prize primarily for the culminating achievement. The entire process was, in reality, a diplomatic catastrophe. The U.S.-Israel rejection of a diplomacy led to a terrible war, great suffering, and a superpower confrontation that could have gotten out of hand. But one of the prerogatives of power is the ability to write history with confidence that there will be little challenge. The disaster therefore enters history as a grand triumph of the U.S. run peace process. Israel recognized at once that with the Arab deterrent removed, it could intensify its expansion into the occupied territories and attack its northern neighbor, as it proceeded to do in 1978 and 1982, continuing to occupy parts of Lebanon for almost 20 years. The 1982 invasion and its immediate aftermath left some 20,000 dead. According to Lebanese sources, the toll in the following years was about 25,000. The topic is of little concern in the West, on the principle that crimes for which we are responsible require no inquiry, let alone punishment or reparations. After many bombings and other provocations failed to elicit a pretext for their planned 1982 invasion. Israel finally seized upon the attempted assassination of its ambassador in London by the terrorist group headed by Abu Naidl, who had been condemned to death by the PLO and had been at war with it for years. Resort to this pretext was acceptable to articulate American opinion, which also had no problem with Israel's immediate response, an attack on the Sabra Shaitla. Palestinian refugee camps in Beirut, where 200 people were killed, according to reliable American observer. 21 UN attempts to halt the aggression were blocked by immediate U.S. vetoes. So matters continued through 18 bloody years of Israeli atrocities in Lebanon, rarely with even a thin pretext of self defense. 22 dash page 137. Chief of Staff Raphael, Rafael, Itan echoed the common understanding in Israel when he at once declared the 1982 invasion to be a success because it weakened the political status of the PLO and set back its struggle for a Palestinian state. Leading U.S. intellectuals also welcomed the political defeat of the PLO clearly recognizing that to be the goal of the war while anointing it. Just War, Michael Waltzer. 23 Most public commentary and media, however, preferred tales about unprovoked rocket attacks on innocent Israelis and similar fabrications, though by now the truth is sometimes recognized. New York Times Correspondent James Bennett writes that the goal of the 1982 invasion was to install a friendly regime and destroy Mr. Arafat's Palestinian Liberation Organization. That, the theory went, would help persuade Palestinians to accept Israeli rule in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. 24 To my knowledge, this is the first report in the American mainstream of what was well known in Israel and has been published in marginalized dissident circles in the U.S. for 20 years. It is also a textbook illustration of massive international terrorism, if not the more severe crime of aggression, tracing right back to Washington, which provided their requisite economic, military, and diplomatic support. Without such authorization and aid, Israel can do very little. There are many illusions about this in the Arab countries and elsewhere. Particularly for the victims, 
it is not wise to live with illusions. On the diplomatic front, by the mid 1970s, U.S. Israeli isolation increased as the Palestinian issue entered the international agenda. In 1976, the U.S. veto day resolution calling for a Palestinian state alongside Israel, incorporating the basic wording of UN Resolution 242 from 1967. From then to the present the US has blocked the possibility of a diplomatic settlement in the terms accepted by virtually the entire world, a two-state settlement on the international border, with minor and mutual adjustments, that was the principle of official, though not actual, U.S. policy until the Clinton administration formally abandoned their framework of international diplomacy, declaring U.N. resolutions obsolete and anachronistic. It is noteworthy that the U.S. stand is also opposed by most of their U.S. population. A large majority support the Saudi plan proposed in early 2002 and accepted by the Arab League which offered full recognition and integration of Israel into the region in exchange for withdrawal to the 1967 borders, yet another version of the long-standing international consensus that the U.S. has blocked. Large majorities also believe that the U.S. should equalize aid to Israel and the Palestinians under a negotiated settlement, and should cut aid to either party that refuses to negotiate, meaning, at the time of the poll, that it should cut. Dash page 138. Aid to Israel. But few understand what any of this implies, and almost nothing is reported about it. 25. After the first Gulf War, Washington felt that it was in a position to impose its own preferred solution. Although never fully elaborated, the 1991 version was to be more forthcoming than the administration position announced in December 1989, which endorsed without qualifications the Israeli coalition government. Shamir Perez plan stipulating that there can be no additional Palestinian state, Jordan already being a Palestinian state in their conception, and that the fate of the territories will be determined in accordance with the basic guidelines of the Israeli government. Washington convened the Madrid conference with Russian participation to offer a fig leaf of internationalism. But a problem arose at the conference. The Palestinian delegation was headed by Haydar Abd al Shafi, a conservative nationalist known for his integrity and one of the most respected Palestinian figures. The delegation refused to agree to continued Israeli settlement programs in the occupied territories, thus deadlocking the negotiations, because the US and Israel refused to agree to this condition, even to consider it seriously, recognizing that his public support was collapsing within the territories and the Palestinian diaspora, Yazir Arafat undercut the Palestinian delegation by secret negotiations with Israel, leading to the Oslo process, initiated officially with much pomp in September 1993 at the White House. The wording of the Oslo agreements made it clear that they were a mandate for continued Israeli settlement programs, as the Israeli leadership, Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres took no pains to conceal. For that reason, Abd al-Shafi refused to have anything to do with the official peace process. 26. So matters proceeded through the 1990s, as Israeli settlement and integration of the territories proceeded steadily, with full U.S. support. In 2000, the final year of Clinton's term, and Israeli Prime Minister Ed Barak's Settlement reached its highest peak since 1992, striking further blows at the possibility of a resolution of the conflict by peaceful diplomatic means. 
Camp David II and beyond, toward a permanent neocolonial dependency. U.S.-Israeli rejectionism runs through the Camp David negotiations of 2000. The conventional image is that Clinton and Barack made a magnanimous offer of unparalleled generosity, but the treacherous Palestinians turned it down, preferring violence. There is a simple way to evaluate these claims. Present A. Map of the territorial settlement proposed. No map has been found in U.S. media. Dash page 139. Or journals, apart from scholarly sources and the dissident literature. A look at. The maps reveals that the Clinton Barack offer virtually divided the West Bank into three cantons, effectively separated from one another by two salients consisting of expansive Jewish settlement and infrastructure developments. The three cantons have only limited access to East Jerusalem, the center of Palestinian commercial, cultural, and political life, and all are separated from Gaza. Admittedly, this would have been an improvement over the status quo, with Palestinians in the West Bank confined to more than 200 cantons, some a few square kilometers, and the situation in the Gaza Strip was in many ways worse. Shortly before joining the Barak government and becoming the chief negotiator at Camp David, Shlomo Ben-Ami, considered a div in the Israeli spectrum, published an academic study in which he outlined the goal of the Oslo peace process, to establish a neo-colonial dependency for the Palestinians, which will be permanent. 27. That is essentially what was offered at Camp David. In Israel, maps did appear in the mainstream press, and the proposals are commonly described as modelled on the South Africa's Bantustans of 40 years ago. Respected commentators report that the South African model was Considered very seriously in high military and political echelons in the 1970s and 1980s, and is the model today. 28 Israel also considered South Africa a valued ally, as did the US, through the Reagan years. After the failure of Camp David 2000, negotiations continued. They led to high level, but unofficial, meetings at Tarba, Egypt. In January 2001, these appeared to be making considerable progress, though the major territorial problems remained in less extreme forms. There is a careful record of the Taba negotiations in a report by the European Union Observer Miguel Moratinos. Approved by both sides. 29 The basic differences were narrowed but not entirely bridged. For the West Bank, there was agreement in principle on the long-standing international consensus honoring the internationally recognized border, with minor and mutual adjustments, now not so minor because of the U.S. backed Israeli settlement and infrastructure programs that, as noted, rapidly expanded as the Oslo process proceeded on its largely predictable course. Palestinian negotiators at Tarbo agreed to include within Israel the post-Oslo settlements established around the vastly expanded Jerusalem, but called for a one-to-one -one territorial swap with the support of some Israeli hawks, who welcomed the opportunity to transfer Israeli Arabs out of the country, thus relieving the much-feared demographic problem to many non-Jews in a Dash page 140. Jewish state. But the Israeli negotiators insisted on a two-to-one, or larger, swap. In their favor, with Palestinians offered a worthless area adjacent to the Sinai. Desert. The primary territorial issue remained the status of the Israeli town of Malajumim to the east of Jerusalem, and the infrastructure linking it to the expanded areas to be annexed to Israel, 
developed mostly in the 1990s with their clear intent of virtually bisecting the West Bank. These issues remained unresolved, along with some others, but there is good reason to accept a Kiva. Elder's conclusion that progress was real and promising, even if not formal. The negotiations were called off by Barak prior to the Israeli elections, and in the face of escalating violence were never resumed, so we cannot know where they might have led. The basic issues were reviewed by Hussein Nigger and Robert Malley, two well-informed commentators, in Foreign Affairs.30 they observed, accurately, that the outlines of a solution have basically been understood for some time now. A territorial divide on the international border with the one-to-one -one land swap. They write that the way to get to the solution has eluded all sides from the start, but while accurate, the statement is misleading. The way has been blocked for 25 years by the United States, and Israel continues to reject it even at their dovish extreme of the mainstream political spectrum, as the Moritinos report. Again documents. During the Bush two Sharon years, the prospects for a diplomatic solution have declined further. Israel has expanded its settlement programs with continued U.S. Backing. The Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem was finally able to obtain official maps indicating Israeli territorial intentions. 31 Israeli settlements now control 42% of the West Bank. The boundaries of Malajumim, for example, reach from the area of Greater Jerusalem almost to the isolated Palestinian town of Jericho a salient that largely isolates the southern region of the West Bank. Another salient to the north also remains, partially separating their northern from the central sectors. The result is a harsh version of the three canton arrangement for the West Bank, all virtually separated from a small part of East Jerusalem, and of course from Gaza, however its fate is determined. The situation in 2003 is described in the primary U.S. scholarly source on the settlements by its editor, Jeffrey Ronson, after a visit to the southern area. 32 in virtually every Israeli settlement, colonization efforts are proceeding apace, leading to revolutionary changes in patterns of transportation and access aimed at consolidating Israel's ability to secure a permanent hold over these lands. Integrated within the much expanded Israel. In contrast, the dynamic for Dash page 141. Palestinians is just the opposite, an ever-increasing network of barricades, obstacles, patrol roads, and prohibitions that isolate them from settlements, from each other and from places of work, compromising their ability to lead normal lives and impoverishing an entire national community. As for Bush administration plans in mid-2003, there are two sources, rhetoric and action. At the rhetorical level, one reads of Bush's vision of a Palestinian state and the US-inspired road map. In the real world, the Bush administration repeatedly blocked public release of the road map of the Quartet, EU, UN, Russia, US, much to the annoyance of the other members. The vision was left vague, and remained so after the road map was finally released, accompanied by Bush's modest announcement that the road map represents a starting point toward achieving the vision of two states. That I set out in June 24, 2002 inches. Namely, a pale and indistinct version of the vision that had been common coin for over a quarter century, but blocked by the US.33. The first steps on the road map are explicit. Palestinians must immediately terminate resistance to the occupation, 
including attacks on Israeli soldiers in the occupied territories, and Israel must declare its commitment to the two-state vision. Expressed by President Bush, its nature unclear, as comprehensive security performance moves forward, IDF withdraws progressively from May areas occupied since September 28, 2000, and the two sides restore the status quo that existed at that time. Satisfactory performance will be determined by Israel and Washington. The status quo that is to be restored leaves Palestinians confined to hundreds of cantons, surrounded by the settlements and infrastructure constructed by the U.S.-backed Israeli military occupation. The future of these settlements remains unclear. Israel immediately dismantles settlement outposts erected since March 2001 something on which all but the ultra-right in Israel agree, and at some time left unspecified Israel freezes all settlement activity, including natural growth of settlements. Until that time, the settlements can continue to expand. If the time for freezing ever comes, the banter stands style. Arrangements instituted through the 1990s in the context of the U.S.-Israel peace process, continued under the road map, will presumably be well established. Later still there is to be implementation of prior agreements to enhance maximum territorial contiguity for the Palestinian state, including further action on settlements. The further action remains unspecified. There are no prior agreements that yield meaningful territorial contiguity. The only serious proposals that have been made are not on the agenda. Whatever Bush's two state vision may be, it is apparently not the two state vision supported by Dash page 142. Virtually the entire world that the US has blocked since the mid 1970s, nor the Saudi plan ratified by the Arab League and supported by a majority of their American population, nor the solution whose outlines have basically been understood for some time now described by Iga and Mali. There is no hint of any of these ideas. 34. Furthermore, although there is immediate and violent enforcement of the roadmap's conditions on the Palestinians, there is no enforcement of conditions on the U.S.-funded Israeli settlement and development programs. There is a rich record about all of this, and no reason to expect any significant change. Through the political road map remains vague with regard to Israel's responsibilities, other demands are quite specific. The huge U.S. subsidy to Israel is, for the first time, conditioned on Israel's performance, not on its implementation of the terms of the road map but on an economic plan that will slash public sector jobs and wages and lower taxes, measures that have been dubbed an economic road map. The plan is described by Israel's leading newspaper as a new theory, according to which the US openly intervenes in forcing a neoliberal order an Israel a theory that is welcome to the Israeli business sector but led immediately to a strike of 700,000 workers. 35. Also quite specific are operations to create facts on the ground while talk proceeds in the traditional manner. Notable among them is the construction of the separation wall that incorporates parts of the West Bank within Israel. The justification offered for the barrier is security, for Israelis, not Palestinians, whose security problems are far more grave. A barrier with a land swap would provide no less security. The most security would be given by a wall a few miles inside Israel to allow the IDF to patrol fully on both sides. But such proposals would 
not incorporate Palestinian land within Israel, and would disrupt the lives of Israelis rather than Palestinians, and are therefore unthinkable. World Bank Sponsored reports conclude that the wall will leave almost 100,000 Palestinians on the Israeli side, along with some of the richest agricultural land in the West. Bank the wall also places a good part of the vitally important West Bank aquifer under Israeli control. One West Bank town, Kalkia, is already virtually surrounded by the wall, cut off from its lands, 30% of its water supplies. And whatever territories will be assigned someday to the viable Palestinian state with territorial contiguity. More than half of Kalkalia's agricultural lands were reported to have been confiscated to be annexed to Israel, with their munificent offer of one-time compensation equal to the market price of one year's harvest. 36. Dash page 143. Immediately after Colin Powell went to Israel to meet with Prime Minister Sharon and discuss the road map. Sharon informed the press that as the wall proceeded south of Kalkia, it would sweep well to the east to enclose the Israeli settlements of Ariel and Emmanuel, thereby partially separating the northern Palestinian enclave from the central one by a salient of Israeli settlements and infrastructure, as in the Clinton Barra Camp David plan. There can be little doubt that the second and more important of the Clinton Barak extensions of Israeli territory, dividing the central enclave from the southern one, will also be incorporated, de facto, within Israel, in some manner. There is also little reason to doubt that Israeli communities that remain outside the wall will retain their current status as, effectively, parts of Israel linked to it by large-scale infrastructure, protected by the IDF, and free to expand within their allotted territory until some order to the contrary comes from above. The very well-informed Harvard University scholar Sarah Roy, relying on internal sources, writes that the World Bank estimates that some 232,000 people Living in 72 communities will be affected by the first northern phase of the wall's construction, with 140,000 living on the eastern side of the wall but, in effect, encircled within its winding path, and that completion could isolate as many as 250, 300, 000 Palestinians while annexing as much as 10% of the West Bank to Israel. She suggests further that the wall's design may be aimed at carving out and encircling the 42% or less of the West Bank that Sharon has said he is prepared to cede to a Palestinian state. If so, Sharon may have in mind something like the plan he proposed in 1992, now recognizing that the political spectrum has shifted so far toward the extremist nationalist pole that what seemed audacious then may be portrayed as a dramatic concession today. 37. The facts on the ground, Israeli journalist Amira Hass comments, are determining and will continue to determine, the area where the road map will be applied, the area where the entity known as the Palestinian state will be established. A visit to their places, where the Public Works Commission, the Defense Ministry, Housing Ministry and the IDF bulldozers are busy at work, makes it possible to see why it's easy for Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to talk about a Palestinian state, the massive construction in Jerusalem and its environs, from Bethlehem to Ramla, and the Dead Sea to Modin, has already ruled out any Palestinian urban, industrial or cultural development worthy of their name in the area of East Jerusalem, the southern enclave of the West Bank. 
from Hebron to Bethlehem, will be cut off from the central enclave of the Rimla area by an ocean of manicured Israeli settlements, tunnel roads and Dash page 144 Highways The northern enclave, from Jenin to Nablus, will be cut off from there center by the massive settlement block of area Lilai Shiloh.38. As for the settlement freeze, when Sharon persuaded his extremist cabinet to accept the road map he explained that there is no restriction here, and you can build for your children and grandchildren, and I hope for your great grandchildren as well. 39. At the rhetorical level, the road map appears to offer more to the Palestinians than the Oslo process. It uses such terms as Palestinian state, end to the occupation, freeze on all settlement activity, etc., all phrases missing from their Oslo protocols. But the appearance is deceptive. Apart from extremist elements, Israel and its sponsor have no intention of taking over territories beyond useful and desirable limits or of having Israel administer the bulk of the Palestinian population. Construction of facts on the ground has proceeded sufficiently to allow the free use of terms that might previously have impeded plans that ha been implemented for the past decade and are now being established more firmly. Apart from the rhetoric about visions, there is a more significant source of information, actions. Keeping just to a few illustrations, in December 2000 there, Bush administration caused some consternation abroad when it vetoed a Security Council resolution, advanced by the European Union, calling for implementation of Washington's Mitchell plan and efforts to reduce violence by the dispatch of international monitors, to which Israel strongly objects. Their presence is likely to reduce Palestinian violence but would also impede Israeli repression and terror. Ten days before the veto, Washington boycotted a conference in Geneva of the High contracting parties of the Geneva Conventions called to review their situation in the occupied territories. The boycott yielded the usual double veto. The decisions are blocked, and the events are barely reported and erased from history. The conference reaffirmed the applicability of the Fourth Geneva Convention to the occupied territories, so that many U.S. Israeli actions there are war crimes under U.S. law. The conference again condemned U.S.-funded Israeli settlements and the practice of willful killing, torture, and lawful deportation. Willful depriving of the rights of fair and regular trial, extensive destruction and appropriation of property, carried out unlawfully and wantonly. 40. The Fourth Geneva Convention instituted to criminalize formally the crimes of the Nazis in occupied Europe, is a core principle of international humanitarian law. Its applicability to the Israeli-occupied territories has repeatedly been dash page 145 affirmed, among other occasions, by UN Ambassador George Bush, September 1971, and by Security Council resolutions. These include Resolution 465, 1980, adopted unanimously, which condemned U.S.-backed Israeli practices as flagrant violations of the Convention, and Resolution 1322, October 2000, 14 U.S. Obstaining, which called on Israel to abide scrupulously by its responsibilities under the Fourth Geneva Convention. As high contracting parties, the U.S. and the European powers are obligated by solemn treaty to apprehend and prosecute those responsible for such crimes, including their own leadership. By continuing to reject that duty, they are enhancing terror to borrow Bush IP's words. Condemning Palestinians 
the U.S. stance has shifted over the years from endorsement of the applicability of the conventions to the occupied territories to abstention during the Clinton years and finally to undermining the Munda. Bush too. The Bush administration signaled its tacit endorsement of violent repression in the occupied territories in other ways as well. Thus, while Ariel Sharon was Conducting his brutal offensive in the West Bank in April 2002, Colin Powell was sent to bring peace. He meandered through the Mediterranean, arriving in Israel just as the defenders of Jenin were running out of food and ammunition. One may presume that State Department intelligence was able to work out that calculation. A Pentagon official stated the obvious. Powell's itinerary, he said, was designed to give Sharon some more time. A State Department official added that the Israelis are not listening so much to what we say, but are watching what we do, and what we're doing is giving them more time to withdraw. 41. When they finished their work, leveling the refugee camp at Jenin, smashing much of the old city of Nablus and destroying the institutional and cultural infrastructure of Palestinian life in Rimla with the viciousness that has been IDF practice for many years. In December 2002, the UN General Assembly reiterated the near-universal opposition to Israel's effective annexation of Jerusalem, in defiance of security. Council resolutions going back to 1968 passed with U.S. support. For the first time, the U.S. voted against the resolution, formally reversing the long-standing official U.S. position on the status of Jerusalem. The U.S. was joined by Israel, several Pacific Island dependencies, and Costa Rica. If intended seriously, this reversal virtually eliminates the possibility of a political settlement. The Bush administration also continued to sustain violence by voting against a resolution calling for international efforts to halt the deteriorating situation between Israel and the Palestinians, reverse all measures taken on the ground since the latest. Dash page 146. Violence began in September 2000 and push for a peace agreement passed 160. 4. The U.S. joined by Israel, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. Following the conventional pattern, none of this seems to have been reported in the U.S. 42. Bush also declared the Arcturist Sharon a man of peace and demanded that Arafat be replaced by a prime minister who will meet U.S. Israeli demands. Though unlike Mr. Arafat, he does not have a popular following. 43. All of this provides further illustration of the president's vision of democracy. In February 2003, Bush delivered what the New York Times called his first significant remarks about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in eight months, in a speech to the far-right American Enterprise Institute. The speech was mostly vacuous. But it did indeed contain one significant remark. Bush declared obliquely that Israel could continue its programs of settlement and development in the occupied territories. The form of his endorsement was the statement that, as progress is made toward peace, settlement activity in the occupied territories must end, implying that it can continue until the U.S. determines unilaterally, as always, that progress has been made. 44 again, Bush's sole significant remark reverses official government policy. Previously the settlement programs had been considered illegal, or at least unhelpful. Now they are implicitly authorized. In defense of the administration, one may argue that official doctrine has been brought into conformity with near-invariant practice. 
prevailing values are often expressed implicitly, as on the first anniversary of 9-11, when the President took the occasion to provide $200 million in supplemental funding for the rich country of Israel while rejecting $130 million for emergency supplemental aid to Afghanistan.45 and not only in the US. Thus, former UK Foreign Secretary Douglas, Lord, Heard wrote that two unsolved problems torment the Middle East, the danger from Saddam Hussein and their insecurity of Israel. 46 The insecurity of Palestinians in the 36th year of military occupation is not an unsolved problem, in fact, it remains unmentioned. The steps that undermine the prospects for a peaceful diplomatic settlement are continually justified as a response to Palestinian terror, which did indeed escalate, including terrible crimes against Israeli civilians during the al aqsa Intifada that broke out at the end of September 2000. The Intifada also brought into the open significant changes that had been taking place within Israel. The authority of the Israeli military by then reached such levels that military correspondent Ben Kaspert described the country as not a state with an army, but an army with a state. 47. Dash page 147. Kaspert's analysis is basically confirmed and deepened historically by another prominent military correspondent, Riv Bedazzo, reviewing Israel's culture of power and consistent choice of the military option over peaceful means. Since its founding, in his discussion of a book by military historian Moti Golani, Predazzo writes that Golani is, of course, correct in his bold denial of the sacrosanct Israeli ethos according to which Israel has always aspired to peace, whereas its neighbors have consistently refused to tread the path of peace, choosing the path of war instead. The facts are sharply different, both agree. One prime reason is the institutionalization of power and its total transfer to the responsibility of the political and military establishments. The military command intervenes in political diplomatic debate, sometimes by threat of force, effectively formulating policy to an extent unknown in any other democratic society. Guided by this military culture, Israel's political military leadership uses fear-mongering tactics in security issues, generating anxiety in order to mobilize Israeli society and to deflect the public scares from domestic problems, such as a deteriorating economic situation or a growing unemployment rate, the formula familiar enough elsewhere, including there. U.S was established by Israel's founding father David Ben-Gurion in the earliest days of the state, and fear-mongering would be used in the following decades to the present. Author and reviewer join other Israeli commentators in warning of the serious danger of the formation of a consensus, according to which, in Israel's situation, democratic considerations are a luxury, with signs of fascism. 48. Kaspet's observations were motivated by the utter contempt shown by the military command for the orders of the civilian government in the early months of the Intifada, a stance that is particularly noteworthy since the Prime Minister was a former chief of staff and other civilian officials were also from the upper military echelons. Like other powerful military forces facing largely defenseless opponents, the IDF instantly resorted to extreme violence. When the head of military intelligence requested an inquiry into how many bullets the IDF fired from the start of the hostilities, he and other generals were shocked to learn that. In the first few days of the Intifada, the IDF fired a million bullets and other projectiles, 
a bullet for each child, one officer of the high command, commented with disgust. Military sources confirmed a report that in one incident, a single shot fired in the air to illustrate the reality to a European observer evoked two solid hours of intense fire from Israeli troops and tanks. According to IDF accounting, the ratio of Palestinian to Israeli dead was dash page 148. Almost 20 to 1 in the first month of the Intifada, 75 Palestinians. Four Israelis, in areas under military occupation, with resistance scarcely going. Beyond stone throwing, the army's force of huge, U.S. provided bulldozers was also called into action to destroy dwellings, fields, olive groves, and forests with utter abandon following policies that have made Israel synonymous with bulldozer. One correspondent wrote with dismay, reversing founding ideals about making the desert bloom. 49. From the outset Israel used U.S. military helicopters to attack civilian targets, killing and wounding dozens of people. Clinton responded instantly with their largest deal in a decade for military helicopters, there were no constraints on use. The Pentagon informed journalists. The facts, well known at once, were unreported in the U.S. Israel was breaking no new ground. U.S. forces in the Gulf War in 1991 enjoyed such overwhelming military superiority that troops could enter Iraq behind Plows mounted on tanks and earth movers, which bulldozed live Iraqi soldiers. Into trenches in the desert, an unprecedented tactic, Patrick Sloyan reported. Not a single American was killed during the attack that made an Iraqi body. Count impossible. The victims were mostly Shiite and Kurdish peasant. Conscripts, it appears hapless victims of Saddam Hussein hiding in holes in the sand or fleeing for their lives. The report elicited little interest or comment. 50. Such slaughters are not only routine when there is an overwhelming disparity of force, but are often lauded by the perpetrators. To select an illustration concerning the non-Muslim member of the Axis of Evil, it is unlikely that North Koreans have forgotten the object lesson in their power to all the communists in the world and especially to the communists in North Korea that was delivered in May 1953, a month before the armistice, and reported enthusiastically in a U.S. Air Force study. There were no targets left in the flattened country, so U.S. Bombers were dispatched to destroy irrigation dams furnishing 75% of the controlled rice supply for North Korea's rice production. The Westerner can little conceive the awesome meaning which the loss of this staple commodity has. For the Asian, starvation and slow death, the official account continues. Recounting the kinds of crimes that led to death sentences at Nuremberg.511. May wonder whether such memories are in the background as the desperate. North Korean leadership plays nuclear chicken. It is important to be aware of how routine these practices are, hence how likely they are to recur unless inhibited from within the powerful states. We can observe with horror the ruins of Grozny, and if historical memory is allowed, can. Dash page 149 recalled the devastation left by U.S. saturation bombing in Indochina. Revenge knows few limits when the privileged and powerful are subjected to the kind of terror they regularly meet out to their victims. To take an example from earlier years, when British citizens were murdered in the course of a rebellion in occupied India 150 years ago, the Indian mutiny in imperial parlance Britain's reaction was ferocious. It was a ghastly and horrible picture showing man at his worst, 
Nehru wrote from his prison cell during World War II, citing British and Indian sources, the latter banned under the Raj, a current scholarly. History records the common practice of wanton attacks on passive villagers and unarmed Indians, even faithful domestic servants, brutal murder of captured mutineers, entire villages put to the torch for the crime of proximity to the site of real or alleged Indian atrocities, as a terrible racial ferocity erupted and inspired British vengeance. Another describes how tens of thousands of soldiers and village guerrillas were hanged, shot, or blown from guns, leading to a significant drop in population in several regions. The tone is illustrated by the advice in May 1857 by John Nicholson, the hero of Delhi, an upright man, and professed Christian. According to his contemporary admirers, let us propose a bill for the flaying alive, impalement, or burning of the murderers of the women and children at Delhi. The idea of simply hanging the perpetrators of such atrocities is maddening. The atrocities to which he referred included those revealed in detailed but imaginary accounts of other righteous Christians who carried out unspeakable atrocities in 52. Revenge To illustrate the impact of the sobering lessons of World War II in Kenya in the 1950s some 150,000 people died in the course of Britain's repression of a colonial revolt, a campaign conducted with hideous terror and atrocities but, as always, guided by the highest ideals. The British governor had explained to the people of Kenya in 1946 that Britain controls their land and resources as of right. The product of historical events which reflect the greatest glory of our fathers and grandfathers. If the greater part of the wealth of the country is at present in our hands, that is because this land we have made is our land by right, by right of achievement, and Africans will simply have to learn to live in a world which we have made, under the humanitarian impulses of the late 19th and their 20th century. 53. History is replete with precedents for what we see before our eyes, day after day, through the stakes grow more awesome along with the means of destruction available. Dash page 150. Israeli commanders rely not only on the standard military doctrine of those who have overwhelming force at their command but also on their own experience. When they ordered massive violence to crush Palestinians with cruel collective punishment in October 2000, they probably did not anticipate that the tactics would arouse the victims to bloody revenge. 54. That did not happen when Prime Minister Rabin sent his troops to crush the population of their territories by breaking bones, beatings, torture and humiliation during the first intifada a decade earlier. Then the tactics largely worked, as they had in their past. 55. In December 1982, after an outburst of settler and IDF terror and atrocities in the territories that shocked even Israeli hawks, a prominent Israeli academic, Specialist on military affairs warned of the dangers to Israeli society when three quarters of a million young people who have served in the IDF know that their task of the army is not only to defend the state in the battlefield against a foreign army, but to demolish the rights of innocent people just because they are Arabishim living in territories that God promised to us. The essential principle had been formulated in the early years of the occupation by Moshe Dayan, Israel, should tell the Palestinians in the territories that we have no solution, you shall continue to live like dogs, and whoever wishes may leave, and we will see where this process leads. 
56, but the Palestinians remain Samaritan, who endured but scarcely retaliated. The Second Intifada was different. This time the orders to crush Palestinians relentlessly and teach them not to raise their heads escalated the cycle of violence, spilling into Israel itself, which had lost the substantial immunity to retaliation from within the territories that had prevailed for more than three decades of military occupation. Echoing the concerns of twenty years earlier, an editorial in Israel's leading daily concluded that two and a half years of intense fighting against Palestinian terrorism have turned the Israel Defense Forces into an obdurate and callous army, focused on its mission out of an indifference to the consequences of its actions. The IDF, which brought up generations of soldiers on the myth of purity of arms and educated its commanders with the idea of the moral, deliberating soldier, who takes tough decisions, while thinking of humane considerations, is turning into a killing machine whose efficiency is awe-inspiring, yet shocking. 57. As the official ratio of Palestinians to Israelis killed moved from 20 to 1, to close to 3 to 1, attitudes in the U.S. changed from inattention to atrocities, or support for them to extreme outrage at the atrocities directed at innocent U.S. Dash page 151. Clients. These were indeed outrageous. The selective vision, however, speaks for itself, not least because of its deep routes in the culture and history of conquerors. Dash page 152. Chapter 8. Terrorism and Justice. Some Useful Truisms. On a highly controversial topic like the one we turn to now, perhaps it is a good idea to begin with a few simple truths. The first is that actions are evaluated in terms of the range of likely consequences. A second is the principle of universality. We apply to ourselves the same standards we apply to others, if not more stringent ones, apart from being the merest truisms, these principles are also the foundation of just war theory, at least any version of it that deserves to be taken seriously. The truisms raise an empirical question, are they accepted? Investigation will reveal, I believe, that they are rejected almost without exception. The first truism may merit a word of elaboration. The actual consequences of an action may be highly significant, but they do not bear on the moral evaluation of the action. No one celebrates Khrushchev's success in placing nuclear missiles in Cuba because it did not lead to nuclear war, or condemns the fear mongers who warned of the threat. Nor do we applaud North Korea's dear leader for developing nuclear weapons and providing missile technology to Pakistan, or denounce those who warn of possible consequences because they haven't taken place. An apologist for state violence who took such positions would be regarded as a moral monster or lunatic. That's obvious, until it comes time to apply the same criteria to ourselves. Then the stance of the lunatic and moral monster is taken to be highly honorable, indeed obligatory and adherence to the truisms is condemned with horror. Let us, nevertheless, accept the truisms for what they are, truisms, and then think about a few crucial current cases to which they apply. Truisms and terror. Take 9-11. It is widely argued that the terrorist attacks changed everything dramatically as the world entered a new and frightening age of terror the title. 1. Of a collection of academic essays by Yale University scholars and others. It is. Dash page 153. Also widely held that the term terror is very hard to define. We might ask why the concept of terror should be considered particularly 
obscure. There are official U.S. government definitions that fall well within their range of clarity of other usages that are regarded as unproblematic. A U.S. Army manual defined terrorism as the calculated use of violence or threat of violence to attain goals that are political, religious, or ideological in nature through intimidation, coercion, or instilling fear. The official U.S. code given more elaborate definition, essentially along the same lines. The British government's definition is similar. Terrorism is the use or threat of action which is violent, damaging or disrupting, and is intended to influence the government or intimidate the public and is for the purpose of advancing a political, religious, or two ideological cause. These definitions seem fairly clear. They are close enough to ordinary usage and are considered appropriate when discussing the terrorism of enemies. The official US definitions are the ones I have been using in writing about their topics since the Reagan administration came into office in 1981, declaring that a War on terror would be a centerpiece of its foreign policy. The reliance on these definitions is particularly appropriate for our purposes because they were formulated when the first war on terror was declared. But almost no one uses them, and they have been rescinded, replaced by nothing sensible. The reasons do not seem obscure. The official definitions of terrorism are virtually the same as. The definitions of counter-threat, sometimes called low-intensity conflict, or counter-insurgency. But counter is official U.S. policy, and it plainly will. 3. Not due to say that the U.S. is officially committed to terrorism. The U.S. is by no means alone in this practice. It is traditional for states to call their own terrorism counter even the worst mass murderers the Nazis. For example, in occupied Europe they claim to be defending the population and legitimate governments from the partisans, terrorists supported from abroad. That was not entirely false, even the most egregious propaganda rarely is. The partisans were undoubtedly directed from London, and they did engage in terror. The U.S. military had some appreciation of the Nazi perspective. Its counterinsurgency doctrine was modeled in Nazi manuals, which were for analyzed sympathetically with the assistance of Wehrmacht officers. It is this common practice that allows from the conventional thesis that terror is a weapon of the weak. That is true, by definition, if terror is restricted to their terrorism. If the doctrinal requirement is lifted, however, we find that, like most weapons, terror is primarily a weapon of the powerful. Dash page 154. Another problem with the official definitions of terror is that it follows from them that the U.S. is a leading terrorist state. That much is hardly controversial, at least among those who believe that we should pay some attention to such institutions as the International Court of Justice or the UN Security Council, or mainstream scholarship, as the examples of Nicaragua and Cuba unequivocally reveal that that conclusion won't do either. So we are left with no sensible definition of terrorism unless we decide to break ranks and use the official definitions that have been abandoned because of their unacceptable consequences. The official definitions do not answer every question precisely. They do not, for example, draw a sharp boundary between international terrorism and aggression or between terror and resistance. These issues have arisen in interesting ways which have direct bearing on the re-declared war on terror and on today's headlines. Take the distinction between terror and resistance. 
One question that arises is the legitimacy of actions to realize the right to self-determination, freedom, and independence, as derived from the Charter of the United Nations of People, forcibly deprived of that right, particularly peoples under colonial and racist regimes and foreign occupation. Do such actions fall under terror or resistance? The quoted words are from the most forceful denunciation of the crime of terrorism by the UN General Assembly, which stated further that nothing in the present resolution could in any way prejudice the right so defined. The resolution was adopted in December 1987, just as officially recognized. International terrorism reached its peak. It is obviously important. The vote was 5. 153 to 2, with a single abstention, Honduras, hence even more important. The two countries that voted against the resolution were the usual ones. Their reason, they explained at the UN session, was the paragraph just quoted. The phrase colonial and racist regimes was understood to refer to their ally, apartheid South Africa. Evidently the US and Israel could not condone resistance to the apartheid regime, particularly when it was led by Mandela's African National Congress, one of the world's more notorious terrorist groups, as Washington determined at the time. The other phrase, foreign occupation, was understood to refer to Israel's military occupation, then in its twentieth year. Evidently, resistance could not be condoned in that case either. The US and Israel were alone in the world in denying that such actions can be legitimate resistance, and declaring them to be terrorism. The US-Israeli stand extends beyond the occupied territories. Thus the US and Israel regard Dash page 155. Hezbollah, for example, as one of the leading terrorist organizations in the world, not because of its terrorist acts, which are real, but because it was formed to resist the Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon, and succeeded in driving out the invaders after two decades of defiance of Security Council orders to withdraw. The U.S. even goes so far as to call people terrorists if they resist. 6. Direct U.S. aggression, the South Vietnamese, for example, or recently, the Iraqis. The public knows nothing about the major U.N. condemnation of what Reagan called the evil scourge of terrorism and its fate, by virtue of the usual double veto. To learn about such matters one has to wander into forbidden territory, the historical and documentary record, or marginalized critical literature. Despite the unclarities, and the sharp divide between the US, Israel and their world, the official US definitions of terror seem fairly adequate to the purposes at hand. Let us turn to the belief that 9-11 signaled a sharp change in the course of history. That seems questionable. Nonetheless, something dramatically new and different did happen on that terrible day. The target was not Cuba, or Nicaragua, or Lebanon, or Chechnya, or one of the other traditional victims of international terrorism, but a state with enormous power to shape the future. For the first time, an attack on the rich and powerful countries succeeded on a scale that is, regrettably, not unfamiliar in their traditional domains. Alongside horror at their crime against humanity and sympathy for the victims, commentators outside their ranks of Western privilege often responded to the 9-11 atrocities with a welcome to the club, particularly in Latin America where it is not so easy to forget the plague of violence and repression that swept through the region from the early 1960s, or its roots. The plague can in part be traced to a decision by the Kennedy administration 
in 1962 to change the mission of the Latin American military effectively from hemispheric defense to internal security. The effect was a shift from toleration of the rapacity and cruelty of the Latin American military to direct complicity in their crimes to support for the methods of Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads, in the words of Charles Magling, who led U.S. 7. Counterinsurgency and internal defense planning from 1961 to 1966. The perception of the victims is similar. To take one case of unusual current significance, the highly respected president of the Colombian Permanent Committee for Human Rights, Alfredo Vasquez Carrizosa, writes that there. Kennedy administration took great pains to transform our regular armies into counterinsurgency brigades, accepting the new strategy of the death squads. Dash page 156. Ushering in what is known in Latin America as the National Security Doctrine. Dot not defense against an external enemy, but a way to make the military establishment the masters of the game, with the right to combat the internal enemy, it is the right to fight and to exterminate social workers, trade unionists, men and women who are not supportive of the establishment, and who are assumed to be communist extremists. And this could mean anyone. 8. Including human rights activists such as myself. The great pains to which he refers coincided with the fateful 1962 decision. In that year, Kennedy sent a special forces mission to Colombia, led by General William Yarborough. Yarborough advised paramilitary, sabotage and slash or terrorist activities against known communist proponents to be employed now. Dot. I if we have such an apparatus in place. We because there is no need to. 9. Prevaricate in secret communications. In counterinsurgency doctrine, the phrase known communist proponents extends to the categories of assumed communist extremists that Vasquez Carrizosa enumerates, a fact well known to Latin Americans, just as they know that the primary victims are the poor and oppressed who are daring to raise their heads. The national security doctrine reached Central America in the 1980s. L. Salvador became the leading recipient of U.S. military aid as state terror reached its awful peak, when Congress hampered direct military aid and training by imposing human rights conditions, as in Guatemala after massive government atrocities surrogates undertook the task. The victims do not easily forget, though among the powerful, these crimes are subject to the standard ritual avoidance of unacceptable facts. Hardly a day passes without examples. Thus, a front-page story in the national press warns that the threat of Al-Qaeda is increasing, as it is turning from targets that are well protected to so-called soft targets. 10. The story should at once recall Washington's official instructions to its proxy forces to attack soft targets in Nicaragua immediately after it was ordered by the highest international authorities to terminate its terrorist war and the reaction to these orders. Whether attacking soft targets is right or wrong, terrorism or a noble cause depends on who is the agent. The practice is routine and unproblematic once. Moral truisms have been deemed irrelevant and unwanted facts efficiently disappeared. The ART of disappearing unwanted facts. One contributor to the Yale volume, Charles Hill, observed that 9-11 opened there. Dash page 157. Second War on Terror, the first having been declared by the Reagan administration 20 years earlier, a rare recognition of reality. 
and we won. The First War, Hill reports triumphantly, through the terrorist monster was only wounded, not slain. Eleven, how we won is someone else's department, the Jesuit. Intellectuals in Central America, the School of the Americas, Truth Commissions. Serious scholarship, activist and solidarity literature, and the memories of the survivors. We can learn a good deal about the current war on terror by inquiring into their first phase, and how it is now portrayed. One leading academic specialist describes the 1980s as the decade of state terrorism, of persistent state involvement, or sponsorship, of terrorism, especially by Libya and Iran, the U.S. Merely responded with a proactive stance toward terrorism. Others recommend the methods by which we won, the operations for which the U.S. was condemned by the World Court and Security Council, absent the veto, a, a. model for Nicaragua like support for the Taliban's adversaries. A prominent historian of the subject, David Rapaport, finds deep roots for the terrorism of Osama bin Laden, in South Vietnam, where the effectiveness of Viet Cong terror against the American Goliath armed with modern technology kindled hopes that the Western heartland was vulnerable to 12. The villainy of the terrorists attacking us everywhere is awesome indeed. Keeping to convention, these analyzers portray the U.S. as a benign victim. Defending itself from the terror of others, the Vietnamese, in South Vietnam, the Nicaraguans, in Nicaragua, Libyans and Iranians, if they ever suffered a slight at U.S. hands, it passes unnoticed, and other anti-American forces worldwide. If not everyone in the world shares that perception of history, then they too are anti-American and can be safely dismissed. As discussed earlier, the plague of U.S.-backed state terror that spread through Latin America in the 1960s peaked in Central America in the 1980s, as Reagan's war on terror took its deadly toll. Central America was one prime focus of that onslaught. The other was the Mideast-slash-Mediterranean region. Here, too, the Contrast between what actually happened and what is portrayed is dramatic and revealing. In this region, the worst single atrocity during the 1980s was the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, which, like the murderous and destructive Rabin Barra's invasions of 1993 and 1996, has little pretense of self-defense. In the light of Crucial Reagan Clinton support. These operations add to Washington's record of state supported international terrorism. The U.S. was directly involved in many other acts of terror in the region. Dash page 158. Including the three candidates for the prize of most extreme terrorist atrocity of 1985 when terrorism in that region was selected by editors as the lead story of the year. 1. The car bomb outside a mosque in Beirut that killed 80 people, mostly women and girls, and wounded 250 others, time to explode as people were leaving and traced back to the CIA and British intelligence. 2. Shiman Perez's bombing of Tunis, killing 75 people. Palestinians and Tunisians. Expedited by the US and praised by Secretary of State Schultz, then unanimously condemned by the UN Security Council as an act of armed aggression, US. Obstaining, and, 3. Perez's iron fist operations directed against what the Israeli High Command called terrorist villages in occupied Lebanon, reaching new depths of calculated brutality and arbitrary murder in the words of a Western diplomat familiar with the area, amply supported by direct coverage, total 
casualties and known in accord with the usual conventions. All these atrocities fall within the category of state-supported international terrorism, if not the more severe war crime of aggression. This accounting excludes many other atrocities, such as the regular kidnappings and killings on the high seas by Israeli naval forces attacking ships in transit between Cyprus and northern Lebanon, with many of those captured brought to Israel and kept in prison without charge as hostages, and numerous other crimes that are not crimes because they were backed by Washington.13. In journalism and scholarship on terrorism, 1985 is recognized to be the peak year of Middle East terrorism, but not because of these events, rather, because of two terrorist atrocities in which a single person was murdered, in each case an American.14. In the worst of the two terrorist atrocities that passed through the doctrinal filters, a crippled American Jew, Leon Klinghoffer, was brutally murdered. During the hijacking of the Akil Laro cruise ship in October 1985 by a Palestinian terrorist group led by Abu Abbas, the murder seemed to set a standard for remorselessness among terrorists. New York Times correspondent John Burns wrote. Burns described Abu Abbas as the has-been monster who may finally have to face a day of reckoning with American justice for his role in the crime. One of the heralded achievements of the invasion of Iraq was their capture of Abu Abbas a few months later. Fifteen. The Klinghoffer murder remains the most vivid and lasting symbol of the ineradicable evil of Arab terrorism and the unanswerable proof that there can be no negotiating with these vermin. The atrocity was very real, and is in no way mitigated by the terrorists' plea that the hijacking was in retaliation for the FAR. Dash page 159. More murderous US-backed Israeli terrorist attack on Tunis a week earlier. But the bombing of Tunis does not enter the canon of terrorism because it is subject to the wrong agent fallacy. It remained unmentioned when Abu Abbas was captured. There would of course be no difficulty in apprehending the monsters. Shimon Peres and George Schultz, who are far from his beans, and bringing them to a day of reckoning with American justice. But that is beyond unthinkable. Also efficiently disappeared are recent events that bear more than a superficial similarity to the Klinghoffer murder. The reaction was silence when British reporters found the flattened remains of the wheelchair in the remnants of the Jenin refugee camp after Sharon's spring 2002 offensive. It had been utterly crushed, ironed flat as if in a cartoon, they reported, in the middle of the debris. Lay a broken white flag. A crippled Palestinian Kemal Zagaya was shot dead as he tried to wheel himself up the road. The Israeli tanks must have driven over the body, because when a friend found it, one leg and both arms were missing, and the face, he said, had been ripped in two. Sixteen if even reported in the U.S., this would have been dismissed as an inadvertent error in the course of Justified retaliation. Kemal Zagaya does not deserve to enter the annals of terrorism along with Leon Klinghoffer. His murder was not under the command of a monster but a man of peace who enjoys a soulful relation with a man of vision in the White House. The basic dynamic at work was outlined 20 years ago by one of Israel's most eminent writers and commentators, Boaz Evron after an upsurge of settler IDF violence that caused much consternation in Israel. Evron wrote a sardonic account of how to deal with the lower orders, the Arabishim in Israeli slang. Israel should keep them on a short leash, he wrote, so that they recognize that 
the whip is held over the head, as long as not too many people are being visibly killed, then Western humanists will accept it all peacefully and even ask, what is so terrible? 17. The guardians of journalistic integrity in the U.S. understand the lesson without everyone's advice. The most prestigious media watchdog, the Columbia Journalism Review, gave its cherished laurel to the U.S. media for their coverage of Sharon's Spring 2002 offensive in Jenin, Nablus, Romla, and elsewhere, in the 30. Fifth year of Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. The recipients earned the laurel, according to the review, for ensuring that scrutiny of the offensive would focus on one cardinal question Was there a purposeful massacre of hundreds of civilians in the Jenin refugee camp? Question mark 18 If not, then civilized people. Dash page 160 can accept it all peacefully. We might try a thought experiment. Suppose that Syria had occupied Israel for 35 years, employing the means and measures of Israel's occupation, and then proceeded further to duplicate Sharon's 2002 offensive, rampaging through Jewish towns, leveling large areas with bulldozers and tanks keeping the population under siege for weeks without food or water or access to medical care, destroying cultural centers and their institutions of government and archaeological treasures, making it crystal clear to the Yids in every possible way that the whip is held over the head but not slaughtering hundreds of them at once, according to the standards of their laurel. Only an anti-Arab racist would object, and discovery of the scattered parts of a murdered Jewish cripple in a wheelchair crushed by a Syrian tank would merit no notice, let alone stern American justice. Reviewing the Jenin story, the review berated the British press for embracing Israel's guilt as established fact and ridiculed the UN for preparing an investigation by a team whose political sympathies ensured that its conclusions would be challenged, certainly by the independent thinkers of their review. Amid all this confounding din, the editors asked, what was the world to believe? Fortunately, all was not lost, and to the independent U.S. news media, on a fact-finding mission of their own which refuted the anti-Israel slanders and revealed that there was no deliberate, cold-blooded murderer of hundreds at Jenin, in fact, reaching exactly the same conclusions as the disreputable British media and others, which, however, did not adopt the framework of U.S. Israeli propaganda as rigidly as the editors of the review demand and scrutinized their Israeli invasion beyond that single question. The independent U.S. media did not merit the insulting praise of their cheerleader. Careful readers could learn about the crimes that had taken place, though not in the shocking detail presented in the Israeli and European press, and they were carefully protected from the complicity of their own government. In routine fashion, when the wrong agents are implicated in state-supported international terrorism, we sometimes discover that terrorist atrocities are not fully effaced, but rather praised. An instructive case is the country that replaced El Salvador as the leading recipient of U.S. military aid and training, Turkey, where state terror was practiced on a massive scale through the Clinton years, relying on U.S. Support. 19. I borrow the term state terror from the Turkish State Minister for Human Rights, referring to the vast atrocities against Kurds in 1994, and from Dash page 161. Sociologist Ismail Bissiksi returned to prison after publishing his book State Terror in the Near East, having already served 15 years for recording Turkish repression of the Kurds, as elsewhere.
and acceptable facts were disappeared, but the events did not pass entirely unnoticed. The State Department's year 2000 report on Washington's efforts to combat terrorism singled out Turkey for its positive experiences in combating terror, along with Algeria and Spain, worthy colleagues. This praise was reported without comment in a front-page story in the New York Times by its specialist on terrorism. In a leading journal of international affairs, Ambassador Robert Pearson reports that the U.S. could have no better friend and ally than Turkey in its efforts to eliminate terrorism worldwide, thanks to the capabilities of Turkey's armed forces demonstrated. In their anti-terror campaign in the Kurdish Southeast.20 as noted, the voluntary U.S. censorship of Turkish state terror was eased slightly in early 2003, during Turkey's democratic deviation through the decisive role of the United States remained well concealed. 21. The considerations just reviewed, a small sample, suggest one simple way to reduce the threat of terror, stop participating in it. That would be a significant contribution to a general war on terror. Nevertheless, it would not address their category of terror that passes through the doctrinal filters, their terror against us and our clients, an extremely serious matter, no doubt. Let us put that issue aside for a moment and consider a related domain in which attention to truisms may have some value. Truisms and just war theory. The theory of just war has enjoyed revival in the context of the new era of humanitarian intervention and international terrorism. Consider the strongest case put forth, the bombing of Afghanistan, a paradigm example of just war. According to the Western consensus, the respected moral political philosopher Jean Beth Kelstein summarizes received opinion fairly accurately when she writes that nearly everyone, with the exception of absolute pacifists and those who seem to think we should let ourselves be slaughtered with impunity, because so many people out there hate us, agrees that the bombing of Afghanistan was clearly a just war. 22 to mention just one additional example. New York Times columnist Bill Keller, now executive editor, remarks that when America dispatched soldiers in the cause of regime change in Afghanistan, the opposition was mostly limited to the people who are reflexively against the American use of power, either timid supporters or isolationists. The doctrinaire. Dash page 162. Left and the soft-headed types Christopher Hitchens described as people who discovering a viper in the bed of their child would place the first call to people for the ethical treatment of animals. 23. These are empirical statements, so despite the near unanimity of their declarations, we are entitled to ask whether they are true. Let's ignore the fact. That regime change was not the cause of war in Afghanistan but rather an afterthought late in the game, with their opponents of the bombing who were not either absolute pacifists or absolute lunatics. It turns out that the were and the opponents formed an interesting collection. To begin with, they apparently included the great majority of their population of the world when the bombing was announced. So we discover from an international Gallup poll in late September 2001. The lead question was this. Once the identity of the terrorists is known, should the American government launch a military attack on the country or countries where the terrorists are based or should the American government seek to extradite the terrorists to Stand trial? Whether such diplomatic means could have succeeded is known. Only to ideological extremists on both sides, tentative explorations of extradition 
by the Taliban were instantly rebuffed by Washington, which also refused to provide evidence for its accusations. World opinion strongly favored diplomatic judicial measures over military action. In Europe, support for military action ranged from 8% in Greece to 29% in France. Support was least in Latin America, the region that has their most experience with U.S. intervention. It ranged from 2% in Mexico to 11% in Colombia and Venezuela. The sole exception was Panama, where only 80% preferred peaceful means, 16% military attack. Support for strikes that included civilian targets was much less. Even in the two countries polled that supported the use of military force, India and Israel, were there. Reasons were parochial, considerable majorities opposed such attacks. There was, then, overwhelming opposition to Washington's actual policies, which not only included civilian targets but even turned major urban concentrations into ghost towns from the first moment, the press reported. The Gallup poll was not reported in the U.S., though it was elsewhere, including Latin America.24. Notice that even this very limited support for the bombing was based on a crucial presupposition that those responsible for 9-11 were known, but they were not, as the government quietly informed us eight months after the bombing. In June 2002, FBI Director Robert Mueller testified before the Senate. Dash page 163. Committee delivering what the press described as some of his most detailed public comments on the origins of the attacks of the 9th of November 2025 Mueller informed their Senate that investigators believe the idea of the September 11 attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon came from Al-Qaeda leaders in Afghanistan, though. The plotting and financing may trace to Germany and the United Arab Emirates. We think the masterminds of it were in Afghanistan, high in the Al-Qaeda leadership, Mullah said. If the indirect responsibility of Afghanistan could only be surmised in June 2002, it evidently could not have been known eight months before when President Bush ordered the bombing of Afghanistan. According to the FBI, then, the bombing was a war crime, an act of aggression, based on mere supposition. It also follows directly that there was virtually no detectable world support for the policies actually undertaken, since even there, minimal support recorded by polls was based on a presupposition that Washington and London knew to be false. Perhaps the former director of Human Rights Watch Africa, now a professor of law at Emory University, spoke for many others around the world when he addressed the International Council on Human Rights Policy in Geneva in January 2002, saying that I am unable to appreciate any moral, political or legal difference between this J.I. act by the United States against those it deems to be its enemies and the J.I. act by Islamic groups against those they deem to be their enemies. 26. What about Afghan opinion? Information is scanty but not entirely lacking. In late October 2001, after three weeks of intense bombing, 1,000 Afghan leaders gathered in Peshawar, some exiles, some coming from within Afghanistan, all committed to overthrowing the Taliban regime. It was a rare display of unity. Among tribal elders, Islamic scholars, fractious politicians, and former guerrilla commanders, the press reported. They had many disagreements but unanimously urged the U.S. to stop the air raids and appealed to the international media to call for an end to the bombing of innocent people. They 
urged that other means be adopted to overthrow the hated Taliban regime. A. Goal they believed could be achieved without further death and destruction. A similar message was conveyed by Afghan opposition leader Abdul Haq, who was highly regarded in Washington and by Afghan President Hamid Kazai, just before he entered Afghanistan without U.S. support, and was then captured and killed. Haq condemned the bombing then underway and criticized the U.S. for refusing to back his efforts and those of others to create a revolt within the Taliban. The bombing was a big setback for these efforts, he said. Dash page 164. The U.S. is trying to show its muscle, score a victory and scare everyone in the world. They don't care about the suffering of the Afghans or how many people we will lose. The prominent Afghan women's organization Rawa, which received some belated recognition when it became ideologically serviceable to express concern about the fate of women in Afghanistan, also bitterly condemned the bombing. 27. Among their opponents of the bombing were the major aid and relief agencies, deeply concerned over the likely effect on the population, agreeing with academic specialists that the bombing posed a grave risk of starvation for millions of people. 28. In short, the lunatic fringe was not insubstantial. Let us turn now to the most elementary principle of just war theory. Universality. Those who cannot accept this principle should have the decency to keep silent about matters of right and wrong, or just war. If we can rise to this level, some obvious questions arise. For example, have Cuba and Nicaragua been entitled to set off bombs in Washington, New York, and Miami in self-defense against ongoing terrorist attack, particularly so when the perpetrators are well known and act with complete impunity, sometimes in brazen defiance of the highest international authorities so that the cases are far clearer than Afghanistan? If not, why not? Certainly one cannot appeal to the scale of crimes to justify such a stand, the merest look at the factual record bars that move. If these questions are not answered, just war pronouncements cannot be taken seriously. I have yet to discover a single case where the questions are even raised. That leads to some conclusions that may not be particularly attractive but that might merit attention and self-examination and serious concern about the long-term implications of the apparent inability to accept the principle of universality that underlies these failures. Although the critical questions are not answered, or in fact even raised, related issues occasionally do come up, and in a manner that gives some useful insight into the prevailing moral and intellectual culture. The Latin American correspondent of the New York Times informs us that Latin American intellectuals have reflexively accorded anti-American leaders' immunity to the moral standards applied to other leaders. His evidence is a statement by Latin. American intellectuals warning against a post-Iraq invasion of Cuba. He believes the psychological explanation may be necessary to account for their failure to adopt universal moral standards. 29 No Psychological Dash page 165 Explanation seems necessary, however, when he and his associates reflexively accord their leaders' immunity to the moral standards they apply to others. Specifically, the moral standards that would call for severe punishment for anyone else who dared to carry out terrorist wars comparable to those that their leaders have conducted against Cuba and Nicaragua. Consider how Elstein's argument on Afghanistan fares within her own framework. She formulates four criteria for just war. First, force is justified if it 
protects the innocent from certain harm. Her sole example is when a country has certain knowledge that genocide will commence on a certain date and there. Victims have no means of self-defense. Second, the war must be openly declared or otherwise authorized by a legitimate authority. Third, it must begin with their right intentions. Fourth, it must be a last resort after other possibilities for their redress and defense of the values at stake have been explored. The first condition is inapplicable to Afghanistan. The second and third are meaningless. An open declaration of war by an aggressor confers no support whatsoever for a claim of just war. The worst criminals claim right intentions. And there are always acolytes to endorse the claims. The fourth obviously does not apply in Afghanistan. Therefore her paradigm case collapses entirely, under her own criteria. That aside, whatever one thinks of Elstein's belief that the bombing of Afghanistan met her conditions, these conditions hold with far greater clarity for many of the victims of U.S. state-supported international terrorism on her own grounds. Then, these victims should be granted the right to wage a just war against the U.S. by bombing and terror, as long as it is openly declared and accompanied by a pronouncement of right intentions. The reduction to absurdity, however, presupposes that we adopt the principle of universality and mentioned in her historical-slash-philosophical study and tacitly rejected in the standard fashion. Let's bring in some further relevant facts. The official motive for the bombing of Afghanistan was to force the Taliban to hand over people that the U.S. suspected of involvement in the crimes of 9-11. The U.S. refused, however, to provide any evidence. At the time when Taliban reluctance to comply was their lead story of the day, arousing much fury, Haiti renewed its request for extradition of Emmanuel Constant, leader of the paramilitary forces that had primary responsibility for the brutal murder of thousands of Haitians during their early 1990s, when the military junta was supported, not so tacitly, by the first Bush and Clinton administrations. The request apparently did not even merit a dash page 166 response, or more than the barest report. Constant had been sentenced in absentia in Haiti. It is widely assumed that the U.S. is concerned that if he testifies, he may reveal contacts between the state terrorists and Washington.30 does Haiti. Therefore have the right to set off bombs in Washington, or to try to kidnap Paul. Kill Constant in New York, where he lives, killing bystanders in approved Israeli style. If not, why not? Why is the question not even raised in this case, or in that? of other murderous state terrorists who enjoy safe haven in the U.S.? And if the question is considered too absurd even to consider, as it is, by elementary moral standards, where does that leave the consensus on the resort to violence by one's own leaders? Referring to 9-11, some argue that the evil of terrorism is absolute and merits a reciprocally absolute doctrine in response, ferocious military assault in accord with the Bush doctrine that if you harbor terrorists, you re a terrorist, if you aid and 3. I abet terrorists, you re a terrorist, and you will be treated like one. It would be hard to find anyone who accepts the doctrine that massive bombing is a legitimate response to terrorist crimes. No sane person would agree that bombing Washington would be legitimate in accord with the reciprocally absolute doctrine on response to terrorist atrocities, or a justified and properly calibrated response to them. If there is some reason why this observation is 
inappropriate. It has yet to be articulated, even contemplated, as far as I have been able to discover. Consider some of the legal arguments that have been presented to justify their U.S. UK bombing of Afghanistan. Christopher Greenwood argues that the U.S. has the right of self-defense against those who caused or threatened death and destruction, appealing to the World Court ruling in the Nicaragua case. The paragraph he cites applies far more clearly to the U.S. war against Nicaragua than to the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, so if it is taken to justify intensive U.S. bombardment and ground attack in Afghanistan, then Nicaragua should have been entitled to carry out much more severe attacks against the U.S. Another distinguished professor of international law, Thomas Frank, supports the U.S.-UK war on grounds that a state is responsible for the consequences of permitting its territory to be used to injure another state, the principle is surely applicable to the U.S. in the case of Nicaragua, Cuba, and many other examples. 32. Needless to say, in no such case would an appeal to the right of self-defense against continuing acts of death and destruction be remotely tolerable. Acts not merely threats. The same holds for more nuanced proposals for an appropriate response to Dash page 167 Terrorist atrocities. Military historian Michael Howard proposes a police operation conducted under the auspices of the United Nations against a criminal conspiracy whose members should be hunted down and brought before an international court where they would receive a fair trial and, if found guilty, be awarded an appropriate sentence, reasonable enough, though the idea that such measures be applied to the US or Britain is unthinkable. 33. Two Oxford scholars propose a principle of proportionality, the magnitude of response will be determined by the magnitude with which the aggression interfered with key values in the society attacked, in the case of 9-11, freedom, to pursue self-betterment in a plural society through market economics, that value was viciously attacked on 9-11 by aggressors, with a moral orthodoxy, divergent from the West, since Afghanistan constitutes a state that sided with the aggressor, and refused U.S. demands to turn over suspects, the United States and its allies, according to the principle of magnitude of interference, could justifiably and morally resort to force against the Taliban government. 34. If the moral orthodoxy of the West accommodates the principle of universality, it follows that Cuba and Nicaragua, in fact, many others, can justifiably and morally resort to far greater force against the U.S. government. Uncontroversially, the U.S. terrorist attacks and other illegal actions against Cuba and Nicaragua interfered with key values in the society attacked far more dramatically than in the case of 9-11 and were intended to do so. Furthermore, since Britain sided with the aggressor, Oxford too should be subject to attack, at least by Nicaragua. We are entitled to ask why the conclusion cannot even be contemplated, quite properly, of course, and what that implies about the elite intellectual culture. The conclusions with regard to the principle of universality extend far beyond these cases, including even such minor escapades by U.S. UK standards, as Clinton's missile attack on the al Shifa pharmaceutical plant in Sudan in 1998, which led to several tens of thousands of deaths, according to the only reputable estimates we have, estimates consistent with the immediate assessment of Human Rights Watch and later reports of knowledgeable observers. 35 A Crime 
of even a fraction of the scale would elicit fury if the target were the US, Israel, or some other worthy victim, and retaliation of a kind that one hesitates to imagine, which would furthermore be acclaimed as a paradigm example of just war. The principle of proportionality entails that Sudan had every right to carry out massive terror in retaliation, even more so if we adopt the more extreme view that Clinton's missile attack had appalling consequences for the economy and dash page 168 Society of Sudan, 36 so that the atrocity was much worse than the crimes of 9-11 which were appalling enough but did not have such consequences Almost all of the limited commentary on the suit and bombing keeps to the question of whether the plant was believed to produce chemical weapons, true or false, that has no bearing at all on the crime, specifically on the magnitude with which the aggression interfered with key values in the society attacked. Many point out that the resulting deaths were unintended, so that their perpetrators and those who disregard the consequences of the attack are not culpable. The argument again illustrates, dramatically, the standard rejection of the principle of universality. We would never accept this stand for a moment. With regard to others, many of the atrocities we rightly denounce are unintended, through that is considered irrelevant when the perpetrator is someone other than ourselves, but a much harsher conclusion follows. Immediately and unequivocally, the claim that the actions were not criminal can be sustained only on the assumption that the fate of the victims was of no concern to the perpetrators. We cannot seriously doubt that the likely human consequences were understood by U.S. planners, the CIA knew as well as human rights watch and many others that they were destroying the country's major source of pharmaceuticals and veterinary medicines and what the likely effects would be and the same conclusions could have been drawn at once and surely can be now by anyone who thinks that the effects of our violence on poor africans might merit some concern the acts can be excused then only on their Hegelian doctrine that Africans are mere things whose lives have no value. Observing the attitudes and practice that prevail, those outside the ranks of Western privilege may draw their own conclusions about the moral orthodoxy of the West. Confronting terror. Let us now restrict the term terror, improperly, but in accord with near universal convention. To the subcategory that passes through the doctrinal filters. The wars contemplated as part of the redeclared war on terror are to go on for a long time. There's no telling how many wars it will take to secure freedom. In the homeland, the president announced dot thirty seven that's fair enough. Potential threats are virtually limitless everywhere, even at home as the anthrax attack and their failed investigations of it illustrate. Not only is the war on terror, as conceived, likely to go on for a long time, dash page 169, but it also did not suddenly become a crucial issue on 9-11. The terrorist attacks of that day were not entirely unexpected, yet another reason to question there widely held belief that 9-11 signaled a sharp change in the course of history. Even readers of newspaper headlines, and surely government planners, were well aware years earlier that atrocities of the 9-11 variety might occur. After all, in 1993, one almost did occur. Organizations presumably related to those responsible for 9-11 came perilously close to blowing up the World Trade Center and killing perhaps tens of thousands of people. It was also known, at once, that 
They had far more ambitious plans that were barely aborted in time. Even with the hideous consummation of these plans on 9-11, risk assessments did not significantly change. Prospects of major terrorist atrocities were publicly discussed well before 9-11 and there could have been little doubt of the nature of the radical Islamist terrorist organizations since at least 1981, when elements that formed part of the core of Al-Qaeda in later years assassinated President Sadat of Egypt, or a few years later, when groups that may have been loosely related drove U.S. forces out of Beirut killing hundreds of troops and many civilians in separate attacks. Furthermore, the thinking of those involved in these and other similar actions was reasonably well understood, certainly by the U.S. intelligence agencies that had helped to recruit, train, and arm them from 1980 and continued to work with them even as they were attacking the United States, the Dutch government. Inquiry into the Srebrenica massacre revealed that while radical Islamists were attempting to blow up the World Trade Center, others from the CIA formed networks were being flown by the U.S. from Afghanistan to Bosnia, along with Iranian-backed Hezbollah fighters and a substantial supply of arms. They were being brought to support the U.S. side in the Balkan Wars, while Israel along with Ukraine and Greece, was arming the Serbs, possibly with U.S. supplied arms. 38. The atrocities of 9-11 serve as a dramatic reminder of what has long been understood. The rich and powerful no longer are assured the near monopoly of violence that has largely prevailed throughout history, and with modern technology, the prospects are horrendous indeed. Though terrorism is rightly feared everywhere and is indeed an intolerable return to barbarism, it is not surprising that perceptions about its nature differ rather sharply at opposite ends of the guns, a fact that is ignored at their peril by those whom history has accustomed to immunity while they perpetrate terrible crimes, quite apart from the moral cowardice so starkly revealed. There are broad tendencies in global affairs that are expected to enhance their dash page 170. Threat of this category of terror. Some are discussed by the U.S. National Intelligence Council, NIC, in its projections from the coming years. 39. The NIC expects the official version of globalization to continue on course. Its evolution will be rocky marked by chronic financial volatility and a widening economic divide. Financial volatility very likely means slower growth, extending their pattern of neoliberal globalization for those who follow the rules and harming mostly the poor. The Nick goes on to predict that as this form of globalization proceeds, deepening economic stagnation, political instability, and cultural alienation, will, foster ethnic, ideological and religious extremism, along with their violence that often accompanies it, much of it directed against the United States. Unsurprisingly, Kenneth Waltz observes, the weak and disaffected lash out at the United States as the agent or symbol of their suffering. 40. The same. Assumptions are made by military planners, a matter to which we return. Those concerned to reduce the threat of terror will attend carefully to such factors as these, and also to specific actions and long-term policies that exacerbate them. They will also distinguish carefully between the terrorist networks themselves and the larger community that provides a reservoir from which radical terrorist cells can sometimes draw. That community includes the poor and oppressed, who are of no concern to the terrorist groups and suffer from their crimes, as well as wealthy and secular elements, who are bitter about 
U.S. policies and quietly express support for bin Laden, whom they detest and fear as the conscience of Islam, because at least he reacts to these policies, even if in horrifying and disastrous ways. 41. The distinction is elementary. Among those who wish to mitigate terrorist threats, it is understood that unless the social, political, and economic conditions that spawned Al-Qaeda and other associated groups are addressed, the United States and its allies in Western Europe and elsewhere will continue to be targeted by Islamist terrorists. Accordingly, the U.S. should, for its own self-protection, expand efforts to reduce the pathology of hatred before it mutates into even greater danger, seeking to moderate conditions that breed violence and terrorism. The key to strategically weakening Al-Qaeda is to erode its fledgling support base, to wean away its supporters and potential supporters. Washington planner Paul Wolfowitz adds that it is crucial to eliminate policies that have been a huge recruiting device for Al-Qaeda. 42. Nothing can appease those who believe a clash of civilizations with the West will restore Islam as a world power, the editors of the Financial Times write. But, to crush them, successfully they must be separated from their widening. Dash page 171. Constituency, they add, put another way, while only might can destroy Al-Qaeda, its expanding support base can be eroded only by policies Arabs and Muslims see as just. Even destruction of Al-Qaeda will do little if the underlying conditions that facilitated the group's emergence and popularity, political oppression and economic marginalization, will persist. Correspondingly, continuation of Washington's backing for sordid. Governments can only bolster Al-Qaeda's claims that the U.S. supports their oppression of Muslims and props of brutal governments. 43. That is quite aside from specific policies regarding Palestine and Iraq and others, which have converted a generation of Arabs would by the United States and persuaded by its principles to among the most vociferous critics of America's worldview, including affluent businessmen with ties to the West, U.S. educated intellectuals and liberal activists. 44. Terrorist networks can be severely weakened. That happened to Al Qaeda after 9 11, thanks to the kind of police work Michael Howard recommended. Notably, in Germany, Pakistan, and Indonesia. But their support base has to be approached in radically different ways, by considering grievances and, if a, are legitimate, addressing them in a serious way, as should be done irrespective of any threat. Delicate social and political problems cannot be bombed or missiled out of existence, two political scientists point out, by dropping bombs and firing missiles, the United States only spreads these festering problems. Violence can be likened to a virus, the more you bombard it, the more it spreads. 45. The Financial Times editors are right to say that the terrorist atrocity in Jeddah, which occasioned their comments, was not unexpected, and more generally, that it had long been obvious that the network inspired by Osama bin Laden would use the upheaval of the Iraq war to relaunch attacks against Western targets and drum up support for its jihad. It was widely predicted by intelligence services and analysts in their mainstream that the invasion of Iraq would be likely to inspire terrorism. It is therefore not unexpected that since the United States invaded Iraq in March, U.S. officials said the Al-Qaeda network has experienced a spike in recruitment, and there is an increase in radical fundamentalism all over there.
world. A UN report indicated that recruitment for Al-Qaeda accelerated in 30 to 40 countries as the US began building up for the Iraq invasion. 46 An intelligence report by a European ally warns that the invasion could have a cataclysmic effect on the mobilization for Al-Qaeda. 47 That the conflict in Iraq. Dash page 172. Led to a rise in recruitment for radical groups is now so clear that even U.S. officials admit it. A close observer of Al-Qaeda and terrorism writes, This is a huge setback in the war on terror. The war has, in fact, created a new terrorist haven, Iraq itself. 48. With regard to the terrorist networks themselves, scholarship is virtually unanimous in taking them at their word, which has matched their deeds from the days when they were organized by the CIA and its associates. Their goal, in their terms, is to drive the infidels from Muslim lands, to overthrow the corrupt and brutal governments imposed and sustained by the infidels, and to institute an extremist version of Islam. They despise the Russians with passion but ceased. Their terrorist attacks against Russia based in Afghanistan when Russia withdrew through these continue from Chechnya. And as bin Laden announced in 1998, the call to wage war against America was made when it sent tens of thousands of its troops to the land of the two holy mosques over and above. Its support of the oppressive, corrupt and tyrannical regime that is in control. These are the reasons for the singling out of America as a target. 49 But their goals may well become more ambitious, and their recruiting base more expensive as well. If the enthusiasts for a clash of civilizations prefer to try to missile delicate social and political problems out of existence rather than address their problems and thus infringe on power and privilege. The bombing in Jeddah after the Iraq war fits the pattern of earlier actions. The target was the civilian compound of Vinyl Corp, a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman which provides retired U.S. military officers to train the elite armed forces that protect the royal family, not from foreign invasion. A Vinyl training facility had been bombed in 1995. The bombing makes the point that you are going after aspects of the military presence in Saudi Arabia, a British risk analyst observed. The military contractors who play a very important supporting role. 50. Michael Ignatieff, who advocates a U.S. imperial role in the Middle East, reflects a broad consensus in writing that the largely challenge for the U.S. and the chief danger in the whole Iraqi gamble is to enforce a peace on the Palestinians and Israelis. The U.S. enforced peace must, as a minimum, Give the Palestinians a viable, contiguous state and rebuild their shattered infrastructure. To leave the Palestinians to face Israeli tanks and helicopter gunships is a virtual guarantee of an ending Islamic wrath against the United States. 51. Ignatief writes that Americans have played imperial guarantor since their 1940s but he does not explain what the U.S. has guaranteed since it assumed their mantle. He also overlooks the fact that Israeli gunships are U.S. gunships with dash page 173 Israeli pilots, and that the tanks would not be able to do their work without U.S. large S. Also an examined is why the U.S. should be expected to reverse so. Dramatically, the policy of unilateral rejectionism tracing back over 30 years. Putting these and other not inconsequential matters aside, his perception has considerable plausibility. Those who have an interest in mitigating rather than enhancing terror, too, 
borrow again the President's words, might do well to attend to the advice of those with the most experience in confronting it. None have more experience than Israel's General Security Service, Shabak, responsible for counterterror in the occupied territories. The head of Shabak from 1996 to 2000, Ami Hayalon observed that those who want victory against terror without addressing underlying grievances want an unending war much as President Bush proclaimed. The former head of Israeli military intelligence, 1991-1995, Uri Segi, draws similar conclusions, as the Lebanon invasion and other military actions illustrate, he wrote. Israel will get nowhere by following the slogan we will teach you what is good for you, by our superior force. We must see things from the perspective of the other side. Those who hope for mutual survival with the Arabs must accept a minimum of respect for Arab society. The alternative is an ending war. 52. A. Ailon and Segi are speaking of Israel-Palestine where the solution to the problem of terrorism is to offer an honorable solution to the Palestinians, respecting their right to self-determination. So Shapat HaKabi, former head of Israel military intelligence and a leading Arabist, observed 20 years ago, at a time when Israel still retained its substantial immunity from retaliation, from within the occupied territories. 53. The observations generalize in familiar ways, Northern Ireland, to mention. One case is far from a paradise but vastly improved over the days when Britain ignored legitimate grievances in favor of force. The specific policies that inflamed the potential support base for Islamic terrorism were Israel Palestine and the murderous US UK sanctions regime in Iraq. But long before, there were more fundamental issues. Again, it makes little sense to ignore these, at least for those who hope to reduce the likelihood of further terrorist crimes or to answer George W. Bush's plaintive question, why do they hate us? The question is wrongly put, they do not hate us, but rather the policies of our government, something quite different. If the question is properly formulated, answers to it are not hard to find. In the critical year 1958, President Eisenhower, dash page 174, and his staff discuss what he called the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world, not by the governments but by the people. The basic reason, there. National Security Council advised, was the perception that the US supports corrupt and brutal governments and is opposing political or economic progress in order to protect its interest in Near East toil. 54. The Wall Street Journal and others found much the same when they investigated attitudes of westernized moneyed Muslims after 9-11, bankers, professionals, managers of multinationals, and so on. They strongly support U.S. policies in general but are bitter about U.S. support for corrupt and repressive regimes that undermine democracy and development, and the more specific and Recent issues concerning Israel-Palestine and Iraq sanctions. 55. These are attitudes of people who like Americans and admire much about their United States, including its freedoms. What they hate are official policies that deny them the freedoms to which they too aspire. Attitudes in the slums and villages are probably similar, but harsher. Unlike the moneyed Muslims, there. Mass of the population have never agreed that the wealth of the region should be drained to the West and local collaborators, rather than serving domestic needs. Many commentators prefer more comforting answers. Anger in the Muslim world is rooted in resentment of our freedom and democracy in their own 
cultural failings tracing back many centuries in their alleged inability to take part in the form of globalization in which they, in fact, happily participate, and other such deficiencies, more comforting, perhaps, but not too wise. Little has changed since 9-11. Washington's increased support for the dictatorships of Central Asia is only one illustration, arousing deep hostility among democratic forces. Ahmed Rashid reports that in Pakistan as well there is growing anger that U.S. support is allowing Mushharaf's military regime to delay the promise of democracy. A well-known Egyptian academic traces hostility toward the U.S. to its support for every possible anti-democratic government in the Arab Islamic world. When we hear American officials speaking of freedom, democracy and such values, they make terms like these. Sound obscene. An Egyptian writer added that living in a country with an atrocious human rights record that also happens to be strategically vital to U.S. interests is an illuminating lesson in moral hypocrisy and political double standards. Terrorism he said, is a reaction to the injustice in the region's domestic politics, inflicted in large part by the U.S. The director of the terrorism program at the Council of Foreign Relations agreed that backing repressive regimes like Egypt and Saudi Arabia is certainly a leading cause of anti- Dash page 175. Americanism in the Arab world that warned that in both cases the likely alternatives are even nastier. 56. There is a long and illuminating history of the problems in supporting democratic forms while ensuring that they will lead to preferred outcomes, not just in the Middle East. And it doesn't win many friends. Opinion surveys in early 2003 revealed that from Morocco to the Gulf Emirates, a huge majority said that, if given the choice, they would like their Islamic clergy to play roles bigger than the subservient ones currently prescribed by most Arab governments. Almost 95% dismissed the idea that the U.S. is committed to a more democratic Arab or Muslim world, believing instead that the war in Iraq was waged to ensure control of Arab oil and the subjugation of the Palestinians to Israel's will, and overwhelming margins expect terrorism to increase as a consequence of the invasion throughout the Arab and Muslim worlds. As far as Indonesia, Islamic fundamentalism is on the rise, appealing not only to the poor but increasingly to more privileged and educated sectors as well, while America's natural friends, who could provide liberal alternatives, share the deep mistrust of U.S. intentions and policies. Fifty-seven attitudes remain rooted in the same perceptions as half a century ago, for substantial reasons. George Bush is despised even by those who used to admire the U.S. Jonathan Steele reports from Jordan, anger with Britain and America has grown and Blair's promises of action to solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict are not taken seriously. Even the most Western-oriented Jordanians believe that the war set democracy back across the Middle East and placed advocates of modernization and secular values on the defensive and few doubt that yet more violence will emerge. 58. A prominent Egyptian intellectual for whom the U.S. was a dream, a paragon of liberal values to be emulated by Arabs and Muslims, and who has devoted decades of his life to modernizing Islamic life and promoting understanding between Muslims and non-Muslims, regards the Bush administration as narrow-minded, pathological, obstinate and simplistic. It is to blame for the fact that to most people in this area, 
The United States is the source of evil on planet Earth, he says. Similar opinions can also be heard these days from wealthy Arab businessmen, university professors, senior government officials and Western leaning political analysts 59, very much as before, but now with far greater intensity and despair. If the voice of the people is a louder hearing in the new Middle East, it might turn out to be the voice of radical Islamists calling for J.I.R.D., or of secular nationalists whose perceptions of history and current practice. Dash page 176. Are not quite those of Anglo American elites. What has been reviewed here is the barest sample of what we readily discover if we pay some attention to elementary fact and agree to apply to ourselves the standards we impose on others. More follows if we are willing to enter the moral arena in the serious way. Going beyond the merest truisms and recognizing the obligation to help suffering people as best we can, a responsibility that naturally accrues to privilege. It is not pleasant to speculate about the likely consequences if concentrated power continues on its present course, protected from the scrutiny that would be second. Nature if we were to take seriously the legacy of freedom we enjoy. Dash page 177. Chapter 9. A Passing Nightmare. 1. After 9-11, the country was peering into the abyss of the future. The awesome threat of terror, though clear enough since the attack on the World Trade Center. In 1993, was now too palpable to ignore. To be more precise, it was the public that was peering into the abyss. Those at the center of power relentlessly pursue their own agendas, understanding that they can exploit the fears and anguish of the moment. They may even institute measures that deepen the abyss and may march resolutely toward it, if that advances the goals of power and privilege. They declare that it is unpatriotic and disruptive to question the workings of authority, but patriotic to institute harsh and regressive policies that benefit the wealthy, undermine social programs that serve the needs of the great majority, and subordinate a frightened population to increased state control, literally before the dust had settled over the world. Trade center ruins. Paul Krugman reported, influential Republicans signaled that they were determined to use terrorism as an excuse to pursue a radical two right-wing agenda. He and others have documented the relentless pursuit of that agenda, a natural reaction of the concentrated power to any crisis. It was unusually ugly in this case. Others states perceived the same opportunity. Russia eagerly joined their coalition against terror expecting to receive authorization for its atrocities in Chechnya, and was not disappointed. China happily joined for similar reasons. Israel recognized that it would be able to crush Palestinians even more brutally, with even firmer U.S. support, and so on, throughout much of the world. The threat of international terrorism is surely severe. The horrendous events of 9-11 had perhaps the most devastating instant human toll on record, outside of war. The word instant should not be overlooked. The crime is not otherwise unusual in the annals of violence that falls short of war, as understood very well by the traditional victims. The threat of terrorism is, however, not the only abyss into which we peer. A. Dash page 178. Much more grave threat to biology's only experiment with higher intelligence is posed by weapons of mass destruction. In an important 1995 document, the U.S. Strategic Command, STRATCOM, described nuclear weapons as the most 
valuable in the arsenal, because unlike chemical or biological weapons, the extreme destruction from a nuclear explosion is immediate, with few if any palliatives to reduce its effect. Furthermore, nuclear weapons always cast a shadow over any crisis or conflict, hence must be visible at the ready. The study advises that planners should not portray themselves as too fully irrational and cool-headed, that the U.S. may become irrational and vindictive if it's vital. Interests are attacked should be a part of the national persona we project. It is beneficial for our strategic posture if some elements may appear to be potentially out of control. Clinton's Stratcom was proposing a version of Nixon's famous Madman theory, which he and Kissinger applied in an October 1969 nuclear alert that they believed to be risk-free but that might have gotten out of control because of critical factors they ignored. Yet another example of their unpredictable consequences of the threat or use of force, which in the current era can be very serious indeed. The U.S. must retain the right of first use of nuclear weapons, Stratcom advised further, even against non-nuclear powers that have signed the 1970 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and must continue to maintain its launch on warning posture for strategic nuclear missiles, on hair trigger alert. It appears. 3 that the Clinton administration adopted these proposals. The U.S. is unusual, perhaps unique, in the access it allows to high-level planning documents, an important achievement of American democracy. This one, like others, has been available for years but is scarcely known, not a democratic triumph. Severe threats are not limited to the weapons of mass destruction in the hands of the powerful. Small nuclear weapons can be smuggled into any country with four relative ease, along with other potentially very destructive varieties of WMD. The most immediate threat, a Department of Energy task force advised, is that there could be 40,000 nuclear weapons in the former Soviet Union, poorly controlled and poorly stored. One of the first acts of the Bush administration was to cut back a small program to assist Russia in safeguarding and dismantling these weapons and providing alternative employment for nuclear scientists, a decision that increases the risks of accidental launch and also leakage of loose nukes perhaps followed by nuclear scientists with no other way to employ their 5. Skills. Dash page 179. Programs for missile defense are expected to enhance these threats. U.S. Intelligence predicts that any American deployment will impel China to develop new nuclear armed missiles, expanding its arsenal tenfold, probably with multiple warheads, MIRF, prompting India and Pakistan to respond with their own build-ups, with a likely ripple effect to the Middle East. Intelligence officials also predict that Russia and China both would increase proliferation, including selling countermeasures for sure to such nations as North Korea, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. These and other analyses conclude further that Russia's only rational response to their national missile defense system would be to maintain, and 6. Strengthen, the existing Russian nuclear force. The Bush administration announced that it has no objections to China's plans to build up its small fleet of nuclear missiles, shifting policy in the hope of gaining Chinese acquiescence to the planned dismantling of core arms control agreements. For similar reasons, Clinton negotiators had encouraged Russia to adopt a launch on warning strategy, a proposal that nuclear experts regarded as 
pretty bizarre because we know that Russia's deteriorating warning systems are full of holes and prone to false alerts, increasing the threat of Russian unauthorized, accidental, and erroneous launches. Chinese resumption of nuclear testing was also being quietly endorsed, it was reported. Strategic analysts pointed out that this change of policy would encourage China to aim more nuclear armed missiles at the US and Japan, with the expected effect on Japanese and Taiwanese programs. At the same time, the press reported that there U.S. would impose sanctions on China for allowing the transfer to Pakistan of missile parts and technology that are essentially for weapons that can carry nuclear warheads. 7. Or pretty bizarre, if security is a highly valued concern. Missile defense and other military programs of the Bush administration are inherently provocative to Russia and China, John Steinbrunner and Jeffrey. Lewis point out, like other strategic analysts, they describe the strategic offensive reductions treaty signed by Bush and Putin in May 2002 as mostly for show. It will not meaningfully diminish the lethal potential of either nation's nuclear force, nor will it establish a stable strategic balance, the deteriorating. Russian arsenal will become increasingly vulnerable to pre-emptive attack, particularly as the United States undertakes planned modernization of nuclear forces and the deployment of missile defenses probably driving Russia to react. In turn, as later reports indicate, China also recognizes U.S. programs to be a direct threat to its minimal deterrent force and is likely to readjust priorities. From economic development to defense, China was particularly alarmed. Dash page 180. Steinbrunner and Lewis Wright, by a 1998 long-range planning document of the U.S. Space Command outlining a new concept of global engagement, including space-based strike capabilities that would allow the U.S to attack any country, and to deny similar capability to any other countries, another Clinton era, precursor to the national security strategy of September 2002, the UN conference on disarmament has been deadlocked since 1998 by China's insistence on maintaining the use of space for peaceful means and Washington's 8. Refusal to agree alienating many allies and creating conditions for confrontation. A May 2003 RAND Corporation study concludes that the potential for an accidental or unauthorized nuclear missile launch in Russia or the United States has grown over the past decade despite warmer U.S. Russian relations. Neglecting these risks could produce possibly the greatest disaster in modern history, and possibly in world history, said former Senator Sam Nunn, co-chairman of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which funded the report. The major threat derives from the thousands of nuclear warheads that each side maintains, with the U.S. increasing its nuclear capabilities, which will drive Russia to heightened alert status and probable implementation of a launch on warning. Approach to warfare requiring rapid reaction for launching some 3,000 warheads, sharply increasing the danger of nuclear destruction by accident. None, too, dismisses the Bush Putin Treaty of 2002 as meaningless. Like the US, Russia responded to the treaty by rapidly increasing the scale and sophistication of its nuclear and other military systems motivated in part by concerns about U.S. 9. Plans The extent of the problem of grave proliferation risks from stockpiles of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons was also revealed in a study issued by a consortium of influential research centers. It concludes that virtually none of 
Russia's plutonium and less than one-seventh of its highly enriched uranium has been rendered unusable for nuclear weapons, and the same is true for their United States. Moreover, thousands of weapons scientists and workers in Russia are still unemployed or underemployed, the report says, and susceptible to lucrative offers of work from countries that could have secret germ weapons programs. There has been some progress under the Nunluga Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, but the tasks ahead remain daunting. Ten, As noted, the national security strategy of 2002 virtually ignored measures to alleviate the threat of military confrontation. No less disturbing, it invited potential adversaries to continue to seek deterrence through their own mass casualty weapons and novel means to deliver them, thus breeding proliferation. Dash page 181. And all that it entails. Bush's had budget proposals reflected the same priorities. Missile defense alone received more funding than the entire State Department. And four times as much as programs to safeguard dangerous weapons and materials in the former Soviet Union, maintaining the U.S. nuclear arsenal and preparing for resumption of nuclear tests received almost five times as much funding as initiatives to control loose nukes and fissile materials. Eleven, Even before the national security strategy was announced, Bush had called for programs for offensive use of nuclear arms. His Pentagon planners described both nuclear and non-nuclear weapons as offensive strike systems that can be a key pillar of a new triad of offensive, defensive and military industrial resources, providing new means to defeat opponents decisively. Traditional policy has been turned upside down, Ivo Dalder of Brookings observes, as Nuclear weapons become a tool of war fighting rather than deterrence, also eroding the distinction between conventional weapons and WMD. Bush further proceeded to lower the nuclear threshold and break down the firewall, separating nuclear weapons from everything else as the US prepared for the invasion of Iraq, making the world infinitely more dangerous than it was two years ago. When George W. Bush took the presidential oath of office, military analyst William Markin wrote. Twelve. In May 2003, Congress adopted the Bush administration programs, opening the door to a new generation of nuclear weapons, potentially touching off an arms race as other nations try to match American capability. Thirteen. The Senate. Armed Services Committee repealed a 1993 ban on research and development of low-yield nuclear weapons, through the technology is so advanced that others are unlikely to follow suit directly. The change in policy is nevertheless good. News to nuclear states in Asia, an Indian disarmament expert comments. Unhappily, helping them claim that they can refine their weapons systems and the research also. Another adds that the policy of the US toward Iraq and North Korea only gives more incentive for nations to get nuclear weapons. If the US tests weapons, then China will test, and there will be domestic pressure for India to test as well. Then Pakistan, you're opening a can of worms. 14 Defense Analyst Harlan Elman warned that a country that is specifically threatened, like Iran, might hurry its nuclear weapons program after seeing the United States lead an assault on Iraq, providing the pretext for an invasion of Iran in the South. Fulfilling prophecy. Others expect that Pakistan, feeling pushed into desperation by India and its significant superiority in conventional forces, would feel freer to use nuclear weapons in a first strike. 15. Dash page 182. 
extension of the arms race to space has been a core program for some years. Race is a misleading term because the US is competing alone for the moment. Militarization of space, including such programs as ballistic missile defense, BMD, increases the danger of destruction for the US as for others. But that is nothing new. History provides many examples of policy choices that increase security threats consciously. More ominous is the fact that the choices make some sense within prevailing value systems. Both topics merit some thought. Consider a few crucial stages of the Cold War arms race. At mid-twentieth century, the main threat to U.S. security, then only a potential threat was intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs Russia might have accepted a treaty banning these delivery systems knowing that it was far behind in his authoritative history of the arms race McGeorge Bundy reports that he could find no record of any interest in pursuing this possibility.16 Recently released Russian archives yield some new understanding of these matters, though also leaving unresolved mysteries. The bitterly anti communist Soviet scholar Adam Malam observed. One such mystery is whether Stalin was serious in a March 1952 proposal that appeared to allow unification of Germany. As long as Germany did not join a military alliance directed against the Soviet Union, hardly an extreme condition a few years after Germany had, once again, virtually destroyed Russia, Washington wasted little effort in flatly rejecting Moscow's initiative, Erlam commented, on grounds that were embarrassingly unconvincing, leaving open the basic question, was Stalin genuinely ready to Sacrifice the newly created German Democratic Republic, GDR, on the altar of real democracy, with consequences for world peace that could have been enormous. Recent archival research surprised many scholars, Melvin Leffler writes, by revealing that after Stalin's death, Lavrenti Beria, the sinister, brutal head of the secret police, proposed that the Kremlin offer the West to deal on the unification and neutralization of Germany, apparently agreeing to sacrifice the East German communist regime to reduce east-west tensions and improve internal political and economic conditions in Russia, that such opportunities existed and were squandered in favor of securing German participation in NATO was strongly argued by the noted political analyst James Warburg Wright at the time, but the suggestion was ignored or ridiculed. 17. The archives do, however, shed light on other Soviet proposals that were quickly rejected in favor of a risk-filled military build-up. They revealed that after Stalin's death, Khrushchev called for mutual reduction of offensive military forces and, when these initiatives were ignored by the Eisenhower. Dash page 183. Administration, implemented the Mooney laterally over the objections of his own military command, in order to concentrate on economic growth. He believed that the U.S. was using the arms race to destroy the far weaker Soviet economy hoping by that means to obtain its gold even without war. Kennedy planners knew of Khrushchev's additional unilateral steps to reduce Soviet offensive forces radically, and were well aware that the U.S. was far ahead by any meaningful measure. Nevertheless, they chose to reject Khrushchev's call for reciprocity, preferring to carry out a massive conventional and nuclear build-up thus driving the last nail into the coffin of Khrushchev's agenda of restraining the Soviet military, Matthew Evangelista concludes, reviewing the archival records. 18. 
Kenneth Waltz observes that the U.S. in the early 1960s undertook the largest strategic and conventional peacetime military buildup the world has yet seen. Even as Khrushchev was trying at once to carry through a major reduction in conventional forces and to follow a strategy of minimum deterrence, and we did. So, even though the balance of strategic weapons greatly favored the United States, predictably eliciting a Soviet reaction, similar conclusions were drawn by the prominent strategic analysts Raymond Gartoff and William Kaufman, who observed these processes from inside U.S. intelligence and the Pentagon. 19. The reaction of the Soviet military to the U.S. buildup influenced also by the demonstration of Soviet weakness in the Cuban Missile Crisis, effectively terminated Khrushchev's reformist project. Had it proceeded, it might have averted the social and economic stagnation in Russia from the 1960s on, and expedited the desperately needed internal changes that Gorbachev tried to implement, though too late. It might also have prevented the human catastrophe of the 1990s, as well as the destruction of Afghanistan and many other atrocities, not to speak of the serious danger of nuclear disaster as the arms race reached even more eye-threatening dimensions. Throughout history, aggressive and provocative measures have been justified in terms of defense against merciless foes, in Kennedy's case defense against what he termed the monolithic and ruthless conspiracy dedicated to world conquest. That is another claim that carries little or no information, because it is so predictable, whatever the circumstances, whoever may be the source, to comprehend the underlying logic, it is well to recall a doctrinal truism, it is conventional for controversial initiatives particularly when hazardous, to be called defense. Current programs are no exception. Missile defense is only a small component of much more ambitious programs. Dash page 184. For militarization of space, with the intent to achieve a monopoly on the use of space for offensive military purposes, the plans have been available in public. Documents of the U.S. Space Command and other government agencies for some years. 20 The projects outlined have been under development with varying intensity since the Reagan administration proposed the Star Wars Strategic Defense Initiative programs. SDI appears to have been largely an effort to disarm BMD opponents by then a huge international anti nuclear popular movement, by stealing their language and cause, invoking the terms peace and disarmament, while proceeding to construct a more advanced offensive military system. 21 The SDI program was in clear violation of the anti-ballistic missile ABM treaty signed in 1972, according to Raymond Gartoff and others. The Reagan administration sought to suppress their objections. State Department. Legal advisor Judge Abraham Sophia even threatened legal action to block Gartoff from publishing his book on the topic, a book that, in Gartoff's words, refutes the flagrant efforts by Paul Nitz and other Reaganite enthusiasts for SDI to distort the historical record and undercut U.S. legal commitment. They were Later to claim that SDI was instrumental in ending the Cold War by forcing their USSR into heavy defense spending, a claim that has little merit, according to Gartoff's well-informed account. 22 a case can be made, however, that their Kennedy administration's rejection of opportunities for mutual reduction of armaments and its general aggressiveness and arms build-up, may have had such an effect, at great cost and with the threat of far worse. Missile defense and related initiatives were expanded in the first months of the 
Bush administration. By 9-11, U.S. military expenditures already surpassed those of the next 15 nations combined, with the opportunity to exploit the fear and horror engendered by the terrorist crimes was too tempting to ignore, and military programs were sharply increased across the board, with little, if any, relation to terror. BMD is widely recognized to be a Trojan horse for the real issue, the coming weaponization of space, with highly destructive offensive weapons placed in awe. Guided from space.23 BMD itself is an offensive weapon that is understood by close allies and also by potential adversaries. Canadian military planners advised their government that the goal of BMD is arguably more in order to preserve U.S. slash NATO freedom of action than because U.S. really fears a North Korean or Iranian threat. 24 China's top arms control official was revealing nothing new when he observed that once the United States believes it has both a strong spear and a strong shield, it could lead them to conclude that nobody can dash page 185 harm the United States and they can harm anyone they like anywhere in the world. China is well aware that it is a target of the radical nationalists designing policy in Washington, and presumably the prime intended recipient of the message in the national security strategy that no potential challenge to U.S. hegemony will be tolerated. Chinese authorities are also surely aware that the U.S. maintains the right of first use of nuclear weapons and they know as well as U.S. military analysts that flights by U.S. EP-3 planes near China, such as the one shot down in early 2001, engendering a mini-crisis, and not just for passive surveillance, the aircraft also collect information used to develop nuclear war plans. 25. China's interpretation of BMD is shared by U.S. strategic analysts, in virtually the same words, BMD is not simply a shield but an enabler of U.S. action, a RAND. Cooperation instead you observed. Others agree. BMD will facilitate the more effective application of U.S. military power abroad, Andrew Basevich writes in The Conservative National Interest by insulating the homeland from reprisal. Albeit in a limited way, missile defense will underwrite the capacity and willingness of the United States to shape the environment elsewhere, he cites. Approvingly the conclusion of Lawrence Kaplan in the liberal New Republic that missile defense isn't really meant to protect America. It's a tool for global dominance. In Kaplan's own words, Missile defense is not about defense, it's about offense. And that's exactly why we need it. 26 BMD will provide the U.S. with absolute freedom in using or threatening to use force in international relations, China's complaint, which Kaplan quotes you provingly. It will cement U.S. hegemony and make Americans masters of the world. The background assumption is the contemporary version of Wilsonian idealism, a doctrine taken to be so authoritative as to be virtually immune from challenge. America is the historical vanguard and must therefore maintain its global dominance and military supremacy forever and without challenge, for their benefit of all.27 it also follows that the absolute freedom in using or threatening to use force to be conferred on the U.S. by BMD is a precious gift we offer to mankind, who can fail to perceive the impeccable logic. It is well understood that BMD, even if technically feasible, must rely on satellite communication, and destroying satellites is far easier than shooting down missiles, anti-satellite weapons, banned by treaties that the Bush 
administration is dismantling are readily available even to lesser powers. This paradox of the BMD program has been prominently discussed. But there is a possible solution, at least in some imagined world. Advocates of BMD place their dash page 186. Faith in full spectrum dominance, such overwhelming control of space, and their world in general, that even the poor man's weapons will be of no use to an adversary that requires offensive space-based capacities, including immensely destructive weapons, death stars as they are sometimes called, possibly nuclear-powered, ready for launch with computer-controlled reaction. Such Weapons systems greatly increase the risk of vast slaughter and devastation, if only because of what are called in the trade normal accidents there. Unpredictable accidents to which complex systems are subject. 28. Plans dated a few weeks after the national security strategy was announced. Take space systems to be key to a nation's military effectiveness. The US must Proceed from control of space to ownership, which is to be permanent, in accord with the national security strategy. Ownership of space is to permit instant engagement anywhere in the world so that attacks from space can be integrated into combat plans. A viable prompt global strike capability, whether nuclear or non-nuclear will allow the U.S. to rapidly strike high payoff, difficult to defeat targets from standoff ranges and to provide war fighting commanders the ability to rapidly deny, delay, deceive, disrupt, destroy, exploit, and neutralize targets in hours slash minutes rather than so weeks slash days even when U.S. and allied forces have a limited forward presence. 29. These plans had already been outlined in a May 2002 classified Pentagon planning document, partially leaked, which called for a strategy of forward deterrence in which hypersonic missiles launched from space platforms would be able to carry out almost instant and warned attacks. Military analyst William Arkin comments that no target on the planet or in space would be immune to American attack. The United States could strike without warning whenever and wherever a threat was perceived, and it would be protected by missile defenses, as well as internal security measures. Hypersonic drones would monitor and disrupt targets. The new weapons systems would permit the U.S. to bomb selected enemies instantly from U.S. bases assisted by a host of advanced intelligence systems, including surveillance systems with the ability to track, record and analyze the movement of every vehicle in a foreign city, leaving their world at the mercy of U.S. attack at will, without warning or credible pretext, the operational significance of the term perceived threat. 30. The plans have no remote historical parallel. Even more fanciful ideas are being explored by the Pentagon's advanced research agency, DEPA, including technologies to interface brain and machine. Leading eventually, it is hoped, to brain-to-brain -to -brain communication. That may be. Dash page 187. The future of warfare, researchers argue, but meanwhile it follows DEPA's traditional commitment to advance R and D at the boundaries of understanding so as to create the basis for the economy of the future under the cover of defense. 31. The goals of militarization of space are far-reaching. The space commands. Clinton era brochure Vision Air for 2020 announced the primary goal prominently on the front cover dominating the space dimension of military operations to protect U.S. interests and investment. This is presented as the next phrase of their 
Historic task of military forces. Armies were needed during the westward. Expansion of the continental United States in self-defense. Nations also built. Navies. The Space Command continues to protect and enhance their commercial interests. The next logical step is space forces to protect U.S. national interests, military and commercial, and investments, including missile defense, as well as space-based strike weapons enabling the application of precision force from, to, and through space. U.S. space forces, however, will be unlike navies in earlier eras. This time there will be a sole hegemon. The British Navy could be counted by Germany, with consequences we need not discuss. But the US will remain immune, except to the development of WMD by rogue elements, and the narrowly circumscribed category of terrorism that is permitted to enter the canon, their terrorism against us and our clients. The need for full-spectrum dominance will increase as a result of the globalization of the world economy, the Space Command explains. The reason is that globalization is expected to bring about a widening between haves and have-nots. Like the National Intelligence Council, 32 military planners recognize that the widening economic divide that they too anticipate, with its deepening Economic stagnation, political instability, and cultural alienation will lead to unrest and violence among the have-nots, much of it directed against the U.S. That provides a further rationale for expanding offensive military capacities into space. Monopolizing this domain of warfare, the U.S. must be ready to control Disorder by using space systems and planning for precision strike from space, as a counter to the worldwide proliferation of WMD by unruly elements, a likely consequence of the recommended programs, just as the widening divide is an anticipated consequence of the preferred form of globalization. The Space Command could have usefully extended its analogy to the military forces of earlier years. These have played a prominent role in technological and industrial development throughout the modern era. That includes major advances in metallurgy, electronics, machine tools, and manufacturing processes. Dash page 188. Including the American system of mass production that astounded 19th century competitors and set the stage for the automotive industry and other manufacturing achievements, based on many years of investment, R&D, and experience in weapons production within U.S. army arsenals. There was a qualitative leap forward after World War II, this time primarily in the U.S., as there military provided a cover for creation of the core of the modern high-tech economy, computers and electronics. Generally, telecommunications and the internet, automation, lasers, the commercial aviation industry, and much else, now extending to nanotechnology, biotechnology, neuroengineering, and other new frontiers. Economic historians have pointed out that the technical problems of naval armament a century ago were roughly comparable to manufacture of space vehicles, and the enormous impact on the civilian economy might be duplicated as well, enhanced by the space militarization projects. One effect of incorporating national security exemptions in the mislabeled Free trade agreements is that the leading industrial societies, primarily the U.S., can maintain the state sector on which the economy substantially relies to socialize cost and risk while privatizing profit. Others understand this as well, retreating from his earlier critical stance. Regarding BMD, German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder observed that Germany 
has a vital economic interest in developing missile defense technology and must be sure it is not excluded from technological and scientific work in the field. Participation in BMD programs is expected to strengthen the domestic industrial base generally in Europe. Similarly, the US BMD organization advised Japanese officials in 1995 that theater missile defense is the last military business opportunity for this century. Japan is being drawn in not only to exploit its manufacturing expertise but also to deepen the commitment of the industrial world to the militarization of space, locking the programs in to borrow a standard phrase of policy makers and analysts. 33. Throughout history it has been recognized that such steps are dangerous. By now the danger has reached the level of a threat to human survival. But as observed earlier, it is rational to proceed nonetheless on the assumptions of their prevailing value system, which are deeply rooted in existing institutions. The basic principle is that hegemony is more important than survival. Hardly novel. The principle has been amply illustrated in the past half century. For such reasons, the U.S. had refused to join the rest of the world in reaffirming and strengthening the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 to reserve space for peaceful. Dash page 189. Purposes. The concern for such action, articulated in UN resolutions calling for prevention of an arms race in outer space, is motivated by widespread recognition that Washington intends to breach this barrier, so far maintained. The U.S. was joined in its abstention in 1999 by Israel, in 2000 by Micronesia as well. As noted earlier, immediately after it was learned that the world had barely been saved from a war that might have destroyed the Northern Hemisphere. The Bush administration effectively vetoed yet another international effort to prevent the militarization of space. For the same reasons, Washington blocked negotiations at the UN Conference on Disarmament during the sessions that opened in January 2001, rejecting the call of Secretary General Kofi Annan that Member states overcome their lack of political will and work toward a comprehensive accord to bar militarization of space. The U.S. remains the only one of the 66 member states to oppose launching formal negotiations on outer space, Reuters reported in February. In June, China again called for banning of weapons in outer space but the U.S. again blocked negotiations. 34. Again, that makes good sense if hegemony, with its short-term benefits to elite interests, is ranked above survival in the scale of operative values, in accord with the historical standard for dominant states and other systems of concentrated power. Much the same can be said about the breakdown of efforts to ban chemical and biological weapons. That they pose significant threats is not seriously in doubt, but higher priorities stand in the way of banning them. In April 2001, arms control experts reported that international verification of the ban on chemical weapons would have to be sharply curtailed because the United States and other key parties to the treaty, mentioning Russia, have not paid their way. A specialist at the Henry Stimson Center in Washington commented that the Clinton administration had made a mockery of the treaty by establishing a separate set of rules for the United States, with unilateral exemptions. The U.S. was the only country to insist on exemption from certain inspections and tests. When the Senate ratified the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1997, the Bush administration decided to withdraw from negotiations to institute verification 
measures for the 1972 Biological and Toxic Weapons Convention, effectively terminating them. The U.S. had previously worked to limit the scope of the visits by foreign inspectors in order to protect American pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, which dominate the worldwide industry and are concerned with protecting their trade secrets. The Bush administration proceeded to reject any form of verification on the dash page 190 grounds that mechanisms would be ineffective and would simply raise the risk to legitimate United States activities, a position condemned as completely unacceptable by a senior European diplomat. Shortly after, other likely motives surfaced beyond protecting U.S. corporate interests when it was revealed that there U.S. has three clandestine defensive projects that mimic a complete bioweapons program, violating the spirit and perhaps the letter of the verification protocols that the U.S. later officially rejected, even before Washington had argued that access to American biodefense installations might reveal military secrets which is the purpose of enforcement mechanisms.35. Bioweapons specialists express concerns that the U.S. may have rejected the Bioweapons Protocol because it is committed to continuing and expanding its secret programs in violation of treaties, pointing out that Washington appears to have had no interest in developing a protocol acceptable to the pharmaceutical industry. Among the suspected plans is genetic engineering of vaccine-resistant anthrax, which the Russians may already have developed. The U.S. appears to have embarked on a largely classified study across several agencies of biotech. Applications for the development of new bioweapons, apparently ignoring treaties. Therefore the rest of the world will be obliged to follow suit perhaps sparking a global bioweapons arms race. Proliferation of these technologies would also dramatically increase the chances that terrorists would become capable of mass casualty attacks using chemical or bioweapons, a threat also discussed in the 2002 Hart Redmond Report on Terrorist Threats to the United States. 36. The Bush administration also announced that it no longer supports some of the Article V conclusions of the 1970 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty NPT, the major international agreement on control of nuclear weapons, which has had some success, though far from complete. In particular, the five major nuclear powers have not abided by their commitments. Article V is the primary element of the NPT applying to the nuclear powers. It commits them to negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament. The Bush administration went on to declare its opposition to the ABM Treaty, since revoked, and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It also undermined the first UN conference attempting to control the lethal international black market in small arms, while Bush point man John Bolton informed the conference that the US opposed the promotion of international advocacy activity by international or non-governmental organizations. 37. It is not difficult to detect the underlying logic or to perceive their Dash page 191. Likely consequences. As it announced its imperial grand strategy in September 2002, the Bush administration moved to undermine continuing efforts to add enforcement mechanisms to the Biological Weapons Convention against germ warfare, preventing any further discussions for four years, and shortly after effectively barred reaffirmation of the 1925 Geneva Protocol prohibiting the use of 
poisonous gases and bacteriological methods of warfare. 38. To move to another domain, the Bush administration has been widely criticized for undermining the Kyoto Protocol on grounds that to conform would harm the U.S. economy. The criticisms are in a sense odd, because the decision is not irrational within the framework of existing ideology. We are instructed daily to be firm believers in neoclassical markets, in which isolated individuals are rational wealth maximizers. If distortions are eliminated, the market should respond perfectly to their votes, expressed in dollars or some counterpart. The value of a person's interests is measured the same way. In particular, the interests of those with no votes are valued at zero. Future generations, for example, it is therefore rational to destroy the possibility for decent survival for our grandchildren. If by so doing we can maximize our own wealth, which means a particular perception of self-interest constructed by vast industries devoted to implanting and reinforcing it. The threats to survival are currently being enhanced by dedicated efforts not only to weaken the institutional structures that have been developed to mitigate the harsh consequences of market fundamentalism, but also to undermine the culture of sympathy and solidarity that sustains these institutions. All of this is another prescription for disaster, perhaps in the not very distant future. But again, it has a certain rationality within prevailing structures of doctrine and institutions. It would be a great error to conclude that the prospects are uniformly bleak. Far from it, one very promising development is the slow evolution of a human rights culture among the general population, a tendency that accelerated in the 1960s when popular activism has a notable civilizing effect in many domains, extending significantly in the years that followed. One encouraging feature has been a greatly heightened concern for civil and human rights, including rights of minorities, women, and future generations, the latter the driving concern of the environmental movement, which has become a powerful force. For the first time in American history, there was some willingness to look honestly at the conquest of the national territory and the fate of its inhabitants. The Solidarity Movements Dash Page 192 That developed in mainstream America in the 1980s, concerning Central America. In particular, broke new ground in the history of imperialism, never before had. Substantial numbers of people from the Imperial Society gone to live with their victims of vicious attack to help them and offer some measure of protection. The international solidarity organizations that evolved from these roots now function very effectively in many parts of the world, arousing fear and anger in repressive states and sometimes exposing participants to serious danger even death.39 there. Global justice movements that have since taken shape, meeting at the World Social Forum annually, are an entirely new and unprecedented phenomenon in character and scale. The planet's second superpower, which could no longer be ignored in early 2003, has deep roots in these developments, and considerable promise. Over the course of modern history, there have been significant gains in human rights and democratic control of some sectors of life. These have rarely been their gift of enlightened leaders. They have typically been imposed on states and other power centers by popular struggle. An optimist might hold, perhaps realistically, that history reveals a deepening appreciation for human rights as well as a broadening of their range, not without sharp reversals, but the general tendency seems real. The issues are very much alive today.
the harmful effects of the corporate globalization project have led to mass popular protest and activism in the South, later joined by major sectors of the rich industrial societies, hence becoming harder to ignore. For the first time, concrete alliances have been taking shape at the grassroots level. These are impressive developments, rich in opportunity, and they have had effects in rhetorical and sometimes policy changes. There has been at least a restraining influence on state violence, though. Nothing like the human rights revolution in state practice that has been proclaimed by intellectual opinion in the West. These various developments could prove very important if momentum can be sustained in ways that deepen the emerging global bonds of sympathy and solidarity. It is fair to say, I think, that the future of our endangered species may be determined in no small measure by how these popular forces evolve. One can discern two trajectories in current history, one aiming toward hegemony, acting rationally within a lunatic doctrinal framework as it threatens survival, the other dedicated to the belief that another world is possible, in the words that animate the World Social Forum, challenging the reigning ideological system and seeking to create constructive alternatives of thought, action, and institutions. Which trajectory will dominate, no one can foretell. The pattern is. Dash page 193. Familiar throughout history, a crucial difference today is that the stakes are far higher. Bertrand Russell once expressed some somber thoughts about world peace. After ages during which the earth produced harmless trilobites and butterflies, evolution progressed to the point at which it has generated Nero's, Genghis Khan's, and Hitler's. This, however, I believe is a passing nightmare. In time the earth will become again incapable of supporting life, and peace will. 40. Return. No doubt the projection is accurate on some dimension beyond a realistic contemplation. What matters is whether we can awaken ourselves from their nightmare before it becomes all-consuming, and bring a measure of peace and justice and hope to the world that is, right now, within the reach of our opportunity and our will. Dash page 194 Research Notes Notes to Chapter 1 One Ernst Mayer, come said he succeed? Not likely. Bioastronomy News 7, Number 3, 1995. Online. At www.hcc.hawaii.edu/tildebine/mayer.htm. To Donald Kennedy, The Climate Divide, Science 299. Number 5614, 2003, p. 1813. 3 Howard Lane Franchi, at the UN, It's Not Just About Iraq, Christian Science Monitor, 30. October 2002, p. 1. 4 Patrick E. Tyler, A New Power in the Streets, New York Times, the 17th of February 2003, seconds a. P. 1. 5 for sources on Wilsonian idealism and 17th century, see my deterring democracy. London and New York, Verso, 1991, Extended Edition, New York, Hill and Wang, 1992. Chapter 12, and my professor it over people, neoliberalism and global order, New York, Seven Stories. Press. 1999, Chapter 2. For a more extensive discussion and contemporary scholarly sources, see. My Consent Without Consent, Reflections on the Theory and Practice of Democracy, Cleveland. State Law Review 44, Number 4, 1996, pages 415-37. Minor Changes, Punctuation, etc.
are introduced. Here for ease of reading. Six cited by David S. Bolsong, America's Secret War Against Bolshevism, U.S. Intervention in The Russian Civil War, 1917-1920, Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina Press, 1995, p. 28. 7. Andrew J. Basevich, American Empire, The Realities and Consequences of U.S. Diplomacy. Cambridge, Harvard University Press, 2003, pp. 200 ff. 8. Michelle Crozier, Samuel P. Huntington, and Joe G. Watamuki, The Crisis of Democracy, Report. On the Governability of Democracies to the Trilateral Commission, New York. New York University. Press, 1975. 9. Randall Marlin, Propaganda and the Ethics of Persuasion, Peterborough, Ont, and Orchard. Park, NY, Broadview Press, 2002. 10. For discussion of this vast disinformation campaign, see My Culture of Terrorism, Boston. South End Press, 1988, and My Necessary Illusions. Thought Control and Democratic Societies. Boston, South End Press, 1989, which draw particularly on the important but mostly neglected. Exposes by Alfonso Chardi of the Miami Herald and later official sources. 11. On the narrow limits of permitted discussion, see my necessary illusions, op. sit. Bookcase. Studies over a wider range. C. Edward S. Herman and Noam Chomsky, Manufacturing Consent. The Political Economy of the Mass Media, Updated Ed. New York, Pantheon Books, 2002. 12. Latin American Documentation, Torture in Latin America, Lima, Peru, Ladakh, 1987. Julio Godoy, The Nation 250, Number 9. The 5th of March 1990, p. 310. Dash page 195. 13. Juan Hernandez Pico, in Vio, Managua, Nicaragua, March 1994. Journal online at www.invio.org.net. Notes to Chapter 2. 1. White House. The National Security Strategy of the United States of America, 17 September 2002. www.whitehouse.gov slash nsc slash nss dot html. 2G. John McHenry, America's Imperial Ambition, Foreign Affairs 81, No. 5. September to October 2002, pp. 44 FF. 3. On this crucial distinction, see Carl Kaysen et al. War with Iraq, Costs, Consequences, and Alternatives, Cambridge, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Committee on International Security Studies, 2002. Online at www.amica.org slash publications slash monographs. War underscore with underscore Iraq dot pdf. For Stephen R. Wiseman, preemption, idea with a lineage whose time has come, new. York Times, Sunday, the 23rd of March 2003, seconds, b, p, 1. 5. Arthur Schlesinger Jr., good foreign policy, a casualty of war, Los Angeles Times. Sunday, the 23rd of March 2003, seconds M, P, 1. 6. Richard Falk, Resisting the Global Domination Project, Interview with Zia Mayanand. Smitu Kothari, Frontline, India, 20, No. 8, 12 April 2003. Online at www.flunit.com slash fl2008 slash slash 20030425004020023.htm 7. Michael J. Glennon, Why the Security Council Failed, Foreign Affairs 82, 
No. 3 May. June 2003. pp. 16. FF. Online at www.forignaffairs.org slash 20030501 Fesse 11217 slash Michael J. Glennon slash Why the Security Council Failed. HTML and the new interventionism, the search for a just international law, foreign affairs 78, number 3, May to June 1999, pp. 2 ff. 8 Dana Milbank, Bush remarks confirm shift in justification for war, Washington Post. The 1st of June 2003, seconds a, p. 18. Guyden Moore, James Harding, and Kathy Newman, Iraqi arms finds. Not likely, says U.S. official, Financial Times, London, the 3rd of May 2003, seconds 1, p. 1. 9. D. Nixon, Proceedings of the American Society of International Law, knows. 13 and 14. 1963. Abraham D. Sophia, The United States and the World Court, U.S. Department of State. Current Policy. Number 769, December 1985. Ixon was referring specifically to U.S. economic war. But he surely knew about the international terrorism. 10. Bill Clinton, Address to the United Nations, 27 September 1993. Secretary of Defense. William S. Cohen, Report of the Quadrennial Defense Review, Washington, D.C., U.S. Government. Printing Office, May 1997, Section 3, Defense Strategy. Online at www.defenselink.milweblink slash qdr slash sec3.html. See also William S. Cohen, Annual Report to The President and Congress, Washington, D.C., U.S. Government Printing Office, 1999. Online at www.defenselink.milweblink slash edge 1999 slash chap 1.html 11 Memorandum of the War and Peace Studies Project of the Council on Foreign Relations With State Department Participation, the 19th of October 1940, Lawrence H. Shoup and William Minter Imperial Brain Trust the Council on Foreign Relations and United States Foreign Policy, New York. Dash page 196. Monthly Review Press, 1977, pp. 130 ff. 12. C. Basevish, American Empire, op. sit, for unusually strong claims in this regard. 13. George W. Bush, State of the Union Address. Transcribed in the New York Times, 29. January 2003, seconds a, p. 12. 14. Condoleezza to Rice, interview by Wolf Blitzer, late edition, CNN, 8 September 2002. Online at www.cnn.com slash 2002 slash politics slash 09 slash 08 slash Iraq dot debate slash Scott Peterson In War, Some Facts Less Factual, Christian Science Monitor, 6 September 2002, World Section P. 1. The 1990 claims, based on alleged satellite images, were investigated by the Street Petersburg, Florida, Times. Experts who analyzed photos from commercial satellites found nothing. Inquiries were rebuffed, and still are. For independent confirmation, see Peter D. Zimmerman, The Bush. Deceit, Washington Post, the 14th of August 2003, seconds a, p. 19. 15 Christian Science Monitor Tip Poll, Howard LaFranchi, for Bush, Raising Bar on Iraq. War, Christian Science Monitor, 14 January 2003, USA Section, P. 1. Linda Feldman, The 
impact of Bush linking 9-11 and Iraq, Christian Science Monitor, 14 March 2003, USA Section. P. 2. Jim Rutenberg and Robin Toner, critics of Iraq war say lack of scrutiny helped. Administration to press its case, New York Times, the 22nd of March 2003, seconds B. P. 10. 16. Edward Alden, Americans leave Vietnam syndrome behind to rally behind. President, Financial Times, London. The 21st of March 2003, War in Iraq Section, P. 2. Annette Oliver, A. Trap of Their Own Making, London Review of Books 25, No. 9, 8 May 2003. Online at www.sape.org slash file slash publications slash 2003 P equals 40 and from equals pub date. 17 Elizabeth B. Miller, Cold Truths Behind Pomp, New York Times, the 2nd of May 2003, seconds A. P. 1. Transcript of President Bush's remarks on the end of major combat in Iraq, New York Times, the 2nd of May 2003, seconds A. P. 16. 18 Jason Burke, Focus, The Return of Terror, Observer, London, Sunday, the 18th of May 2003, p. 17. 19 News Release, Program on International Policy Attitudes, College Park, University of Maryland, the 4th of June 2003. Online at www.peeper.org slash publish.html 20 Gene Cummings and Greg Height, Bush says war ending, looks to 04, Wall Street. Journal, 2 May 2003, seconds A, P. 4. Francis X. Kleins, Karl Rove's campaign strategy seems evident, it's the terror, stupid, New York Times. The 10th of May 2003, seconds A, P. 20, Rove's Emphasis. 21, David E. Sanja and Stephen R. Wiseman, Bush's aides envision new influence in region, New York Times, the 10th of April 2003, seconds B, P. 11, Roger Owen, War by Example, Alaram. Weekly. The 3rd of April 2003. Online at weekly.ram.org.x slash 2003 slash 632 slash shop 57.htm. 22 War in Iraq. How the die was cast before transatlantic diplomacy failed. Comment. And analysis. Financial Times. London. The 27th of May 2003. P. 15. 23 International Court of Justice, ICJ, Corfu Channel Case, Merits, Judgment of 9 April 1949, p. 35. Dash page 197. 24 C. My New Military Humanism, Lessons F from Kosovo, Monroe, Maine, Common Courage. Press, 1999. 25. See my new generation draws the line, Kosovo, East Timor, and the standards of the West. London and New York, Verso, 2000, pp. 4ff. Statement by Non-Aligned Movement, Kuala. Lump, 25 February 2003, BBC World Monitoring, 26 February 2003. Online at www.and.int slash Malaysia slash Nam slash Styrak dot html 26 area Dian, one day in five, the IDF attempts assassination, Harits, 21 May 2003 27 Amiran, who's the boss? Harits, the 29th of November 2002
28. Suzanne Nossil, Battle Hymn of the Democrats, Fletcher Forum of World Affairs 27, No. 1. Winter Spring 2003, pages 71 to 82. Online at fletcher.tufts.edu slash forum slash winter percent 2020-03 slash nosifa dot pdf 29 Richard Wilson, a visit to the bombed nuclear reactor at Juwaita, Iraq, Nature 302. No. 5907, 31 March 6 April 1983, pages 373 to 76. Michael Jansen, Middle East International 691, 10. January 2003. Imad Kadouri, Uncritical Mass, Memoirs, Manuscript, 2003. Scott D. Sagan and Kenneth N. Waltz, The Spread of Nuclear Weapons, A Debate, New York, W. W. Norton, 1995, pp. 18 to 19. 13 Neely Tucker, detainees seek access to courts. Washington Post, the 3rd of December 2002, seconds. A. P. 22. Neil A. Lewis, detention upheld in combatant case. New York Times, 9 January 2003, seconds. A. P. 1. 31 Ned Volumey. Red Cross denied access to Po W.S. Observer, London, Sunday, the 25th of May, 2003, p. 20. 32 CP. 200 of hegemony or survival. 33 Jack M. Borgine, a dreadful act 2. Secret proposals in Ashcroft's anti-terror war strike. Yet another blow at fundamental rights. Los Angeles Times, 13 February 2003, seconds B. P. 23. Nat Hentoff, Revenge of the Patriot Act, Progressive 67, Number 4, April 2003, P. 11. 34. Winston Churchill cited by A. W. Brian Simpson, Human Rights and the End of Empire. Britain and the Genesis of the European Convention. Oxford and New York, Oxford University. Press, 2001, p. 55. 35 Kaysen et al., War with Iraq, op. Sit. Michael Greppen, Dominator's Rule, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists 59, Number 1, January to February 2003, pages 55 to 60. 36 John Steinbrunner and Jeffrey Lewis, The Unsettled Legacy of the Cold War, Deedless. 131, Number 4, Fall 2002, pages 5 to 10. 37 C. My Year 501, The Conquest Continues, Boston, South End Press, 1993, Chapter 1. 38 James Morgan. Rip Van Winkle's New World Order, Financial Times, London, 25. April 1992, p. 1. Referring to G7, the IMF, GATT, and other institutions of the New Imperial. Dash page 198. Age. Guy de John Queers, Power Elite at Davos set to vie with protesters for attention. Financial Times. London, International Economy Section, p. 14. Fukuyama cited by Mark Curtis. The Ambiguities of Power, British Foreign Policy Since 1945, London and Atlantic Highlands, N.J. Z. Books, 1995, p. 183. 39 Bush and Baker cited by Sam Husseini. Why so long for Iraq to comply? Counterpunch, the 8th of March 2003. Online at www.counterpunch.org slash hasaini 0308203.html. Dilip Hyro, Iraq, in the eye of the storm, New York, 
Thunders Mouth Press slash Nation Books, 2002. pp. 102 ff. 40. Edward C. Luck, Making the World Safe for Hypocrisy, New York Times, 22 March. 2003. Seconds A. P. 11. 41. Elizabeth B. Miller and Carl House, Bush will use Congress vote to press UN, New York Times, the 12th of October 2002, seconds A. P. 1. Colin Powell cited by Julia Preston, U.S. said to offer France final compromise to end Iraq resolution impasse, New York Times, 18 October 2002, seconds A. P. 10. David E. Sanja with Julia Preston, President warns Hussein to heed a call to disarm, New York Times, the 8th of November 2002, seconds A. P. 1. Andrew Card cited in Doug Saunders. With reports from Associated Press, App, and Reuters, Iraq seen as likely to accept. Resolution, Toronto Globe and Mail. The 11th of November 2002, seconds A, P. 8. 42 Mark Döner and Ruler Khalif, Powell not lobbying for second resolution. Financial Times, London, the 5th of February 2003, P. 9. 43 David E. Sanja and Warren Hogue, Bush and two allies seem set for war to depose. Hussein. New York Times, the 17th of March 2003, seconds A, P. 1. Michael R. Gordon, allies will move in. Even if Saddam Hussein moves out, New York Times, the 18th of March 2003, seconds A, P. 16. 44 excerpts from Bush's news conference on Iraq and likelihood of war, New York Times. 7 March 2003, seconds A, P. 12. Felicity Barringer and David E. Sanja, U.S. says Hussein. Must cede power to head off war, New York Times, the 1st of March 2003, seconds A, P. 1. 45 Alison Mitchell and David E. Sanja, Bush to put case for action in Iraq to key. Lawmakers, New York Times, 4 September 2002, seconds A, P. 1. Fleischer cited by Christopher Adams and Mac Hubent, U.S. engineers draw another blank over suspected weapons site. Financial Times, London, 12 April 2003, War in Iraq section, P. 5. Jack Straw cited by David E. Sanja with Felicity Barringer, President Reddy's U.S. for Prospect of Imminent War, New York Times, the 7th of March, 2003, seconds A, P. 1. 46. In Powell's words, Saddam Hussein remains guilty, New York Times, 6 March, 2003, seconds A, P. 17. Stephen R. Wiseman. U.S. lists three Chechen groups as terrorist and freezes assets. New York Times, the 1st of March 2003, seconds A, P. 11. 47. Condoleez to Rice, Campaign 2000, Promoting the National Interest, Foreign Affairs 79. No. 1. January to February 2000, pp. 45 ff. Cited by John J. Mearsheimer and Stephen M. Walt. An Unnecessary War, Foreign Policy 134, January to February 2003, pages 50 to 59. Online at www.foreignpolicy.com slash issue underscore Jan Feb underscore 2003 slash Waltz.html. Note that 9-11 had no effect on these risk assessments. 48 Daphne Linzer, app, backers of US hope for payoff, Boston Globe, 
the 24th of February 2003. Dash page 199. 49. Guy Dinmore and Mac Turner, U.S. uses economic muscle to persuade waverers to say yes, Financial Times, London, the 12th of February 2003, p. 6. Gene Cummings and Robert Block. U.S. bids against France for votes in UN, Wall Street Journal, the 26th of February 2003, seconds A, P. 4. 50 Gen Vabdo, U.S. offers incentives for backing on Iraq, Boston Globe, 13 February 2003, seconds A, P. 1. Eric Lichtblau, charity leader accepts a deal in a terror case, New York. Times, the 11th of February 2003, seconds A, P. 1. 51 Richard Bowdrix and John Hendren, U.S. drops its bid to base troops in Turkey. Los Angeles Times, the 15th of March 2003, seconds 1, P. 5. 52 Neil King Jr. and Jess Bravin, U.S. may spur new and Iraq sanctions. Wall Street Journal. The 5th of May 2003, seconds A, P. 3. For U.S. attitudes quoted here, see poll by the Programme on International. Policy Attitudes, College Park, University of Maryland, 29 April 2003, Americans on. America's role in the world after the Iraq War, a paper slash knowledge networks poll. Online at www.peeper.org slash online reports slash post war Iraq slash report underscore April 29.pdf. For Iraqi attitudes, see Susanna Sirkin, Baghdad bombing, what should we do now? New York Times, 21 August 2003, seconds A, P. 24. Sirkin. Deputy Director of Physicians for Human Rights, PHR, cites a PHR poll finding that more than 85% wanted the UN to play their lead role. Poll findings online at www.frusa.org slash research slash Iraq slash release underscore 091803.html a later Gallup poll found that Baghdad residents held France and its president Jack Chirac. In higher regard than Bush or Blair, favorability rating was Chirac 42%, Bush 29%, Blair 20%. See Patrick E. Tyler. In a poll, Baghdad residents call freedom worth the price. New York Times, 24 September 2003. Seconds A, P. 16. The clear implication. Unstated, is that although they were naturally delighted to be rid of Saddam Hussein and their murderous sanctions regime, unmentioned, they continued to oppose the invasion. 53 G. John Nakembri, America's Imperial Ambition, Op. Sit. Annette Ulven, The Push for War, London Review of Books 24. No. 19, 3 October 2002. Online at www.lrb.co.uk slash v24 slash n19 slash le4 one underscore dot html. 54 Samuel P. Huntington, The Lonely Superpower, Foreign Affairs 78, Number 2, March to April. 1999, pp. 35 FF. Robert Jervis, Weapons Without Purpose. Nuclear Strategy in the Post Cold War Era, Foreign Affairs 80, No. 4, July to August 2001, pp. 143 FF. Jervis Online at www.forignaffairs.org slash 20010701 Fairview USA 5002 slash Robert Jervis slash weapons without purpose nuclear strategy in the post Cold War era.html
55 Kenneth Waltz in Ken Booth in the Tempton, Ads, Worlds in Collision, Terror and There. Future of Global Order, New York, Palgrave Macmillan, 2002. Stephen Miller in Case in et al. War. With Iraq, Op. Set. Jack Snyder, Imperial Temptations, National Interest, Number 71, Spring 2003, pp. 29-40. Salagas. Harrison, Interview by Felicia R. Lee, Q and Day, Finding a Way Out with North. Korea, New York Times, the 7th of June 2003, seconds B, P. 11. 56. Bernard B. Fall, Last Reflections on the War, Garden City, N.Y., Doubleday, 1967. 57. C. My For Reasons of State, New York, Pantheon Books, 1973, New Press 2003, p. 25. 4. A review of the final material in the Pentagon Papers, which ends at this point. Dash page 200. 58. Maureen Dowd, Bush Moves to Control Wars Endgame, New York Times, the 23rd of February. 1991, seconds 1, p. 1. 59. World Economic Forum, Declining Public Dressed Foremost to Leadership Problem. News Release, World Economic Forum, Geneva, Switzerland, 14 January 2003. Online at www.weforum.org slash site slash home public dot nsf slash content slash declining plus public plus trust plus foremost plus a plus leadership plus problem guide John queers US leaders score 27 percent in global dressed poll financial times London the 15th of January 2003 International Economy and the Americas Section, p. 3. 60. Alan Cowell, World Forum, back at Davos, faces tough economic skiing, New York. Times, the 23rd of January 2003, seconds a, p. 3. Mark Landler, U.S. role in the world dominates economic. Talks as Brazilian clamors to be heard, New York Times. 24 January 2003, seconds A, P. 8. Mark. Champion, David Cloud, and Carla and Robbins, tough message, at Davos, Powell pushes. Back against resistance over Iraq, Wall Street Journal, the 27th of January 2003, seconds A, P. 1. 61 Powell on Iraq, op. Set. 62 Kaysen et al. War with Iraq. Op. Set. 63 Hans von Sponek. Go on. Call Bush's bluff. Guardian. London. The 22nd of July 2002. Leader. P. 13. 64 Ken Warren. Canada fears biggest risk to world peace on its doorstep. Financial. Times. London. The 21st of January 2003, America's Section, P. 2. For International Polls, see Chapter 5 of Hegemony or Survival. 65 Glenn Kessler and Mike Allen, The Greater Threat. Around the Globe, People See. Bush, Not Hussein, As the Real Enemy, Washington Post, National Weekly Edition, March 3rd. 9. 2003. Cover story. For Isaac area, The Arrogant Empire, Newsweek 141, No. 12, 24 March. 2003, pp. 19, FF, US edition, cover story. Online at www.feedsacaria.com slash articles slash newsweek slash 032403.html 66 C Chapter 1, Note 6, Op. Sit. Woodrow Wilson, Democracy and Efficiency, Atlantic. Monthly 87, Number 521, 
March 1901, pages 289 to 99, cited by Idoan, our enemies and U.S. America S. Rivalries and the Making of Political Science, Ithaca, N.Y., Cornell University Press, 2003, p. 42. Wilson online at cdl.library.cornell.edu slash gibbin slash mo slash mokgi. Note is it equals ab 2934-0087-44-67 Basevish, American Empire, op. sit, pp. 215 ff. His emphasis. 68 John Stuart Mill, cp. 44-45 of hegemony or survival. Britain's attitude toward their nobility of its successor was a bit different, cp. 149 of hegemony or survival. 69 Andrew J. Basevish, Culture, Globalization, and U.S. Foreign Policy, Review of Many Globalizations, Cultural Diversity in the Contemporary World, edited by Peter L. Berger and Samuel P. Huntington, and Culture Matters. How Values Shape Human Progress, edited by Lawrence E. Harrison and Samuel P. Huntington, World Policy Journal 19, No. 3, Fall 2002, pages 77-82. Online at www.worldpolicy.org slash journal slash articles slash wpj023 slash html Dash page 201. 70 Michael J. Glennon, Terrorism and Intentional Ignorance, Christian Science Monitor. The 20th of March 1986, p. 18. 71 Sebastian Malaby, Uneasy Partners, Review of the Clash, A History of U.S. Japan. Relations, by Walter Lafeber, and Altered States. United States and Japan since the occupation. By Michael Schaller, New York Times, 21 September 1997, Seconds 7, Book Review, p. 34. Michael Mandelbaum, The Ideas That Conquered the World, Peace, Democracy, and Free Markets in Their 21st Century, New York, Public Affairs, 2002, p. 95. Senior Administration Policymaker. Cited by Thomas Self Friedman, A New U.S. Problem, Freely Elected Tyrants, New York Times. The 12th of January 1992, Seconds 4, p. 3. 72 Max Boot, A War for Oil? Not This Time, New York Times. The 13th of February 2003, Seconds A. P. 41. Robert Gagan, Politicians with Guts, Washington Post, National Weekly Edition, 10. February 2003, Washington Post, the 31st of January 2003, Seconds A. P. 27. 73. On Millet's essay and the circumstances in which it was written, see my peering into there. Abyss of the Future, New Delhi. Institute of Social Sciences, 2002. Britain's Crimes in Injun and China shocked many Englishmen, including classical liberals like Richard Cobden. See Chapter 7, Note 52, of Hegemony or Survival. 74. Andre Alleghetal, La Guerre d'Algerie, Paris, Temps Actuals, 1981, cited in Yusuf. Bedjami. Abbasawa, and Mazianate Labi, eds, an inquiry into the Algerian massacres. Geneva, Switzerland, Hogger, 1999. 75 Walter Lane Feber, Inevitable Revolutions, the United States in Central America, New York. Norton, 1983, pp. 50 ff, 75 ff. 76 Muhammad Mamoud Mohamedou. Iraq and the Second Gulf War, State Building and Regime Security, San Francisco, 
Austin and Winfield, 1998, p. 123. 77. David F. Schmitz. Thank God they re on their side, the United States and right wing. Dictatorships, 1921 to 1965, Chapel Hill, NC, University of North Carolina Press, 1999, Japan. Envisions a New Order in Asia, 1938, reprinted in Dennis Merrill and Thomas G. Patterson. Eds, Major Problems in American Foreign Relations, Documents and Essays, Volume 2, Since 1914, 5th. Ed. Boston, Houghton Mifflin, 2000. 78 Soviet Lawyers, C. Sean D. Murphy, Humanitarian Intervention, the United Nations in an Evolving World Order, Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania Press, 1996. Kennedy. Administration, C. My Rethinking Camelot, JFK, The Vietnam War, and U.S. Political Culture. Boston, South End Press, 1993. 79 Ivan Maisky cited in a Vladimir O. Pechetnov, Pechetnov's interpretation of Ivan Maisky's report, excerpts of Cold War International History Project Working Paper Series, No. 13, The Big Three of Two World War II, New Documents on Soviet Thinking About Post-War Relations. With the United States and Great Britain, Washington. D.C., Woodrow Wilson International Center. For Scholars, May 1995. Online at wix.c.edu slash topics slash pubs slash act17f.pdf. 80 cited by Lane Feber, Inevitable Revolutions, Op. Sit. Robert W. Tucker, Oil, The Issue of. American Intervention, Commentary 59. Number 1, January 1975, pages 21 to 31. Dash page 202. 81 cited by Mexican historian Jose Fuentes Mez in Cecil Robinson, ed. and Trans, the viewer from Chapultepec, Mexican writers on the Mexican-American War, Tucson, University of Arizona Press, 1989, p. 160. 82 cited by William Stivers, Supremacy and Oil, Iraq, Turkey, and the Anglo-American World. Order, 1918-1930, Ithaca, NY, Cornell University Press, 1982. 83 Hans J. Morgenth, Reflections on the End of the Republic, New York Review of Books. 15. Number 5. The 24th of September 1970. 84 C. Regular Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International Reports and, among many, publications, J. V. Giraldo, Colombia, The Genocidal Democracy, Monroe, Maine, Common. Courage Press, 1996, and Gary M. Leach, Killing Peace, Colombia's Conflict and the Failure of U.S. Intervention, New York. Information Network of the Americas, Inota, 2002. Notes to Chapter 3. 1. Michael Wines, Two Views of Inhumanity Split the World, Even in Victory, New York. Times, Sunday, 13 June 1999, Seconds 4, p. 1. Baclav Havel, Kosovo and the End of the Nation. State, New York Review of Books, 46. No. 10, 10 June 1999. David Frumpkin, Kosovo Crossing. American Ideals Meet Reality on the Balkan Battle of Yelts, New York, Free Press, 1999. For example. Of the rhetoric, see my new military humanism, op. Sit. To Charles Dilley, Coercion, Capital, and European States, AD 990-1990. Cambridge, Basel. Blackwell, 1993. 3C. J. Chivers, uprooted Iraqi sea war as path to lost homes, 
New York Times, 5, December 2002, seconds A, P, 1, 4. In early August, the Bishop's Office in East Timor estimated 3,000 to 5,000 deaths. Through 1999, historian John Taylor estimates 5,000 to 6,000 dead before the August 30 referendum, which set off the final praxism. See John G. Taylor, East Timor, The Price of Freedom, New York, Z Books, 1999. 5. On Clinton's sudden conversion between September 8 and 11, 1999, see Joseph Nevins. First the butchery, then the flowers, Clinton and Holbrook in East Timor, Counterpunch 9. Number 10, 16 the 31st of May 2. 2002. Online at www.etten.org slash at 2002 b slash june slash 2330 slash 001.htm. 6. The Australian led UN peacekeeping force centered as the Indonesian army was withdrawing. An even earlier dispatch of forces would have been an intervention only in the sense that U.S. British forces intervened in France on D-Day. 7. Frompkin, Kosovo Crossing, Op. Sit. 8. Irislav Drofimov, Uneasy Peace, U. Ends Long Stay, Power in Kosovo, Stir. Resentment, Wall Street Journal, 3 January 2003, Seconds A, P. 1. 9. Role in Paris, Kosovo and the Matifor War. Political Science Quarterly 177, Number 3, Fall, 2002, pages 423 to 51, dash page 203. 10. Michael Mandelbaum, The Ideas That Conquered the World, Op. Sit, p. 193. 11. Timothy Gart Nash, Imagine No America, Guardian, London. The 19th of September 2002, p. 21. 12. For Robertson quotes and discussion, see my new generation draws the line, op. Sit, pp. 106 07. Statement of Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, Robin Cook. House of Commons, 18 January 1999, column 567. Online at www.publications.parliament.uk slash pa slash cm one nine nine eight nine nine slash commands slash fo nine nine o one one eight slash text slash nine o one one eight o six dot htm thirteen Nicholas J Wheeler Saving Strangers Humanitarian Intervention in International Society. Oxford and New York, Oxford University Press, 2000, pp. 34, 265 ff. 14. Wesley K. Clerk, Waging Modern War, Bosnia, Kosovo, and the Future of Combat, New York. Public Affairs, 2001, p. 171. Michael Ignatief. Chains of Command, Review of Waging Modern War, by Wesley Clerk, New York Review of Books 48, Number 12, the 19th of July 2001. 15. Basevish, American Empire, Op. Sit. 16. Isa Blumai, The Islamist Challenge in Kosovo, Current History 102, No. 662, March. 2003, pages 124 to 128. 17. Anne Marie Slaughter, Good Reasons for Going Around the UN, New York Times, 18. March 2003, seconds A, P. 33. 18. Charles Burquist in Burquist, Ricardo Penaranda, and Gonzalo Sanchez, Eds, Violence. In Colombia, 1990-2000, Waging War and Negotiating Peace, Wilmington, Dell, Scholarly Resources. Books, 
2001. 19. Anthony Lewis, The Challenge of Global Justice Now, Deedless, 132, No. 1. Winter. 2003, pages 5 to 9. Timorese were regarded as citizens of Indonesia by the U.S. 20. Tempering Turkey, Editorial, Boston Globe, 6 March 2003, Seconds A, P. 14. Area Nail. Inconvenient Facts, Descent 47, Number 2, Spring 2000, pages 109-12. Nail is reacting to the review of U.S.-backed atrocities in my new military humanism, which leaves no doubt as to the locus of responsibility. 21. Robert Cooper, Why We Still Need Empires, Observer, London, 7 April 2002, p. 27. 22. Robert Jervis, Theories of War in an Era of Leading Power Peace, Presidential Address of the American Political Science Association, 2001, American Political Science Review 96, No. 1. March 2002, pages 1 to 14. 23. Dexter Perkins, The Monroe Doctrine, 1823 to 1826, Cambridge, Harvard University Press. London, Oxford University Press. 1927, Bismarck cited by Nancy Mitchell, Germans in their backyard, Weltpolitik versus Protective Imperialism, Prologue 24, Number 2, Summer 1992, pp. 174, 183, 24, Robert Lansing and Woodrow Wilson cited in Gabriel Colco, Main Currents in Modern. Dash page 204. American History, New York, Pantheon Books, 1984, p. 47. 25. President Taft cited in Jenny Pierce, Under the Eagle, U.S. Intervention in Central America. And the Caribbean, Boston, South End Press, 1982, p. 17. Wilson's Minister of the Interior cited in. Gordon Connell Smith, The Inter-American System, London and New York, Oxford University. Press, 1966, p. 16. John Foster Dulles cited in Stephen G. Rabe, Eisenhower and Latin America, The Foreign Policy of Anti-Communism, Chapel Hill, N.C., University of North Carolina Press, 1988, p. 33. 26. David F. Schmitz, Thank God They re on Their Side, Op. Sit, and the United States and Fascist. Italy, 1922-1940, Chapel Hill, N.C., University of North Carolina Press, 1988. Cable from British. Embassy in Washington to Foreign Office in London, Sir H. Kaksha, No. 2455, 24 November. 1959, Reporting Conversation with Dulles. 27 Editorial, New York Times, 6 August 1954. 28 David Green, The Containment of Latin America, A History of the Myths and Realities of the Good Neighbor Policy, Chicago, Quadrangle Books, 1971. 29. William Y. Eliot, ed. The Political Economy of American Foreign Policy, Its Concepts, Strategy, and Limits, Report by a Study Group Sponsored by the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, and the National Planning Association, New York, Holt, 1955, p. 42. 30. Schmitz, The United States and Fascist Italy, Op. Sit. P. 214. 31. On. Our Enemies and U.S. Op. Sit. 32. Schmitz. The United States and Fascist Italy. Op. Sit. Ken incited in Christopher Simpson. The Splendid Blonde Beast, Money, Law, and Genocide in the 20th Century. Monroe, Maine. 
Common Courage Press, 1995. Scott Newton, The Anglo-American Connection and Their Political Economy of Appeasement, Diplomacy and Statecraft T2, No. 3, November 1991. 33 See My Deterring Democracy, Op. Sit, Chapter 11, and Sources Cited the Later Material Reviewed in my year 501, Op. Sit, Chapter 2, and World Orders, Old and New, Extended Edition New York, Columbia University Press, 1996 34 Schmitz, Thank God They Re On Their Side, Op. Sit P. 305. 35. Valent Donaldson, Why Things Turned Violent, Review of Confronting the Third World. United States Foreign Policy, 1945-1980, by Gabriel Colco, New York Times, Sunday, the 25th of December. 1988, Seconds 7, Book Review, P. 7. 36 Lansing and Wilson cited in Lloyd C. Gardner, Safia for Democracy, the Anglo-American. Response to Revolution, 1913-1923, New York, Oxford University Press, 1984. Alex Carey, Taking The Risk Out of Democracy, Corporate Propaganda vs. Freedom and Liberty, Urbana, Ill, University of Illinois Press, 1997. 37 cited by Melvin P. Leffler, A Preponderance of Power, National Security, The Truman Administration, and the Cold War, Stanford, California, Stanford University Press, 1992, p. 78. Dash page 205. 38 John Lewis Gaddis, The Long Peace, Inquiries into the History of the Cold War, New York. Oxford University Press, 1987, p. 10. 39 Mark Laffey, Discerning the Patterns of World Order, Noam Chomsky and International Theory After the Cold War, Review of International Studies 29, forthcoming, 2003, a. Critical Account of the Convention. Notes to Chapter 4. 1. Michael Crepin, Strategic Analyst at the Henry L. Stimson Center, cited by Faye Bowers. And Howard LaFranchi, Risk Rises for a Reignited Arms Race, Christian Science Monitor, 31. December 2002, p. 1. Gary Hart and Warren B. Rudman, Co-Chairs, America Still Unprepared. Still in Danger. Report of an Independent Task Force Sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations New York and Washington, D.C. Council on Foreign Relations, 2002 Online at www.cfr.org slash pdf slash homeland underscore tf dot pdf To Marion Lloyd Soviets close to using a bomb in 1962 crisis, Forum is told, Boston. Globe, the 13th of October 2002, seconds A, P. 20. Kevin Sullivan, 40 years after missile crisis, players swap. Stories in Cuba, Washington Post, the 13th of October 2002, seconds A, P. 28. 3 Eisenhower quoted in Matthew Evangelista, Cold War International History Project. Working paper series, no. 10 Why Keep Such an Army? Khrushchev S. Troop Productions. Washington, D.C., Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, December 1997. Online. At wix.c.edu slash topics slash pubs slash akf43.pdf For Lloyd, Soviets close to using a bomb in 1962 crisis, op. sit. 5. Raymond L. Gardoff, Reflections on the Cuban Missile Crisis, Washington, D.C. Brookings Institution, 1987, pp. 
83, 89, 86, 37. Emphasis his. Warheads, of course, remained. Under U.S. control. Sixth the leading U.S. government scholar recognized that the only mass-based political party in South Vietnam was the National Liberation Front and that the U.S. must resort to violence to destroy it. Douglas Eugene Pike, Viet Cong, The Organization and Techniques of the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, Cambridge, MIT Press, 1966. In Indonesia, the main target of the huge U.S.-backed slaughter in 1965 was the PKI, which developed a mass space among their peasantry through its figure in defending the interests of their poor. Harold Grouch, Army and Politics in Indonesia, Ithaca, NY, Cornell University Press, 1978, pp. 351, 155. 7. William Sapphire, Irrefutable and Undeniable, New York Times, the 6th of February 2003, seconds A, P. 39. Adam Clymer, A Reprise of 1962, with Less Electricity, New York Times, the 6th of February 2003, seconds A, P. 17. 8. Adlai E. Stevenson 3, Different Man. Different Moment, New York Times, 7 February, 2003, Seconds A, P, 25, 9 Thomas Patterson, Cuba and the Missile Crisis in Patterson and Merrill, Ed's, Major, Problems, Op, Sit, 10 Ernest R, May and Philip D, Zilli Cow, Ed's, The Kennedy Tapes, Inside the White House, Dash page 206. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, Cambridge, Belknap Press of Harvard University Press, 1997, p. 263. 11. Frank Costigliola, Kennedy, The European Allies, and the Failure to Consult, Political Science. Quarterly 110, No. 1, Spring 1995. Pages 105 to 23. Costigliola in Thomas G. Patterson, ed. Kennedy S. Quest F. Four Victory, American Foreign Policy, 1961 to 1963, New York, Oxford University. Press, 1989. The senior advisor, not clearly identified, may be Dean Nixon or Mike Mansfield. 12. Patterson, Cuba and the Missile Crisis, Op. Sit. 13. Morris H. Morley, Imperial State and Revolution, The United States and Cuba, 1952-1986. Cambridge and New York, Cambridge University Press, 1987. C. Daniel Ganser, Reckless. Gamble. The Sabotage of the United Nations in the Cuban Conflict and the Missile Crisis of 1962, New Orleans, University Press of the South, 2000, and Stephen M. Streeter, Managing Their Counter-Revolution, The United States and Guatemala, 1954-1961, Athens, Ohio, Ohio University, Center for International Studies, 2000. 14. A program of covert action against the Castro regime, the 16th of March 1960, declassified 9. April 1998. Text published in Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, Shaft. Newsletter 33, No. 3, September 2002. Online at shaft.history.ohio. State.edu slash newsletter slash 2002 slash September slash covered htm. 15 British Cable No. 2455, from Washington to British Foreign Office, 24 November 1959. Online at 
www.gwood.edu slash tilden sakif slash bayoff pigs slash 1959-1124.pdf. See Chapter 3, Note 26 of Hegemony or Survival. 16 Arthur Schlesinger, Memorandum for the President, 11 February 1961, cited in foreign. Relations of the United States 1961-1963, Volume X, Document 31M, online at www.state.gov slash www slash about underscore state slash history slash frisks slash 31 underscore 45 dot html. 17 Thomas Patterson in Patterson, Ed, Kennedy S. Quest, Op. Sit. For the full texts, see Mark J. White, Ed, The Kennedys and Cuba, The Declassified Documentary History, Rev. Ed. Chicago, Ivan. R.D. 2001, pp. 37 ff. 18 May and Zilli Cow, Ed. The Kennedy Tapes, Op. Sit. p. 134, 18 October 1962. During an internal discussion on the use of force during the missile crisis. 19 May and Zilli Cow, Ed, The Kennedy Tapes, Op. Sit, P. 9, On the U.S. Takeover Under Their Guise of Liberation, C. Louis A. Perez, Jr., The War of 1898, The United States and Cuba in History and Historiography, Chapel Hill. University of North Carolina Press, 1998. 20 Pyro Conflicting Missions, Havana, Washington, and Africa, 1959-1976, Chapel. Hill, NC, University of North Carolina Press, 2002, p. 16. The quoted phrase is Arthur. Schlesinger's, referring to the goals of Robert Kennedy. In Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., Robert Kennedy and His Times, Boston, Houghton Mifflin, 1978, pages 477 to 80. 21 Hawkeye. Dominguez, The Attache Dollar Percent and Missile Crisis, or What Was Cuban About U.S. Decisions During the Cuban Missile Crisis? Diplomatic History 24, Number 2. Spring 2000, pp. 305. 15. Glyches, Conflicting Missions, pages 402 to 3. Online at dash page 207. www.people.faz.harvard.edu slash tilde jidoming slash images slash underscore missile dot pdf. 22 white, ed. The Kennedys and Cuba, Op. Sit, pp. 71, 95 ff, 106, 115 ff. 23. Tim Wiener, The Cuban Missile Crisis, When the World Stood on Edge and Nobody Died Beautifully, New York Times, Sunday, the 13th of October 2002, seconds 4, p. 7. Citing of February 1962. Memorandum, also cited by App, U.S. Stater, show a plan to lure Cuba to war, Boston Globe, 30. January 1998. 24L. L. Lemnitzer, Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Memorandum for the Secretary of Defense, Justification for the U.S. Military Intervention in Cuba, T.S. Operation Northwoods. The 13th of March 1962. Online at www.gwood.edu slash tilden sakif slash news slash 2010430 slash northwoods dot pdf. 25 Patterson in Kennedy S. Quest. Op. Sit. 26 Gardoff. Reflections. Op. Sit. pp. 16 ff. 27 Gardoff, Reflections, Op. Sit, pages 78 to 79, 
one hundred and eight to o nine. Twenty-eight Memorandum of the twelfth of November, nineteen sixty-two, cited by Gleitches, conflicting missions. Op. Sit. P. Twenty-five. Gartoff Reflections. Op. Sit. P. P. Ninety-one. Ninety-eight. Twenty-nine Dominguez Diplomatic History. Op. Sit. May and Zilikow Eds the Kennedy Tapes. Op. Sit. P. 66. 30 30 years of Fidel Castro, Editorial, New York Times, the 2nd of January 1989, seconds 1, p. 22. 31 Reuters, Boston Globe, 15 October 1992. 1 0. Tameo, Cuban hotels were bombed. By Miami paid Salvadorans, Miami Herald, 16 November 1997. Seconds A, P. 1, Tameo, 94. Bombings against Honduran leader may be linked to anti Castro plot, Miami Herald, 28. September 1997, Seconds A, P. 1. Andrew Cawthon, U.S. Foundation, CANF, is implicated in 1997. Bombings in Cuba, Boston Globe, 12 March 1999. Anne Louise Bardark and Larry Rockter. Taking aim at Castro, key Cuba folk claims exiles backing, New York Times, the 12th of July 1998, seconds. 1, p. 1. Bardark and Rockter, decades of intrigue, life in the shadows, trying to bring down. Castro, New York Times, the 13th of July 1998, seconds. A. P. 1. Annie Landor and Wayne Smith, Cuba on the terrorist list, in defense of the nation or domestic political calculation? International Policy Report, Center for International Policy, November 2002. 32. Duncan Campbell, convicted Cuban spies to tell U.S. appeal court they were framed, Guardian, London. The 7th of April 2003, p. 15. For an analysis of the charges and background. See William Bloom, which Cuban terrorists? There's or I was. Counterpunch, the 1st of September 2002. 33. Ruth Leakak, Requiem F4 Revolution, the United States and Brazil, 1961-1969, Kent, Ohio. Kent State University Press, 1990, p. 33. 34 May and Zilikow, Eds, The Kennedy Tapes, Op. Sit, p. 91. 35. Morris Morley and Chris McGillian, Unfinished Business, Cambridge and New York. Cambridge University Press, 2002, p. 223. Ain. Dash page 208. 36. Smalley and Chris McGillian, Unfinished Business, Op. Sit. P. 153. Semi Necessary. Illusions, Op. Sit. PP. 177. 101. Sh Early Christian, U.S. sends A to Nicaragua as death toll. Rises, New York Times. The 4th of September 1992, seconds A, P, 6. 37. David E. Sanja, U.S. won't offer trade testimony on Cuba embargo, New York. Times, the 21st of February 1997, seconds A, P, 1. 38. Glide says, conflicting missions, op, sit, P, 26. 39 Patterson, Cuba and the Missile Crisis in Merrill and Patterson, Eds, Major Problems, Op. Sit. 40 Letter to Robert Livingston, the 18th of April 1802, cited in the Louisiana Purchase, 1803-2003, National Interest, No. 71, Spring 2003, p. 16. 41 Robert F. Kennedy cited in Michael McClintock, 
Instruments of Statecraft T, U.S. Guerrilla Warfare, Counterinsurgency, and Counterterrorism, 1940-1990, New York, Pantheon, 1992, p. 23. Online at www.statecraft.org slash 42 cited in Adam Isaacson and Joy Olson, Just the Facts, Washington, D.C., Latin America. Working Group and Center for International Policy, 1999, p. 9. Related material online at www.sipeonline.org slash facts slash 43 See My Deterring Democracy, Op. Sit, Chapter 10. 44 Lars Scholtz, Human Rights and United States Policy Toward Latin America, Princeton, N.J. Princeton University Press, 1981, p. 7. 45 For discussion, context, and sources, see my year 501, op. Sit, Chapter 7. 46 Thomas Skidmore. The Politics of Military Rule in Brazil, 1964-85, New York, Oxford. University Press, 1988. Also see my year 501, op. Sit, Chapter 7. 47 A Report from Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker to President Johnson, Indonesia American. Relations, Foreign Relations of the United States. FRUS, 1964-1968, Volume 26, p. 257. Special. National Intelligence Estimate, SNE, 1 September 1965, FRUS, Volume 26, p. 292. Cited by Mark. Curtis, Web of Deceit, Britain's Real Role in the World, New York. Vintage, 2003, pp. 399 ff. 48 Glyges, Conflicting Missions, Op. Sit, pp. 332, 346. 49 Victoria Britain, Review of Conflicting Missions, by Piero Glyges, Conflicting Missions. Havana, Washington, and Africa. 1959 to 76, race and class 44, number 4, April to June 2003, pages 83 to 90. 50 Glyges, conflicting missions, op. Sit, p. 359. 51 David Gonzalez, at Cuba Conference, Old Foes Exchange Notes on 1962 Missile. Crisis, New York Times. 14 October 2002, seconds A, P. 6. Barry Jewin, Thinking There. Unthinkable, Review of White Terrorism Works, Understanding the Threat, Responding to the Challenge, by Alan M. Dirge Oz, New York Times, Sunday, 15 September 2002, seconds 7, book. Dash page 209. Review, P. 12. 52. Alexander George, ed. Western State Terrorism, New York, Routledge, 1991, London. Polity, 1991. See also Chomsky and Edward S. Herman, The Political Economy of Human Rights. Volume 1, Boston, South End Press, 1979, Chapter 3, Seconds 1 and Edward S. Herman, The Real Terror. Network, Terrorism in Fact and Propaganda, Boston, South End Press, 1982. 53 Jean Beth Kelstein, Just War Against Terror, New York, Basic Books, 2003, p. 18, her. Emphasis. For a review of these operations, based in part on notes provided to us by Newsweek, Saigon Bureau Chief Kevin Buckley, C. Chomsky and Herman, Political Economy of Human Rights, Op. Sit, Volume 1, pp. 313 FF, and Manufacturing Consent, 
op set pp 196 ff some of the same material appears in christopher hitchens the trial of henry kissinger london and new york verso 2001 pp 30 ff 54 congressional testimony 1986 1983 See essays by Jack Spence and Eldon Kenworthy in Thomas W. Walker, ed. Reagan vs. the Sandinistas, The Undeclared War on Nicaragua, Boulder, Colorado, Westview Press, 1987. 55. Remarks at a White House meeting for supporters of United States assistance for the Nicaraguan Democratic Resistance, the 3rd of March 1986. Walter Robinson, Reagan says Nicaraguans threaten U.S. Boston Globe, the 22nd of March 1986. 56. Selden Kenworthy cited in Walker, Reagan vs. the Sandinistas, op. sit. See also my culture of terrorism, op. sit. pp. 219 ff. Necessary illusions, op. sit. P. 71. FF. And deterring. Democracy. Op. Sit. P. 259. On various phases as useful fast proceeded. National emergency. See texts of Reagan executive order and message to Congress. New York Times. The 2nd of May 1985. Seconds A. P. 8. And my turning the tide. U.S. Intervention in Central America and the Struggle F for Peace. Boston, South End Press, 1986, p. 144. For more detail, Libya, see my pirates and emperors, old and new international terrorism in the real world. Updated version of 1986 first edition published by Black Rose Books, Cambridge. South End Press, 2002, p. 72, on Reagan's July 1985 address to the American Bar Association, online at www.reagan.utexes.edu slash resource slash speeches slash 1985 slash 70885a.htm. 57 George Schultz Moral Principles and Strategic Interests, Department of State, Current Policy, Number 820, Transcript of Speech of the 14th of April 1986, Libya, See My Pirates and Emperors, Old and New, Op. Sit, Chapter 3, 58 Thomas W. Walker, Nicaragua, Living in the Shadow of the Eagle, 4th ed. Athens, Ohio. Ohio University Press, and Boulder, Colorado, Westview Press, 2003. Thomas Carothers in. Abraham F. Lowenthal, ed. Exporting Democracy, the United States and Latin America, Case. Studies, Baltimore, Johns Hopkins University Press, 1991. Carothers, in the name of democracy. U.S. Policy Toward Latin America in the Reagan Years, Berkeley, University of California Press. 1991, His Emphasis. 59 The World Bank, EAD, and other sources, See My Deterring Democracy, Op. Sit, Chapter. 10. For information on health effects, see Nicaraguan Society of Doctors for Peace and their Defense of Life. Medipas, the war in Nicaragua, the effects of low-intensity conflict on an underdeveloped country, Managua, Nicaragua, and Cambridge, Mass, Medipas, 2003. 60 C. Paul S. Reichler, tribute to Professor Abram Chase, holding America to its own best standards, Abe Chase and Nicaragua in the World Court, Harvard International Law. Dash page 210. Journal 42, number 1, winter 2001.
61 military and paramilitary activities in and against Nicaragua, Nicaragua v. United States of America, Merits, Judgment, ICJ Reports 1986, p. 14, International Court of Justice, 27, June 1986. Online at www.gwood.edu slash tilde jaysmith slash nikas 3html Security Council S slash 18221 The 11th of July 1986 62 for these and many other samples from the press, see Chomsky and Herman. Manufacturing Consent, Op. Sit, pp. 240ff and my necessary illusions, op. sit, pp. 33 ff, and year. 501, op. sit, pp. 251 ff. 63 Charles A. Raiden, U.S. Crafts Vietnam Education Proposal, Boston Globe, the 17th of November. 2000, seconds A, p. 21. 64 Anthropologist Ira Lowenthal, his emphasis. Cited in Paul Farmer, AIDS and Accusation. Haiti and the Geography of Blame, Berkeley, University of California Press, 1992. 65 C. Farmer, The Uses of Haiti, Updated Ed. Monroe, Maine, Common Courage Press. 2003. 66 Max Mintz, Seeds of Empire, The American Revolutionary Conquest of the Iroquois, New York, New York University, 1999, pages 75 to 76, 180 ff. 67 General John Galvin, Commander of the U.S. Southern Command, Southcom. Explaining Strategy to Congress, C. Fred Kaplan. U.S. General says contra chances. Improving, Boston Globe, the 20th of May 1987, p. 9. 68. Michael Kinsley, down the memory hole with the contras, Wall Street Journal, 26. March 1987, seconds 1, p. 37. 69. Invio, Managua, Nicaragua, March 2003. September 2001. 70 The Armageddon Effect, The Final Test, in Vio, October 2001. 71 On the 1984 elections, see Walker, Nicaragua, op. sit, pp. 156 ff. On the reports of a wide range of expert observers, all ignored, and adherents within media and commentary to the Reaganite agenda on elections in enemy Nicaragua and its terrorist client states, see Chomsky and Herman, Manufacturing Consent, Op. Sit, Chapter 3. 72 The Armageddon Effect, Op. Sit. 73 Kenneth M. Pollack, Faith and Terrorism in the Muslim World, Review of the Crisis of Islam, by Bernard Lewis, New York Times. Sunday, the 6th of April 2003, seconds 7, book review, p. 11. 74 news services, Iran contra figure named to senior post in White House, Washington. Post, the 3rd of December 2002, seconds a, p. 2. 75 Abrams, C. Stephen R. Wiseman. A Brom's back in capital fray at center of Mideast. Battle, New York Times, the 7th of December 2002, seconds A, P. 1. Ryan Noriega, C. James Dow, Bush. Dash page 211. Names veteran anti-communist to Latin America post, New York Times, the 10th of January 2002, seconds. A. P. 6. 76. Laura W. Murphy, Director of the ACLU's Washington National Office, in ACLU Press. Release, 
ACLU calls on President Bush to disavow new cyber spying scheme that seeks to put every American under scrutiny. 14 November 2002. Online at www.aclu.org slash safe and free slash safe and free dot cfm id equals 11309 and c equals 206 77 the armageddon effect op sit 78 ricardo stevens the 19th of october 2001 on radio lavos del tropico panama cited in north American Congress on Latin America, NACLA, Report on the Americas 35, No. 3, November. December 2001. 79. Carlos Salinas, Interview, Institute for Public Accuracy, San Francisco, California, 22 March. 2002. Online at www.accuracy.org slash press underscore releases slash pro32202.htm three two two o two dot htm on polls cpp 199 ff of hegemony or survival notes to chapter 5 when ronald reagan cited in bernard weinraub israeli extends hand of peace to jordanians new york times 18 October 1985, seconds A, P. 1. George Schultz, State Department. Current Policy, Number 589, the 24th of June 1984, and Number 629, the 25th of October 1984. George W. Bush quoted by Rich Heffern, The Snake Coiled Deep in Our Hearts. National Catholic Reporter, 11 January 2002. Online at nutcath.org slash ncr underscore online slash archives 2 slash 2002 a slash 01102 slash 01102 a dot htm. 2 for discussion of some of these questions. See Chomsky and Herman, Political Economy of Human Rights. Op. Sit, Herman, Real Terror Network, Op. Sit, My Pirates and Emperors, Old and New, Op. Sit, and George, Ed, Western State Terrorism, Op. Sit. 3 UN Interagency Task Force, Africa Recovery Program Slash Economic Commission, South. African Destabilization, The Economic Cost of Frontline Resistance to Apartheid. 1989, p. 13, cited in Mill Bowen, Mozambique and the Politics of Economic Recovery, Fletcher Forum of World Affairs, Volume 15, Number 1, Winter 1991, pages 45 to 55. D. Rias Rat et al., Children on the Front. Line, 3rd ed. New York and Geneva, UNICEF, 1989. For ANC material, see Jose Berzulek and William A. Douglas, Terror and Taboo, The Follies, Fables, and Faces of Terrorism, New York. Routledge, 1996, p. 12. For Raymond Gartoff, A Journey Through the Cold War, A Memoir of Containment and Coexistence, Washington, D.C., Brookings Institution. 2001, pp. 338, 387. John K. Cooley, Unholy. Wars, Afghanistan, America, and International Terrorism, London and Sterling, The Pluto Press. 1999, pp. 11, 54. 5 Cooley, Unholy Wars, Op. Sit, pp. 230 ff. 6. Minrizan, Saddam Hussein's Gulf Wars, Ambivalent Stakes in the Middle East, Westport, Connecticut, Praja, 1992, pp. 58 ff. 7. C. My Deterring Democracy, Op. Sit, pages 50 to 51, 236 ff.
and 278 FF. Task Force on U.S. Korea. Policy. The nuclear crisis on the Korean Peninsula. Avoiding the road to perdition. Current. Dash page 212. History 102. No. 663. April 2003. pp. 152 ff. For material on Duvalier, see my year 501. Op. Sit. Chapter 8. Seconds 4. 8. Hannah Pakala, Under the Eye of the Big Sea. Washington Post, the 27th of December 1989, seconds. A. P. 19. Howard Lafranchi, U.S. Speeds Tally of Iraq Offenses, Christian Science Monitor, 25. November 2002, P. 1. 9. Ruth Sinai, App, Bush Preparing to Lift Ban on Government Loans to Iraq, 22. December 1989. State Department to Senator Daniel Inouye, the 26th of February 1990. See my deterring. Democracy. Op. Sit. P. 152. For details. 10. Peter Spiegel and Richard McGregor, Donald Rumsfeld, Saddam Hussein joins. Pantheon of Failed Dictators, Financial Times, London, the 10th of April 2003. P. 3. Peter Spiegel, Paul. Wolf Howitz, The Pentagon Hawks Vision of a War for Democracy, Financial Times, 10 April. 2003, p. 2. On Marcos, who was a particular favorite of President Reagan and Vice President. Bush, see my deterring democracy, op. Sit, chapters 7 and 8. 11 C. Bed Joy, Awer, and 8 Larby, Eds, An Inquiry into the Algerian Massacres, Op. Sit. For extensive documentation. William Byrne cited in Stephen R. Wiseman, U.S. to sell military. Gear to Algeria to help it fight militants, New York Times, 10 December 2002, Seconds A. P. 20. Robert Fisk. The double standards, dubious morality and duplicity of this fight against terror, independent, London, 4 January 2003, p. 18. La Romalo, fanatical Islamic terror, has become globalized, Irish Times, the 31st of December 2002, p. 11. 12. For details and sources. C. Thomas Ferguson and Joel Rogers, Right Turn, The Decline of The Democrats and the Future of American Politics, New York, Hill and Wang, 1986, and Michael Mirapol, Surrender, How the Clinton Administration Completed the Reagan Revolution, Updated Ed. Ann Arbor, Michigan, University of Michigan Press, 2003. See also my turning the tide, op. Sit. Chapter 5, and my year 501, op. Sit. Chapter 11, on economic consequences, see state of working. America studies by the Economic Policy Institute, online at www.ebinet.org slash, and Edward N. Wolf, top heavy. A study of the increasing inequality of wealth in America, updated ed. New York, New Press, 1996. 13. On Libya's role in Reaganite demonology, see my pirates and emperors, old and new, op. Sit, Chapter 3, and Stephen Ross Calm Shalom, Imperial Alibis, Rationalizing U.S. Intervention. After the Cold War, Boston. South End Press, 1993, Chapter 7. 14. See my necessary illusions, op. Sit, pages 176 to 80. 15. See pages 96 to 97 of Hegemony or Survival. 16. Anthony Lewis, Abroad at Home, or Real Evil, New York Times, the 17th of April 1986, Seconds A. P. 31. 
17 Hodding Carter III, The Fickle Finger of the American Press, Wall Street Journal, 14, September 1989, p. 1. Thomas Pickering quoted by Peter James Spielman, App, U.S. Envoy, Praises General Assembly, 19 December 1989. For a review of the drug war, see my deterring. Democracy, Op, Sit. Chapters 5 and 6, and Shalom, Imperial Alibis, Op. Sit, Chapter 8. 18 cited in Irene L. Gentia, Notes Ephraim, The Minor Vield, United States Intervention in Lebanon. Dash page 213. And the Middle East, 1945 to 1958, New York, Columbia University Press, 1977. P. 256. 19 Ferguson and Rogers, right turn, op. Sit. P. 122. Jackie Combs and John D. McKinnon. Red flag, with deficits back in picture, Bush agenda faces big test, Wall Street Journal, 11. November 2002, seconds A. P. 1. 20 Peronet Despainers, Bush shelved report on $42,200 billion deficit fears, Financial Times. London, 29 May 2003, p. 1. Lawrence J. Kotlikoff and Jeffrey Sachs, An Economic Menu of Pain, Boston Globe, 19 May 2003, seconds a, p. 11. Fleischer cited in Peronet Despainers, White. House aware of the crushing debt, Financial Times, the 30th of May 2003, seconds 1, p. 1. 21 Paul Krugman, stating the obvious, New York Times, the 27th of May 2003, seconds a, p. 25. 22 Annette Ulven, The Push for War, op. Sit. 23 Martin Saif, Militarism and the Midterm Elections, White House Strategists Timed There. Iraq War Debate to Dominate the Fall Congressional Campaign, American Conservative, 4. November 2002. Online at www.tamkenmag.com slash 11 underscore 4 slash militarism underscore and underscore the dot html. 24 Donald Green and Eric Sickler, Winning a Battle, Not to War, New York Times, 12. November 2002, Seconds A, P. 27. 25 Peter Slavin, U.S. Drops Bid to Strengthen Germ Warfare Accord, Washington Post, 19. September 2002, Seconds A, P. 1. 26. Greg Corden, Minneapolis Star Tribune, 18 October 2002, Attack on Iraq Could Lead. Saddam to Unleashes Chemical and Biological Weapons, Warns Jane's Report, Jane's. Terrorism and Security Monitor, 12 November 2002. Online at www.janes.com slash security slash international underscore security slash news slash jtsm slash jtsm 021112 underscore one underscore n dot shtml. Sebastian Rotella, allies find no links between Iraq, Al-Qaeda, Los Angeles Times, 4. November 2002, seconds a, p. 1. Jimmy Burns and Mark Huben, Security Warning, War Will. Fuel and Rest and More Terrorism, Financial Times, London, 24 January 2003, Middle East. Section, P. 5, Eric Lichtblau, German Minister says Al-Qaeda threat is as strong now as before. September 11, New York Times, 25 January 2003. Seconds A, P. 8. Marlies Simons, Europeans warn of. Terror attacks in event of war in Iraq, New York Times, 
29 January 2003, seconds A, P, 18, and Philip Shannon, Ridge warns that Iraq war could raise terrorist threat, New York Times, 4, March 2003, seconds A, P, 10, 27, Richard K. Betts, Suicide from Fear of Death, Foreign Affairs 82, No. 1, January, February 2003, P. 34FF, 28, Kenneth Waltz in Booth and Dunn, Eds, Worlds in Collision, Op, Sit, U.S. Intelligence, C. Chapter 7, Note 10, Of Hegemony or Survival. 29 study cited by Charles L. Glazer and Steve Fetter, National Missile Defense and their Future of U.S. Nuclear Weapons Policy, International Security 26, No. 1, Summer 2001, pp. 40. 92. Online at www.pwrf.md.edu slash faculty slash papers slash fetter slash glazer dot pdf Richard Falkenrath, Robert Newman, and Bradley Thayer, America's Achilles Heel, Nuclear, Biological and Chemical Terrorism and Covered Attack, Boston, MIT Press, 1998 Barton Gelman, Struggles Inside the Government Defined Campaign, Washington Post, 20 December 2001, Seconds A, P, 1, Dash Page 214. Hart and Rudman, America Still Unprepared, Still in Danger, Op, Sit, 30 Case in et al, War with Iraq, Op, Sit, Citing Daniel Benjamin, In the Fog of War, A Greater Threat. Washington Post, 31 October 2002, seconds A, P, 23, Barton Gelman, 7 nuclear sites, looted, Iraqi scientific files, some containers missing, Washington Post, the 10th of May 2003, seconds A, P, 1, 31, Yousef Ibrahim, Bush's Iraq adventure is bound to backfire. International Herald. Jabu, the 1st of November 2002. 32 C, for example, Med Act, collateral damage, the health and environmental costs of war on Iraq, 12 November 2002. Online at www.medact.org slash tbx slash docs slash medact percent 20 Iraq percent 20 report underscore final 3 dot pdf Physicians for Human Rights, Health and Human Rights Consequences of War in Iraq Briefing Paper, the 14th of February 2003 Online at www.brusa.org slash research slash Iraq slash 021403.html Nicholas Bellum Desperate Iraqis face mass starvation, warns UN Financial Times, London, 28 February 2003, Iraq Crisis Section, p. 6, Kenneth H. Bacon, Iraq, The Humanitarian Challenge Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists 59, No. 1, January to February 2003, pages 26 to 27. Online at www.therbulletin.org slash issues slash 2003 slash JFO3 slash JFO3 bacon.html. James Politi, Guy Dinmore, and Mark Turner, aid agencies hit at lack of clarity in U.S. post-war plans, Financial Times. London, the 27th of February 2003, Iraq Crisis Section, p. 8, and Ed Valiami, Burhan Wazir, and Gabby. Hinsliff, aid groups warn of war crisis in Iraq, Observer, London, the 22nd of December 2002, p. 2. 33 Dreamant, Introduction, in Month, 
Ed, the Saddam Hussein Reader, New York. Thunder's Mouth, 2002, p. 27. 34. The sanctions were technically imposed by the UN, but it was always understood that they were enforced by the US, UK, and the UN aegis, and with little support, particularly in the cruel form that targets civilians. 35. Francis Williams, Child Death Rate in Iraq Drebbles, Financial Times, London, 12. December 2002, International Economy Section, p. 9. John Muller and Karl Muller, Sanctions of Mass Destruction, Foreign Affairs, 78, No. 3, May to June 1999. 36. Rajiv Chandraskaran, Cheap Food Rations Ensure That No One Goes Hungry. Washington Post, National Weekly Edition, the 10th of February 2003. A notable exception to the general lack of coverage. See also Rajiv Chandraskaran, stockpiling popularity with food, rations. Quell Iraqi discontent, Washington Post, February 3, 2003, seconds A, P. 1. 37. Dennis Halliday, Sila and Charybdis, and Hans Van Sponek, The Policy of Punishment. Alron Weekly 618, 26 December 2002 to 1 January 2003. Online at weekly.ram.org.ex slash 2002 slash 618 slash sc6.htm and weekly.ram.org.ex slash 2002 slash 618 slash sc5.htm 38 Joy Gordon, Cool War, Economic Sanctions as a Weapon of Mass Destruction, Harper's 305, No. 1830, November 2002, pages 43 to 49, for extensive detail and rebuttal to official Justifications. See Eric Herring. Between Iraq and a Hard Place. A critique of the British government's narrative on UN economic sanctions. Review of International Studies 28. No. 1. January 2002. Pages 39 to 56. Online at www.cassie.org.uk slash conf99 slash doc slash herring.html 39 International Committee of the Red Cross, Iraq, 1989-1999, A Decade of Sanctions, 14 Dash page 215 December 1999 Online at www.ic.org slash web slash shen slash citing zero dot nsf slash implicit 322 slash fob sex 7 ff 4 b 7 a 3 cc 1256 b 6 6 0 5 e 0 f b 6 40 other arguments presented were too bizarre to discuss for example that we should bomb and Occupy Iraq because then we could stop torturing its population with sanctions. 41 John F. Burns, Pakistan Antitra Support Avoids Vow of Military Aid, New York. Times, 16 September 2001, seconds 1, p. 5. Samina Ahmed, The United States and Terrorism in Southwest Asia, September 11 and beyond. International Security 26, No. 3, Winter 2001-02, pp. 79-93. 42 Thomas Friedman outlining Bush I administration thinking after it effectively authorized Saddam to crush the rebellions that might have overthrown him, NATO tries to ease security concerns in Eastern Europe, New York Times. The 7th of June 1991, seconds A, P. 1. 43 Mark Thomas, column, New Statesman 15, no. 736, the 9th of December 2002, P. 12.
see chapter 3, note 5, of hegemony or survival. 44 Gallup Poll International, Iraq Poll 2003, December 2002. Online at www.gallup international.com slash download slash gyre percent 20 press percent 20 release percent 20 iraq percent 20 survey percent 202003.pdf mark champion european leaders declare support for us on iraq wall street journal the 30th of january 2003 seconds a p 1 stephen r Wiseman, U.S. demands Iraq show cooperation by this weekend, New York Times, the 10th of February 2003, seconds A, P. 1. 45 Powell cited in Stephen R. Wiseman, U.S. demands Iraq show cooperation by this weekend, New York Times, 10 February 2003, seconds A, P. 1. Reference is to the original eight former Russian satellites. 46 Andrew Higgins, New Europe Wary of US, 2, Wall Street Journal, the 18th of March 2003, seconds A, P. 14. 47 Holbrook cited in Lee Michael Katz, sooner or later, Iraq to be dealt with, National. Journal 35, number 6. The 8th of February 2003, pages 460 to 61. 48. The Op Ed Alliance, Editorial, Wall Street Journal, the 3rd of February 2003, seconds A, P. 16. 49. Thomas L. Friedman, Vote France Off the Island, New York Times, the 9th of February 2003, seconds. 4. P. 15. 50. Todd S. Padum, Bush's moral rectitude is a tough sell in old Europe, New York. Times, the 30th of January 2003, seconds A, P. 8. Max Boot, a war for oil? Not this time, New York Times. The 13th of February 2003, seconds A, P. 41. Robert Gagan. Politicians with Guts, Washington Post, National Weekly Edition, the 10th of February 2003, also in Washington Post, the 31st of January 2003, seconds A, P. 27. 51. Mark Landler, Schroeder's anti-war stance becomes a balancing act, New York Times. 20 January 2003, seconds A, P. 13. Quoting the spokesperson for the right-wing Christian Social Union Party. 52 polls from reluctantly under the whip, Turkey, Iraq, and America, The Economist. Dash page 216. 366, no. 8307. 18 January 2003, p. 48. Morton Abramowitz. Turkey and Iraq, Act 2, Wall Street Journal, the 16th of January 2003, seconds A, P. 12. 53 Recep Tayyip Erdogan cited in Brian Groom, Turks hit at US military might, Financial Times, London, the 25th of January 2003, P. 6. 54 Dexter Fickens. Turkish Parliament is asked to approve U.S. troops, New York Times. 26 February 2003, seconds A, P. 10, Fickens, Turkey backs United States plans for Iraq, New York. Times, 6 February 2003, seconds A, P. 17. Amber and Zaman, Iraqi Kurds balk at Turks' role, loss. Angeles Times. The 8th of February 2003, seconds A, P. 11. 55 Stephen R. Wiseman, Politics Shapes the Battlefield in Iraq, New York Dreams, Sunday, 30. 
March 2003, Seconds 4, Weekend Review, p. 3. 56 Paul Wolfowitz cited in Mark Lacey, Turkey rejects criticism by U.S. official over Iraq, New York Times, the 8th of May 2003, Seconds A, P. 15. 57 Thomas Carothers, Promoting Democracy and Fighting Terror, Foreign Affairs 82, Number 1. January to February 2003, pp. 84 FF. 58 Carothers in Exporting Democracy, Op. Sit, and in the Name of Democracy, Op. Sit. On the Yearning for Democracy in the Reagan Years, C. Neil A. Lewis. What can the U.S. really do? About Haiti? New York Times, Sunday, 6 December 1987, Seconds 4, Weekend Review, P. 2. 4. More details, see my necessary illusions, op. Sit, P. 49. 59. Attilio Boron, State, Capitalism, and Democracy in Latin America, Boulder, Colorado, Lynn. Rienna Publishers, 1995, Chapter 7. 60 James E. Marr, Jr., Mobile Capital and Latin American Development, University Park, PA. Pennsylvania State University Press, 1996. 61 Timothy A. Canova, Banking and Financial Reform at the Crossroads of the Neoliberal. Contagion. American University International Law Review 14, No. 6, 1999, and there. Transformation of U.S. Banking and Finance, from Regulated Competition to Free Market. Receivership, Brooklyn Law Review 60, No. 4, Winter 1995. Cesar Gaviria, oh, as Secretary. General, in Guide and More. Power overtures fail to impress Latin Americans. Financial Times. London, the 11th of June 2003, America's Section, p. 9. 62 Ha Jun Chang and Ajit Singh, Public Enterprise in Developing Countries and Economic Efficiency, UNCTAD Review 4, 1993, pages 45 to 81. 63 Thomas C. Patterson, Will Democrats Find Victory in the Ruins, Boston Globe, 15. December 2000, Seconds A, P. 27, and Point of Agreement, We're Glad It's Over, New York Times, 8. November 2000, Seconds A, P. 27. Also see his book, The Vanishing Voter, Public Involvement in an Age of Uncertainty. New York, Alfred A. Nope, 2002. Gary C. Jacobson, A House and Senate. Divided, The Clinton Legacy and the Congressional Elections of 2000, Political Science Quarterly. 116, No. 1, Spring 2001, pages 5 to 27. Online at www.sconline.org slash 99 underscore article dot php 3 question mark by year equals 2001 and month equals spring and a equals 023. See also my articles in the January elections 2000 and February voting patterns and abstention 2001 issues of Z magazine online at www.zmag.org slash zmag slash articles slash jan o one chomsky dot htm dash page two hundred and seventeen and zena dot securaforum dot com slash znet slash zmag slash feb o one chomsky dot htm sixty four Stuart Dewan, captains of consciousness advertising and the social roots of the consumer Culture, New York, McGraw-Hill, 1976, p. 85. See also Michael Dawson, The Consumer Trap, Big. Business Marketing in American Liffey, Urbana, Hill, University of Illinois Press, 
2003, for an extensive review of the technique of off-job control developed from the 1920s as a counterpart to the on-job control of Taylorism, designed to turn people into controlled robots in life as well as work. 65 Hans von Sponeck, too much collateral damage, Toronto Globe and Mail, the 2nd of July 2002. Online at www.commondreams.org slash views 02 slash show 70203.htm. Halliday, Sila and Charybdis, Op. Sit. 66 Thomas L. Friedman, NATO tries to ease security concerns in Eastern Europe, New York Times, 7 June 1991, seconds A, P. 1. Alan Cowell, Kurds assert few outside Iraq wanted them to win, New York Times, 11 April 1991, seconds A, P. 11. Friedman, because we could. New York Times. The 4th of June 2003, seconds A, P. 31. 67. Brent Scowcroft cited in Bob Herbert, Spoils of War, New York Times, 10 April 2003, seconds A, P. 27. 68. Chart shown in New York Times, 7 May 2003, seconds A, P. 14. See James Dow and Eric Schmidt, Post War Planning, President Picks a Special Envoy to Rebuild Iraq, New York Times, 7. May 2003, seconds A, P. 1. Source, Department of Defense and Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance. 69. David Sanja with John Tagliabue, Bush aid says U.S not UN, will rebuild Iraq. New York Times, the 5th of April 2003, seconds B, P, 1. 70 Arthur Schlesinger, CP, 12 of Hegemony or Survival. Notes to Chapter 6. 1. David Ignatius, Europe's Real Modernizers, International Herald Tribune, 14-15. December 2002, from Washington Post. The 13th of December 2002, seconds A, P. 45. 2 for Financial Times, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, and other sources. See World Orders. Old and New, Op. Sit, Chapter 2. 3. Arifanum, Children Left Parentless as Migrants Flee Poor Ukraine, Christian Science. Monitor, the 10th of June 2003, P. 7. 4. UN Development Program cited by Duncan Green and Matthew Griffith, Globalization. And its discontents, International Affairs 78, No. 1. January 2002, pages 49 to 68. Updated and abridged version online at www.cafford.org.uk slash policy slash globalization and critics 200301.pdf David E. Powell, Death As a Way of Life, Russia's Demographic Decline, Current History 101, No. 657, October 2002 Pages 344-48 for polls, see Michael Wines, New Study Supports Idea Stalin Was Poisoned, New York Times, the 5th of March 2003, seconds A, P, 3, dash page 218, 5 David Bruce cited in Costigliola, Kennedy, the European Allies, and the failure to consult, op, sit, 6 Henry Kissinger, American Foreign Policy, Expanded Ed, New York, Norton, 1974. 7 C. P. 15 of Hegemony or Survival. 8 Christopher Thorne, The Issue of War, States, Societies, and the Far Eastern Conflict of 1941. 
1945, New York, Oxford University Press, 1985, pp. 225, 211, for sources and general context. See my deterring democracy, op. sit. 9 Howard M. Wachtel, The Money Mandarins, The Making of a Supranational Economic Order. Rev. Ed. Armenk, N.Y. M.E. Sharp, London, Pluto Press, 1990, pp. 44ff. Business Week, the 7th of April, 1975. 10 Melvin Leffler, A Preponderance of Power, Op. Sit, p. 339. 11 Britain, C. Mark Curtis, Web of Deceit, Op. Sit, pages 15 to 16. For the others, C. Aaron. David Miller, Sir Chef for Security, Saudi Arabian Oil and American Foreign Policy, 1939-1949. Chapel Hill, N.C., University of North Carolina Press, 1980. Irvin H. Anderson, Aramco, The United States and Saudi Arabia, A Study of the Dynamics of Foreign Oil Policy. 1933 to 1950, Princeton. N.J., Princeton University Press, 1981, Michael B. Stoff, Oil, War and American Security, The Sir Chef for a National Policy on Foreign Oil, 1941 to 1947, New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University Press, 1980. Eisenhower cited in Stephen L. Spiegel, The Other Arab-Israeli Conflict, Making Americas. Middle East Policy F. From Truman to Reagan, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1985, p. 51. 12 Task Force on U.S. Korea Policy, The Nuclear Crisis on the Korean Peninsula, Avoiding the Road to Perdition, Washington, D.C., Center for International Policy, Chicago. Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Chicago, 2003, abridged version, The Nuclear Crisis on the Korean Peninsula, Op. Sit. 13 Cited by Seller Guess. Harrison, Gas and Geopolitics in Northeast Asia, Pipelines, Regional Stability, and the Korean Nuclear Crisis, World Policy Journal 19, Number 4. Winter 2002-03, pp. 23-36. Online at www.worldpolicy.org slash journal slash articles slash wpj024 slash harrison.html. 14. What follows concerning the SFPT is drawn from John Price, a just piece? The 1951 San. Francisco Peace Treaty in Historical Perspective, Japan Policy Research Institute, Working Paper No. 78, June 2001. Online at www.jpre.org slash papers slash wp78.html. 15 Human Rights. Watch, U.S., Ashcroft Attacks Human Rights Law, Press Release. 15 May 2003. Online at www.hrw.org slash press slash 2003 slash show 5 slash so 51503.htm. Notes to Chapter 7. 1. Michael Crepin cited in Faye Bowers and Howard Lafranche. Risk rises for a reignited arms race. Christian Science Monitor. The 31st of December 2002, p. 1. 2. Butler cited in Hans Christensen, Basic Research Report 98, Number 2, British American. Security Information Council, March 1998, Appendix I. Online at www.basisync.org slash pubs Slash research slash one thousand nine hundred and ninety eight nucleaf etches to HTM. Alaf Ben, Russia. 
concerned over Israel's nuclear weapons program, Haritz, to June 2003, reporting Russia's dash page 219. Demand that Israel's nuclear program be placed on the agenda of international organizations. Concerned with preventing nuclear proliferation. 3. Canoe Choice, Secret of 4 Iraq sent pullout deal to U.S. Newsday, 29 August 1990. Iraq offers deal to quit Kuwait. U.S. rejects it, but stays interested. Newsday, 3 January 1991. P. 5. See Chapter 2, Note 14, of Hegemony or Survival. For Ruth Sinai, Israel no. To win West in social inequality, and an existential threat. Haritz, the 3rd of December 2002. 5. Yitzhak ben Yisrael, Ashley at Ha Otzmaha Yisria Alit, the illusion of Israeli grandeur. Haritz, the 16th of April 2002. 6. Gal Nasser, the axis of evil, from another angle. Alram Weekly 576, 7 to 13. March 2002. Online at weekly.aram.org.x slash 2002 slash 576 slash focus.htm. 7. Robert Olson, Turkey Iran Relations, 2000 to 2001. The Caspian, Azerbaijan and their Kurds. Middle East Policy 9, Number 2, June 2002, pages 111 to 129. 8. Prafla Bidwai, a Zionist recipe for India, News International, 22 May 2003, citing Brajesh Misra. 9. Lloyd George, cited by V. G. Gearnan, European Empires F. From Conquest to Collapse. 1815. 1960, Leicester, England, Leicester University Press, in association with Fontana Paperbacks. 1982. 10 National Intelligence Council, Global Trends 2015, a dialogue about the future with non government experts, Washington, D.C., National Intelligence Council, December 2000. 11 National Intelligence Council, Global Trends 2015, Op. Sit. 12 Mark Curtis, Web of Deceit, Op. Sit, Chapter 22. 13 Tom Shanker and Eric Schmidt, Strategic Shift, Pentagon Expects Long-Term Access to Kirak Bases, New York Times, the 20th of April 2003, Seconds A. P. 1. 14. Bob Herbert, What Is It Good For? New York Times, the 21st of April 2003, Seconds A. P. 23. 15. On the Planning Context, see Chapter 6 of Hegemony or Survival. The specific topics reviewed here are discussed in much greater detail in my world orders old and new, op, sit, the Updated edition of Fate FL Triangle, the United States, Israel, and the Palestinians, Cambridge. South End Press, 1999, Pirates and Emperors, Old and New, Updated Ed, Op, Set, and Middle East. Illusions, including peace in the Middle East. Reflections on justice and nationhood, Updated Ed. Lanham, M.D. Roman and Littlefield Publishers, 2003. See these for sources, when not cited. And for fuller quotations. On border issues there is a rich literature, particularly pertinent for. Background here is Norman G. Finkelstein, Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict. Updated Ed. London and New York, Verso, 2003. 16 Abraham Benz The Decade of Transition, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and the Origins of Their American-Israeli Alliance, New York, Columbia, 1998, p. 76.
see Irene Gentsia, notes F from there. Mine have yelled, op, set, and William Roger Louis and Roger Owen, eds, a revolutionary year, the dash page 220. Middle East in 1958, London and New York, I. B. Torres Press, Washington, D.C., Woodrow. Wilson Center Press, 2002. For an account of events in Indonesia, see Audrey R. Cahinland. George M. C. T. Cahin, Subversion as Foreign Policy, The Secret Eisenhower and Dulles Debacle in Indonesia, New York, New Press, 1995. 17 Benz, The Decade of Transition, Op. Sit, pp. 80 FF. Separately, he attributes the statement to Eisenhower. See also Gentsia, notes Ephraim, the minor yelled, op, set, and Ilan Pap in Lewis and Owen, eds, a revolutionary year, op, set. 18 Ephraim in Ba, the Israeli Turkish Entente, London, King's College, London, Mediterranean. Studies, 2001, p. 25, written from a perspective close to official Israeli attitudes. 19 on these matters, see particularly Finkelstein, image and reality, op, sit. See also my Middle East illusions, op, sit, chapter 5. 20 on the intricacies of this affair, see Owen M. Wall, France, the United States, and there. Algerian War. Berkeley, California, University of California Press, 2001. 21 C. My Fate FL Triangle, Op. Sit, for an account of the events and the reaction to them by media and commentators. 22 On Israel's record in Lebanon in the 1980s and 1990s, see My Pirates and Emperors, Old and New, Op. Sit and Fate FL Triangle, updated edition, op, sit. 23 Michael Walzer, New Republic, the 6th of September 1982, his emphasis. 24 James Bennett, a long, bitter fuse is tipping Sharon's way, New York Times, 24. January 2002, seconds A, P. 3. 25 Mark Sappenfield, Americans, Europeans differ on Mideast sympathies, Christian. Science Monitor, the 15th of April 2002, p. 1. Program on International Policy Attitudes, Paper, Americans. On the Israel-Palestinian Conflict, College Park, M.D., University of Maryland, the 8th of May 2002. Online. At www.paper.org slash online reports slash is pal conflict slash contents dot html 26 C. Haydar al Shafi's interview with Rashid Khalidi, looking back, looking forward, Journal of Palestine Studies 32, number 1, autumn 2002, pages 28 to 35. 27 Shlomo Ben Ami a place f for all, for kibbutz hey Mayukad, 1998. See my introduction to Rome Carey, ed, the new intif, Ada, resisting Israel's apartheid, London and New York, verso. 2001, reprinted in my pirates and emperors, old and new, op, sit. 28 of the primer, Sharon's South African strategy, Harits the 19th of September 2002. On current. Israeli strategies, see particularly Daniel Reinhardt, Israel slash Palestine, how to end the war of 1948. New York, Seven Stories Press, 2002, and Baruch Kimmeling, Politicide, Ariel Sharon's Wars. Against the Palestinians, New York, Verso, 2003. 29 Akai Welder, the peace that nearly was at Tarba, Haritz, the 14th of February 2002. 30 Hussein Agar and Robert Mali, 
The Last Negotiation: How to End the Middle East. Dash page two hundred and twenty-one. Peace Process. Foreign Affairs eighty-one number three, May to June two thousand and two. P. Ten F F. Thirty-one Slim Land Grab. Israel's Settlement Policy in the West Bank. May two thousand and two. Online at www.bslam.org slash English slash applications slash summaries slash land underscore grab underscore map dot nasp. 32 Jeffrey Ronson, Report on Israeli Settlement in the Occupied Territories 13, Number 2, March, April 2003. Online at www.fmep.org slash reports slash 2003 slash v13n2.html 33 cited in Christopher Adams, Guy Dinmore, and Harvey Morris, Middle East Road. Map launched, Financial Times, the 1st of May 2003, seconds 1, p. 1. 34 Proposal A Final and Comprehensive Settlement to Middle East Conflict, New York Times, the 1st of May 2003, seconds A, P. 7. 35 Shamla Devi, Budget Cuts, Israelis Strike in Protest at Austerity Package, Financial Times, the 1st of May 2003, P. 7. Citing Haritz 36. Harvey Morris, Israeli security wall threatens to damage Palestinian economy. Financial Times, the 5th of May 2002, p. 7. Eva Balls, Levin Katrin Sommer, Case Study, Kathalia, News. Ephron Within, Jerusalem, October 2002. 37. Sarah Roy, The Wall is Not Just a Wall, Daily Star, Beirut. 2 June 2003. On Sharon's 1992 plan, and others across the spectrum at the same time, see the analysis by Peace Now. Reviews in World Orders Old and New, Op. Sit. P. 224. 38 Amira Has, The State Sharon is Talking About, Haritz, the 28th of May 2003. 39 Greg Meyer, Sharon Defends Peace Plan Against Critics in Likud, New York Times, 27. May 2003, seconds A, P. 12. 40 High Contracting Parties to the Fourth Geneva Convention, Declaration, Report on. Israeli Settlement Drafted at a Conference Concerning the Application of International Humanitarian Law in the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Geneva, Switzerland, 15 December 2001. Online at www.fmep.org slash reports slash 2002 slash v12n1.html number 7. 41 cited in John Donnelly and Charles A. Raiden, Powell's trip is called away to buy. Time for Sharon Sweep, Boston Globe, the 9th of April 2002, seconds A, P. 1. 42 U.S. votes against anti-Israel resolution at UN, Haritz, the 4th of December 2003, Jerusalem. Post staff and news agencies, U.S. defies UN anti-Israel vote, Jerusalem Post, the 4th of December 2003, P. 1. The votes were reported by the app and agents France Press on the 3rd of December 2003. 43 James Bennett, younger leaders are competing to shape Palestinians' future, New York Times, the 17th of March 2003, seconds A, P. 3. 44 Elizabeth B. Miller, Bush says ousting Hussein could aid peace in Mideast, New York. Times, the 27th of February 2003, seconds A, P. 1. 45 John Donnelly, Afghanistan, aid officials criticize cuts in U.S. assistance, Boston. Dash page 222. Globe, 
the 11th of September 2002, seconds A, P, 9, 46, Douglas Hurd, put Middle East peace before war in Iraq, Financial Times, the 3rd of December, 2002, Comment and Analysis, P, 19, 47, Ben Carspet, Two Years of the Intifada, in Hebrew, Part 1, Marif, 6 September, 2002. 48. Reuven Bedazzo, Blessings of War, Review of Mlamot Lokorot Meitzman, Wars. Don't Just Happen, by Moti Golani, Haritz, 12 May 2003. Online at www.heritz.com slash hasten slash pages slash shr.jhtml Item no equals 290847 and contrast it equals 2 and subcont. S it equals 20 and SP subcontrast it equals 0 and list SAC equals Y. 49 Ben Carspet, Shinitayim Lantifada, Op. Sit. Doron Rosenblum, our friend there. Bulldozer, Haritz, the 26th of September 2002. 50 Patrick Sloyan, buried alive, U.S. tanks used plows to kill thousands in Gulf War. Trenches, Newsday, the 12th of September 1991, p. 1. 51 Quarterly Review Staff Study, Air Universities Quarterly Review 6, Number 4, Winter 1953 54. For more extensive quotes and discussion, See my towards a new Cold War, essays on the current crisis and how we got there, New York, Pantheon Books, 1982, New Press, 2003, pages 112 to 13. 52 Jawaharlal Nehru, The Discovery of India, Asia Publishing House, 1961. Stanley A. Wolpert, A New History of India, 4th ed. New York, Oxford University Press, 1993. Gordon. Johnson, C. A. Bailey, and John F. Richards, eds. The New Cambridge History of India, 3 vols. Cambridge and New York, Cambridge University Press, 1987-93. Jack Beeching, The Chinese. Opium Wars, 1st American ed. New York. Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, 1975. This was there. Immediate background of Mills' classic essay on humanitarian intervention. See Chapter 2, Note. 73. Of Hegemony or Survival. 53. Mark Curtis, Web of Deceit, Op. Sit. Chapter 15. 54. Caspet, Shinitayim Lantifada, Op. Sit. 55 on the methods of the first intifada, see Norman Fintelstein, The Rise and Fall of Palestine. A personal account of the intifada years, Minneapolis, University of Minnesota Press, 1996. C. Also my fate FL triangle op. Sit, Chapter 8, for a personal account and Israeli sources, the latter. Extended considerably in necessary illusions. Op. Sit. Appendix 4.2. More generally, see Zachary. Lockman and Joel Beanin, eds. Intifada, the Palestinian Uprising Against Israeli Occupation, Boston. South End Press, 1989. 56. Shiram Piri, Dava, 10 December 1982. Arabishim is Israeli slang that is roughly equivalent to niggers or ikes. Moshdayan, Internal Government Discussion, cited in Yossi. Bilan, Mero Shalit, in Hebrew, Israel, Revivim, 1985, p. 42. 57. Unbridled Force, Editorial, Haritz, 16 March 2003. The conclusion will come as no surprise to those who have been reading the regular reports of its correspondents, notably. Gideon Levy and Amir House. Dash page 223. 
notes to chapter eight. One strobe Talbot and nine Chander Eds. The Age of Terror. America and the World of Dur. September eleventh. New York. Basic Books. Two thousand and one. Two for U.S. definitions. See my international terrorism image and reality in Alexander. George Ed. Western State Terrorism. Op. Set. Later reprinted in Pirates and Emperors, Old and New. Op. Set. British definition cited by Curtis. Web of Deceit. Op. Set. P. Ninety three. Three on the reformulation of the official definitions. See Scott Etran. The Genesis of Suicide. Terrorism. Science. Two hundred and ninety nine. No. Five thousand six hundred and twelve. Seven March two thousand and three. Pages one thousand five hundred and thirty four to thirty nine. He notes that the revised definitions still make no principal distinction between terror as defined by the U.S. Congress and counterinsurgency as allowed in U.S. Armed Forces manuals. One of the perennial problems in defining terror in a doctrinally suitable way. For McClintock, Instruments of State Graph T, Op. Sit, Chapter 3. 5 UN Resolution 42 159, 7 December 1987. The State Department identifies 1987 as their peak year of terrorism. 6 For a remarkable illustration concerning Vietnam, CP. 193 of Hegemony or Survival. On Iraq, CABC Middle East correspondent Charles Glass. I blame the British. London Review of Books 25, Number 8, the 17th of April 2003. Online at www.lrb.co.uk slash v25 slash n08 slash glass 01 underscore dot html. 7. Charles Magling, The Murderous Mind of the Latin and Military, Los Angeles Times. 18. March 1982. 8. Columbian Human Rights Committee, Columbia Update 1, No. 4, December 1989. See my Deterring Democracy, Op. Sit, pp. 130 ff. 9. McClintock, Instruments of State Graph T, Op. Sit, p. 222. 10. Raymond Bonner. Southeast Asia remains fertile for Al Qaeda, New York Times, 28. October 2002, seconds A, P. 1. 11 Talbot and Chanda, Age of Terror, Op. Sit. 12 Martha Crenshaw, Why America? The Globalization of Civil War, Ivo H. Dalder and James M. Lindsay, Nasty, Brutish, and Long. America's War on Terrorism, and David C. Rippaport, The Fourth Wave, September 11 in the History of Terrorism, Current History 100. Number 650, December 2001, pages 425 to 32, pages 403 to 09, and pages 419 to 25. 13 for details. See my pirates and emperors, old and new, op. sit, including the added. Chapter in updated edition, 2002. George, ed. Western State Terrorism, op. sit. On Clinton. Backed Israeli invasions of Lebanon in the 1990s, beyond the illegally occupied southern region. See my fate FL triangle, updated edition, op. sit. 14 Crenshaw, Why America? Op. Sit. Dash page 224. 15 John F. Burns, ringleader of 85 who were kill Loro hijacking says killing wasn't his. Fault, New York Times, seconds A, P. 14. 16 Justin Hagler and Phil Reeves, once upon a time in Jenin, the independent, London.
the 25th of April 2002, pages 4 to 7. 17 C, my fate FL triangle, op, sit, p, 136. 18 Gloria Cooper, darts and laurels, Columbia Journalism Review 41, no, 2, July to August, 2002, pp, 14 ff, online at, archives.cjr.org slash year slash o two slash four slash darts and laurels dot dasp. 19 cp. 52 of hegemony or survival. 20 Judith Miller, South Asia called major terror have been a survey by US, New York. Times, the 30th of April 2000, seconds 1, p. 1. Robert Pearson. Fletcher Forum of World Affairs 26, Number 1, Winter. Spring 2002. 21 C pages 61 to 62 of Hegemony or Survival. 22 Jean Beth Kalstein, A Just War. Boston Globe, the 6th of October 2002, Ideas section, also see. Her essay in Booth and Dunn, Eds, Worlds in Collision, Op, Set. Much of the world will be interested to learn that the U.S. has never engaged in the practice of unleashing terrorists or otherwise threatening or harming civilians. 23. Bill Keller, The Loyal Opposition, New York Times, the 24th of August 2002, seconds A, P. 13. 24. A media review by Jeff Nygaard found one reference to the Gallup poll, a brief notice in the Omaha World Herald that completely misrepresented the findings. Nygaard notes 132, 16. November 2001. Online at www.nygaardnotes.org slash issues slash nn0132.html In view. Managua, Nicaragua, October 2001. 25 Walter Pinkers, Muller Outlines Origin, Funding of September 11 Plot, Washington Post, 6. June 2002, Seconds A, P. 1. Emphasis Mine. 26. Abdullahi Ahmed and Nem, Upholding International Legality Against Islamic and American Jihad, and Booth and Dunn, Eds, Worlds in Collision, Op. Sit, pages 162 to 171. 27. Abdul Haq, U.S. Bombs Are Boosting the Taliban, Edited Version of 11 October 2001. Interview with the Nidalvan, Guardian, London, 2 November 2001, Comment and Analysis, p. 20. Online at www.guardian.co.uk slash war and terror slash story slash 0, 1361 0.1361.585300.html Peshawar Gathering, Barry Barak, Leaders of the Old Afghanistan Prepare for the New, New. York Times, 25 October 2001, Seconds B, P. 4, Fagan Bakari and John Thornhill, Traditional. Leaders Call for Peace Jihad, Financial Times London, 25 October 2001, P. 3, and Afghan. Peace Assembly Call. Financial Times, London, 26 October 2001, p. 2. John F. Burns, Afghan. Gathering in Pakistan Backs Future Role for King, New York Times, the 26th of October 2001, seconds b. p. 4. Indira A. R. Lakshmanan, 1000 Afghan leaders discuss a new regime, Boston Globe. 25. October 2001, seconds A, P. 24, and delegates demand Bin Laden leave, Boston Globe, 26 October. 2001, seconds A, P. 31. 
to learn about the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan. Rowa, go to www.afghanwomensmission.org slash index.shtml or rowa.fancymarketing.net slash index.html. The relevant information was available throughout an independent, alternative, journals, published and electronic, including Zenit. Dash page 225. Online at www.zmag.org. For additional quotes, see the world after September 11. Reprinted in Pirates and Emperors, Old and New, Op. Sit, Chapter 6. 29 Larry Rotter, in Latin America, The Cult of Revelation Wanes, New York Times. Sunday, the 18th of May 2003, Seconds 4, Weekend Review, p. 3. 30 Daniel Gran, Giving the Devil His Due, Atlantic Monthly 287, Number 6, June 2001, pp. 54-71. 31 Talbot and Chanda, Eds, Age of Terror, Op. Sit, pp. 15 FF. Their emphasis. They add that. The problem and solution are more complicated but appear to accept the conclusion and regard the US-UK bombing as appropriate and properly calibrated. 32 Christopher Greenwood, International Law and the War Against Terrorism. International Affairs, London, 78, No. 2, April 2002, pages 301 to 18. Thomas M. Frank, Terrorism. And the Rights of Self Defense, American Journal of International Law 95, No. 4, October 2001, pages 839 to 843. 33 Michael Howard, What's in a Name? How to Fight Terrorism, Foreign Affairs 81, No. 1. January to February 2002, pp. 8 ff. 34 Frank C. Schuller and Thomas D. Grant, Terror, Measuring the Cost, Calculating Their Response, Current History 101, Number 654. April 2002, pages 184 to 86. 35 Werner Dorm, German ambassador to the Sudan from 1996 to 2000, Universalism and the West, an agenda for understanding, Harvard International Review 23, number 2, summer 2001. Pages 19 to 23. Online at www.h.harvard.edu slash articles slash index dot html id equals 909 the same estimate is given by jonathan belk regional director of the near east foundation who has field experience in the sudan a year later u.s attack on factory still hits sudan boston globe 22 August 1999, seconds F. P. 2. Kenneth Roth, Executive Director of Human Rights Watch. Warned at once that the bombing had disrupted assistance to 2.4 million people at risk of starvation and had forced the indefinite postponement of crucial relief efforts in places where dozens of people were dying daily. Letter to President Clinton. 15 September 1998. Online at www.hrw.org slash press 98 slash sept slash sudan 915.htm. On these and other assessments and related material, see my 911, New York, 7 Stories Press, 2001, pp. 45 ff. 36 Christopher Hitchens, Knowledge and Power, The Nation 274, Number 22, the 10th of June 2002. P. 9. Online at 
www.thenation.com slash doc.mhtml percent 3 equals 2002610 and s equals pigeons. 37 George W. Bush cited in Antony Shaded, U.S. Rebaf's second Iraq offer on arms. Inspection, Boston Globe, the 6th of August 2002, seconds A, P. 1. 38 Richard J. Aldrich, America used Islamists to arm the Bosnian Muslims, Guardian. London, the 22nd of April 2002, Leader, P. 16. 39 National Intelligence Council, Global Trends 2015, Op. Sit. 40 Kenneth Waltz in Booth and Dunn, Eds, Worlds in Collision, Op. Sit. Also CP. 123 of Hegemony or Survival. Dash page 226. 41 International Loyal for Multinationals quoted by Neil McFarker, Saudi Dilemma. A Native Son, a Heinous Act, New York Times, the 5th of October 2001, seconds A, P. 1. 42 Sumit Gang Ali. Putting South Asia back together again. Current history 100. No. 650. December 2001. Pages 410 to 14. Philip C. Wilcox, Jr., U.S. Ambassador at Large for Counterterrorism. 1994 to 97. The Terror, New York Review of Books 48. No. 16. The 18th of October 2001, Rowan Gunaratna. Quoted by Thomas Powers, Secrets of September 11, New York Review of Books 49, No. 15, 10. October 2002, Wolf Howitz quoted in Vanity Fair, Interview by Sam Tenenhaus, the 9th of May 2003, he is referring specifically to the U.S. presence in Saudi Arabia. 43 Death in Riyadh, crushing Al-Qaeda will require might and right, editorial, financial. Times, London, 14 May 2003, p. 22, p. W. Singer, America and the Islamic World, current. History 101, no. 658, November 2002, pages 355 to 64, Daniel Byman, The War on Terror Requires. Settler Weapons, Financial Times, London, the 27th of May 2003, p. 17. 44, Anthony Shaded, Old Arab Friends Turn Away from U.S., Washington Post, 26. February 2003, seconds A, P. 1. 45 James A. Bill and Rebecca Bill Chavez, The Politics of Incoherence, The United States. And the Middle East, Middle East Journal 56, No. 4, Autumn 2002, pages 562 to 75. Online at www.mydiasty.org slash pdf slash bill percent 20 gali 562 575.pdf 46 David Johnston and Don Vanader, Jr. U.S. officials see signs of a revived dull. Qaeda, New York Times, the 17th of May 2003, seconds A, P. 1. Byman, The War on Terror Requires Settler. Weapons, Financial Times, the 27th of May 2003, p. 17. Don Vanader, Jr., and Desmond Butler, Anger. On Iraq Seen as New Qaeda Recruiting Tool, New York Times, the 16th of March 2003, seconds 1, p. 1. Scott. Etran who wants to be a martyr. New York Times, the 5th of May 2003, seconds A, P. 23. 47 Faye Bowers, Al-Qaeda may be rebuilding, Christian Science Monitor, 
the 5th of May 2003, p. 1. 48. Jason Burke, The Return of Al-Qaeda, The Tentacles of Terror, Observer, London. Sunday, the 18th of May 2003, p. 17. Jessica Stern, How America Created a Terrorist Haven, New York. Times, the 20th of August 2003, seconds A, p. 21. 49. For further quotes and background, see Gilbert Twicker, The Clash of Barbarisms, September. 11. And the Making of the New World Disorder, New York, Monthly Review Press, 2002, pp. 58. FF. That these are their goals is also assumed by Washington planners. See Wolf Howitt's interview. Vanity Fair, Op. Sit. 15. Michael Kramnish, U.S. Company has long history with Saudis, Boston Globe, 15 May. 2003, Seconds A, P. 20. Joseph B. Trista, Compound was a law for terror, experts say, New. York Times, the 14th of May 2003, Seconds A, P. 12. 51. Michael Ignatieff, The Burden, New York Times Magazine, the 5th of January 2003, seconds 6, pp. 22. 30. 52. Ami Hayalon, Interview in Le Monde, 22 December 2001, reprinted in Roan Carey and Jonathan Shannon, The Other Israel, Voices of Refusal and Dissent, New York. New Press, 2002. Uri. Segi, Lights Within the Fog, in Hebrew, Tel Aviv, Edio Thachnothkmd, 1998, pp. 300 ff. Dash page 227. 53. Yeho Shapat Hakabi cited by M. Non Kapleyuk, Le Monde Diplomatique, February 1986. 54 for sources and background discussion, see my world orders, old and new, op. sit, pp. 79, 201 ff, now also salimia, imperious doctrines, u.s. Arab relations from Dwight D. Eisenhower to George W. Bush, Diplomatic History 26, Number 4, Fall 2002. Pages 571 to 91. 55. Peter Waldman et al. The Question in the Ripple, Wires. Wall Street Journal, 14. September 2001, Seconds A, P. 6. See also Waldman and Hugh Pope, Worlds Apart, Some Muslims. Fear War on Terrorism is Really a War on Them, Wall Street Journal. The 21st of September 2001, seconds A. P. 1. See my 9-11, op. Sit. And, for more detail, Middle East Illusions, op. Sit. Chapter 10. 56. Ahmed Rashid, is terror worse than oppression? Far Eastern Economic Review, Hong. Kong, 165, number 30. The 1st of August 2002, pages 12 to 15. American University of Cairo Professor L. Lozi. Writer Aziz Adin L. K. Sauni, and Warren Base of the Council on Foreign Relations quoted by Joyce Co. Two-Faced U.S. Policy Blamed for Arab Hatred, Straits Times, Singapore, 14. August 2002. 57. Yusuf M. Ibrahim. Democracy, we must be careful what we wish for, Washington. Post, National Weekly Edition, 31 March 2003, and, Democracy, be careful what you wish. 4, Washington Post, March 23, 2002, seconds B, P. 3. 58, Jonathan Steele, it feels like 1967 all over again, Guardian, London. 9 April 2003. Comment and Analysis, p. 22. 59 Susan Sachs, Egyptian Intellectual Speaks of the Arab World's Despair, New York. 
times, the 8th of April 2003, seconds B, P, 1. Notes to Chapter 9. 1 John Rockwell, The Aftermath, Peering into the Abyss of the Future, New York Times. The 23rd of September 2001, seconds 2, P, 1. To Paul Krugman, A No Win Outcome, New York Times. The 21st of December 2001, seconds A, P, 39. 3 Strutcom, Essentials of Post-Cold War Deterrence, 1995. Declassified text online at www.nautilus.org slash nukestrat slash usa slash advisory slash essentials 95.txt For more extensive quotes, see my new military humanism, op. sit, chapter 6, on subsequent presidential directives, see Center for Defense Information, Defense Monitor 29, no. 3, 2000. C. Morton. Mints, 2 minutes to launch, American Prospect 12, number 4, the 26th of February 2001, pages 25 to 29, on. The Legislative Bar to do alerting. Online at www.prospect.org slash print slash v12 slash 4 slash mints. m.html. On the 1969 alert, intended to signal to Moscow U.S. intentions in Vietnam, C. Scott. D. Sagan and Jeremy Zuri, the Madman Nuclear Alert, Secrecy, Signaling, and Safety in October 1969, International Security 27, No. 4, Spring 2003, pages 150-83. to The Most Crucial Event ignored were a serious Russia-China border conflict, which might have led to Russian misinterpretation of the signal, with grim consequences. 4 C Chapter 5, Note 29, of Hegemony or Survival. 5 Scott Peterson, Loose Nuke Sketch Shortchanged. Christian Science Monitor, the 9th of May 2001, p. 6, Walter Pinkers. Bush targets Russian nuclear programs for cuts, Washington Post, 18. Dash page 228. March 2001, seconds A, P. 23. A terse announcement suggested a possible reversal of the policy, in reaction to 9-11, Elizabeth B. Miller, U.S. drops threat to cut aid to Russia for disarming. New York Times. 28 December 2001, seconds A, P. 7. On successes of cooperative threat reduction. Initiated by Senators Sam Nunn and Richard Luger, C. Michael Greppen, Dominators Rule. Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists 59, No. 1, January to February 2003, pages 55 to 60. Online at www.therbulletin.org slash issues slash 2003 slash jfo3 slash jfo3 crepin.html 6 Stephen Lee Myers, study said to find U.S. missile shield might incite China, New York. Times, 10 August 2000, seconds A, P. 1, Bob Drogan in Tyler Marshall. Missile Shield Analysis Warns of Arms Buildup, Los Angeles Times, the 19th of May 2000, p. 1, Michael Byers, Back to the Cold War, London Review of Books 22, No. 12, 22 June 2000, online at www.lrb.co.uk slash v22 slash n12 slash by row 1 underscore html see also michael r gordon and stephen lee myers risk of arms race seen in u.s design of missile defense new york times 28 may 2000 seconds 1 p 1 
and Glazer and FETA National Missile Defense, OP, SIT. 7. David E. Sanja, U.S. will drop objections to China's missile buildup, New York. Times, the 2nd of September 2001, seconds 1, p. 1. Sanja, U.S. restates its stand on missiles in China, New York Times, 5 September 2001, seconds A, P. 3. Jane Pillars, Chinese firm is punished by the U.S. for arms sale, New York Times, 2 September 2001, seconds 1, P. 9. Clinton, C. William J. Broad. U. S. Russian talks revive old debates on nuclear warnings. New York Times, 1 May 2000. Seconds A. P. 8. 8. Steinbrunner and Lewis, The Unsettled Legacy of the Cold War, Op. Sit. 9. David Rupp, Nuclear Weapons, Rand Report Says Accidental Launch Threat. Growing, Global Security Newswire, 22 May 2003. Online at www.nt.org slash d underscore newswires slash issues slash newswires slash 2003 underscore 5 underscore 22 dot html rand corporation beyond the nuclear shadow may 2003 online at www.ram.org slash Publications slash Mr. Slash MR 1666 slash Paul Webster, just like old times. Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists 59, no. 4, July to August 2003, p. 30. Online at www.therbulletin.org slash issues slash 2003 slash 03 slash 03 webster dot html 10 judith miller study urges more action to cut risks from weapons stockpiles new york times the 20th of january 2003 seconds a p 14 11 crepin dominators rule up Sit. 12. Michael R. Gordon, Nuclear Arms, for Deterrence or Fighting. New York Times, 11. March 2002, seconds A, P. 1. Eric Schmidt, U.S. tries to explain new policy for a bomb, 11. March 2002, seconds A, P. 8. William M. Markin, The Nuclear Option in Iraq. Los Angeles Times, 26. January 2003, seconds M. P. 1. 13. Carl Hulse and James Dow, Cold War Long Over, Bush Administration Examines Steps. To Revamp Tassinal, New York Times, the 29th of May 2003, seconds A. P. 23. 14. Scott Baldorf. U.S. may still cage an arms race, Christian Science Monitor, the 15th of May 2003, p. 6. 15. Peter Slavin, Analysts, New Strategy Courts Unseen Dangers, First Strike Could Be. Precedent for Other Nations, Washington Post, the 22nd of September 2002, seconds a, p. 1. Dash page 229. 16. McGeorge Bundy, Danger and Survival, Choices About the Bomb in the First Fifty Years, New York, Random House, 1988, p. 326. Bundy is skeptical about the prospects, but his subjective judgment does not bear on the point here. 17. Adam B. L. Lamb. A few unresolved mysteries about Stalin and the Cold War in Europe. A modest agenda for research. Journal of Cold War Studies 1. No. 1. Winter 1999. Pages 116. Online at. 
matilda.ngenteslec.com slash vl equals 2491866 slash cl equals 80 slash nw equals 1 slash rpsv slash catchword slash midbreast slash 1520397 72 slash v 1 n 1 slash s 5 slash p 110 melvin p leffler inside enemy archives the cold war reopened foreign affairs 75 no 4 july to august 1996 pages 120 to 35 james warburg germany key to peace cambridge harvard university press 1953 pp 189 ff 18 c chapter 4 note 3 of hegemony or survival. 19. Kenneth N. Waltz, America as a Model for the World? A Foreign Policy Perspective. P.S. Political Science and Politics. 24. No. 4. December 1991. Pages 667 to 70. Gardoff and Kaufman. Cited in My Deterring Democracy. Op. Sit. P. 26. 20 C. Particularly U.S. Space Command, Vision Air 4 2020, February 1997. Online at www.faz.org slash spp slash military slash docops slash ushpac slash 21 High Frontier Heritage Foundation, cited by Gordon Mitchell, the American National Missile Defense. Political Implications and Impact on Disarmament, Presentation to the Center for Defense Studies, Royal Defense College, Brussels, Belgium, the 30th of January 2001. C. Gordon R. Mitchell, Strategic Deception, Rhetoric, Science, and Politics in Missile Defense Advocacy, East Lansing, Michigan, Michigan State University Press. 2000. 22. Gardoff, A Journey Through the Cold War, Op. Sit, pages 357 to 58. 23. Jack Hit, Battlefield, Space, New York Times Magazine, the 5th of August 2001, seconds 6, pages 30 to 39. Quoting Intelligence Consultant George Friedman. 24. David Pugliese. National Post, Toronto, the 24th of May 2000. See also Pugliese, Missile System. To preserve American dominance, threat of rogue attack highly unlikely, defense. Documents say, Ottawa Citizen, the 24th of May 2000, seconds A, P. 1. 25 Shazu Kang cited by Michael R. Gordon, China. Fearing a bolder U.S. takes aim on proposed national missile shield. New York Times, the 29th of April 2001, seconds 1 p. 10. E. P. 3. Quote from William M. Markin, The Last Word, Nuclear Posturing, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, 57, number 3, May to June 2001, p. 80. Online at www.therbulletin.org slash issues slash 2001 slash mj01 slash mj01 last word dot html. 26 Andrew J. Basevish, different drummers, same drum, national interest, no. 64. Summer 2001, pages 67 to 77, Lawrence F. Kaplan, Offensive Line, New Republic 224, No. 11, 12. March 2001, P. 20. Rand study cited by Kaplan. 27 C pages 42 to 43 of Hegemony or Survival. 28 Michael Greppen, Lost in Space, The Misguided Drive Toward Anti-Satellite Weapons. Foreign Affairs 80, no. 3. 
May to June 2001, pages 2 to 8. Online at dash page 230. www.forignaffairs.org slash 20105015 comment 4763 slash Michael Greppen slash lost in space there. Misguided drive toward anti-satellite weapons. HTML. See also his comments in Hit Battlefield. Space. Op. Sit. Gordon Mitchell, Japan New. S. Missile Defense Collaboration, Rhetorically. Delicious, Deceptively Dangerous, Fletcher Forum of World Affairs 25, No. 1, Winter 2001, pp. 85 to 108, citing Charles Barrow. Online at www.pit.edu slash tilde gordon slash pubs slash japan tmd.pdf. See also Carl Grossman, Weapons in Space, New York, Seven Stories, 2001. 29 Air Force Space Command, Strategic Master Plan, SMP, FY04 and beyond, 5 November. 2002. Online at www.peterson.f.mil web link slash library slash fspkpfis slash final percent 2004 percent 20 smp. Signed exclamation mark dot pdf. 30. William M. Arkin, The Best Defense, Los Angeles Times, 14 July 2002, seconds m. P. 1. Michael J. Sniffen, App, Pentagon Developing System to Track Every Vehicle in a City, the 1st of July. 2003. 31. Hannah Hoag, Neuroengineering, Remote Control, Nature 423, No. 6942, 19 June. 2003. Pages 796 to 98. 32C Chapter 7, Note 10, of Hegemony or Survival. 33 Thomas Vlasek, Europe's Missile Defense Options, CDI Defense Monitor 30, No. 3. March 2001, pp. 6FF. Online at www.cd.org slash program slash document dot cfm document id equals 1602 and start row equals 1 and list rows equals 10 and append earl equals and order equals d dot date last updated percent 20 disk and program id equals 75 and issue id equals 0 and issue equals and Date underscore from equals and date underscore to equals and keywords equals Vlasek and content type equals and author equals and from underscore page equals document. S. CFM. Mitchell, Japan New. S. Missile Defense Collaboration, Op. Sit. 34 CP. 121 of Hegemony or Survival. Agents France Press. Annan pleads for a accord at UN Disarmament Conference, 23 January 2001. Reuters, 15 February 2001, reported in the Desert News, Salt Lake City, virtually the only coverage of the 2001 conference meetings in the U.S. media. Francis Williams, China calls for ban on weaponization of space. Financial Times. The 8th of June 2001, p. 6. 35. Judith Miller, Chemical Weapons Ban May Suffer for Lack of Dues from Treaties. Parties, New York Times. The 27th of April 2001, seconds a. p. 7. Marlies Simons, Money Short for Battle on Chemicals Used in War, New York Times. 5 October 2001, seconds a, p. 9, Michael R. Gordon and Judith Miller, U.S. Germ Warfare Review False Plan on Enforcement, 
New York Times, 20. May 2001, Seconds 1, p. 5, Richard Waddington, Reuters, U.S. Snarls Germ Warfare Talks, Boston. Globe, 8 December 2001. Oliver Mayer, neither trust nor verify, says U.S. Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists 57, no. 6, November to December 2001, pages 19 to 22. Michael R. Gordon, Jim. Warfare Talks Open in London, U.S. is the Pariah, New York Times, the 24th of July 2001, seconds A. P. 11. See also William J. Broad and Judith Miller, U.S. recently produced anthrax in a highly lethal powder form, New York Times, the 13th of December 2001, seconds A. P. 1. 36 Mark Wheelers and Malcolm Dando, back to Bioe Uppens, and Katharina, Killer. Non-Lethals. Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists 59, No. 1, January to February 2003, pages 40 to 46. Online at www.thebulletin.org slash issues slash 2003 slash jfo3 slash jfo 3 wheelershtml On Soviet programs. In gross violation of treaty obligations. See William Broad, Judith Miller, and Stephen. Encheberg, Germs, Biological Weapons and America's Secret War, New York, Simon and Schuster. Dash page 231. 2001. 37 Going It Alone, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists 58, Number 4, July to August 2002, pages 36 to 37. Reviewing these and similar administration initiatives. George Perkovich, Bush's Nuclear Revolution, a Regime Change in Non-Proliferation, Foreign Affairs 82, No. 3, March to April 2003. pp. 2 ff. 38 cp. 121 of Hegemony or Survival. 39. Rachel Coy was killed by Israeli forces in Gaza in March 2003 with the U.S. supplied. Bulldozer, one of Israel's most destructive weapons, CP. 181 of hegemony or survival. Murdered might be the more appropriate term, to judge by eyewitness reports. The killing of an American citizen by U.S. clients using U.S. equipment was not considered worthy of inquiry, even more than the barest report. 40 cited by Judy Toth, Bertrand Russell's Relevance Today, Bertrand Russell Society. Quarterly, February 2003. Online version of Toth's 28 March 1999 speech at www.ethicalstill.org slash platform 032899.shtml Copyright Copyright 2003 of Ivor Chomsky, Diane Chomsky, and Harry Chomsky